At length, Dron, the village elder, entered the room, and with a deep bow to Princess Mary came to a halt by the doorpost. Princess Mary walked up and down the room and stopped in front of him. Dronyushka, she said, regarding as a sure friend this Dronyushka, who always used to bring a special kind of gingerbread from his visit to the fair at Vyazma every year and smilingly offer it to her. Dronyushka, now since our misfortune, she began, but could not go on. We are all in God's hands, said he with a sigh. They were silent for a while. Dronushka, Alpatish has gone off somewhere, and I have no one to turn to. Is it true, as they tell me, that I can't even go away? Why shouldn't you go away, Your Excellency? You can go, said Dron. I was told it would be dangerous because of the enemy. Dear friend, I can do nothing. I understand nothing. I have nobody. I want to go away tonight or early tomorrow morning. Dron paused. He looked askance at Princess Mary and said, there are no horses. I told Yakov Alpatych so. Well, why are there none? asked the princess. It's all God's scourge, said Dron. What horses we had have been taken for the army or have died. This is such a year. It's not a case of feeding horses. We may die of hunger ourselves. As it is, some go three days without eating. We've nothing. We've been ruined. Princess Mary listened attentively to what he told her. "'The peasants are ruined. They have no bread?' she asked. "'They're dying of hunger,' said Dron. "'It's not a case of carting.' "'But why didn't you tell me, Dronyushka? Isn't it possible to help them? I'll do all I can.' To Princess Mary it was strange that now, at a moment when such sorrow was filling her soul, there could be rich people and poor, and the rich could refrain from helping the poor. She had heard vaguely that there was such a thing as landlord's corn, which was sometimes given to the peasants. She also knew that neither her father nor her brother would refuse to help the peasants in need. She only feared to make some mistake in speaking about the distribution of the grain she wished to give. She was glad such cares presented themselves, enabling her without scruple to forget her own grief. Princess Mary began asking Dron about the peasants' needs, and what there was in Bogucharovo that belonged to the landlord. But we have grain belonging to my brother, she said. The landlord's grain is all safe, replied Dron proudly. Our prince did not order it to be sold. Give it to the peasants. Let them have all they need. I give you leave in my brother's name, said she. Dron made no answer, but sighed deeply. Give them that corn if there is enough of it. Distribute it all. I give this order in my brother's name, and tell them that what is ours is theirs. We do not grudge them anything. Tell them so. Dron looked intently at the princess while she was speaking. Discharge me, little mother, for God's sake. Order the keys to be taken from me, said he. I have served twenty-three years and have done no wrong. Discharge me, for God's sake. Princess Mary did not understand what he wanted of her, or why he was asking to be discharged. She replied that she had never doubted his devotion, and that she was ready to do anything for him and for the peasants. Chapter 11 Princess Mary addresses the peasants. They distrust her, and refuse to leave Bogucharovo. An hour later, Dunyasha came to tell the princess that Dron had come and all the peasants had assembled at the barn by the princess's order and wished to have word with their mistress. "'But I never told them to come,' said Princess Mary. "'I only told Dron to let them have the grain.' "'Only for God's sake, Princess dear, have them sent away and don't go out to them. It's all a trick,' said Dunyasha. "'And when Yakov Alpatych returns, let us get away. And please don't—' "'What is a trick?' asked Princess Mary in surprise. I know it is. Only listen to me, for God's sake. Ask nurse, too. They say they don't agree to leave Bogucharovo as you ordered. Oh, you are making some mistake. I never ordered them to go away, said Princess Mary. Call Dronushka. Dron came and confirmed Dunyasha's words. The peasants had come by the princess's order. But I never sent for them, declared the princess. You must have given my message wrong. I only said that you were to give them the grain. Dron only sighed in reply. 
If you order it, they will go away, said he. No, no, I'll go out to them, said Princess Mary. And in spite of the nurse's and Dunyasha's protests, she went out into the porch, Dron, Dunyasha, the nurse, and Michael Ivanovich following her. They probably think I'm offering them the grain to bribe them to remain here while I myself go away, leaving them to the mercy of the French, thought Princess Mary. I will offer them monthly rations and housing at our Moscow estate. I'm sure Andrew would do even more in my place, she thought, as she went out into the twilight toward the crowd standing on the pasture by the barn. The men crowded closer together, stirred, and rapidly took off their hats. Princess Mary lowered her eyes, and, tripping over her skirt, came close up to them. So many different eyes, old and young, were fixed on her, and there were so many different faces that she could not distinguish any of them, and, feeling that she must speak to them all at once, did not know how to do it. But again, the sense that she represented her father and her brother gave her courage, and she boldly began her speech. "'I am very glad you have come,' she said, without raising her eyes, and feeling her heart beating quickly and violently. Dronishka tells me that the war has ruined you. That is our common misfortune, and I shall grudge nothing to help you. I am myself going away because it is dangerous here. The enemy is near, because... I'm giving you everything, my friends, and I beg you to take everything, all our grain, so that you may not suffer want. And if you have been told that I am giving you the grain to keep you here, that is not true. On the contrary, I ask you to go with all your belongings to our estate near Moscow, and I promise you I will see to it that there you shall want for nothing. You shall be given food and lodging. The princess stopped. Sighs were the only sound heard in the crowd. I am not doing this on my own account, she continued. I do it in the name of my dead father, who was a good master to you, and of my brother and his son. Again she paused. No one broke the silence. Ours is a common misfortune, and we will share it together. All that is mine is yours, she concluded, scanning the faces before her. All eyes were gazing at her with one and the same expression. She could not fathom whether it was curiosity, devotion, gratitude, or apprehension and distrust but the expression on all the faces was identical. "'We're all very thankful for your bounty, but it won't do for us to take the landlord's grain,' said a voice at the back of the crowd. "'But why not?' asked the princess. No one replied, and Princess Mary, looking round at the crowd, found that every eye she met now was immediately dropped. "'But why don't you want to take it?' she asked again. No one answered. The silence began to oppress the princess, and she tried to catch someone's eye. "'Why don't you speak?' she inquired of a very old man, who stood just in front of her, leaning on his stick. "'If you think something more is wanted, tell me. I will do anything,' said she, catching his eye. But as if this angered him, he bent his head quite low and muttered, "'Why should we agree? We don't want the grain.' Why should we give up everything? No, we don't agree. We don't agree. We're sorry for you, but we're not willing. Go you, go away yourself, alone, came from various sides of the crowd. And again all the faces in that crowd bore an identical expression, though now it was certainly not an expression of curiosity or gratitude, but of angry resolve. But you can't have understood me, said Princess Mary with a sad smile. Why don't you want to go? I promised to house and feed you, while here the enemy would ruin you. But her voice was drowned by the voices of the crowd. Oh, we're not willing. Well, let them ruin us. We won't take your grain. We don't agree. Again Princess Mary tried to catch someone's eye, but not a single eye in the crowd was turned to her. Evidently they were all trying to avoid her look. She felt strange and awkward. Oh, yes. An artful tale. Follow her into slavery. "'Pull down your houses and go into bondage, I dare say. "'I'll give you grain indeed,' she says, "'voices in the crowd were heard saying. "'With drooping head, Princess Mary left the crowd "'and went back to the house. "'Having repeated her order to Dron "'to have horses ready for her departure next morning, "'she went to her room 
and remained alone with her own thoughts. Chapter 12 Princess Mary at night recalls her last sight of her father. For a long time that night, Princess Mary sat by the open window of her room, hearing the sound of the peasants' voices that reached her from the village. But it was not of them she was thinking. She felt that she could not understand them, however much she might think about them. She thought only of one thing, her sorrow, which, after the break caused by cares for the present, seemed already to belong to the past. Now she could remember it and weep or pray. After sunset, the wind had dropped. The night was calm and fresh. Toward midnight, the voices began to subside. A cock crowed. The full moon began to show from behind the lime trees. A fresh, white, dewy mist began to rise, and stillness reigned over the village and the house. Pictures of the near past, her father's illness and last moments, rose one after another to her memory. With mournful pleasure, she now lingered over these images, repelling with horror only the last one, the picture of his death which she felt she could not contemplate even in imagination at this still and mystic hour of night. And these pictures presented themselves to her so clearly and in such detail that they seemed now present, now past, and now future. She vividly recalled the moment when he had had his first stroke and was being dragged along by his armpits through the garden at Bald Hills, muttering something with his helpless tongue, twitching his grey eyebrows, and looking uneasily and timidly at her. Even then he wanted to tell me what he told me the day he died, she thought. He had always thought what he said then. And she recalled in all its detail the night at Bald Hills before he had the last stroke, when with a foreboding of disaster she had remained at home against his will. She had not slept and had stolen downstairs on tiptoe and going to the door of the conservatory where he slept that night, had listened at the door. In a suffering and weary voice, he was saying something to Tichon, speaking of the Crimea and its warm nights, and of the Empress. Evidently he had wanted to talk. And why didn't he call me? Why didn't he let me be there instead of Tichon? Princess Mary had thought and thought again now. Now... He will never tell anyone what he had in his soul. Never will that moment return for him or for me, when he might have said all he longed to say, and not Tichon, but I might have heard and understood him. Why didn't I enter the room, she thought. Perhaps he would then have said to me what he said the day he died. While talking to Tichon, he asked about me twice. He wanted to see me and I was standing close by outside the door. It was sad and painful for him to talk to Tichon, who did not understand him. I remember how he began speaking to him about Lees, as if she were alive. He had forgotten she was dead. And Tichon reminded him that she was no more, and he shouted, Fool! He was greatly depressed. From behind the door I heard how he lay down on his bed, groaning, and loudly exclaimed, My God, why didn't I go in then? What could he have done to me? What could I have lost? And perhaps he would then have been comforted and would have said that word to me. And Princess Mary uttered aloud the caressing word he had said to her on the day of his death. Dearest, she repeated, and began sobbing with tears that relieved her soul. She now saw his face before her, and not the face she had known ever since she could remember and had always seen at a distance, but the timid, feeble face she had seen for the first time quite closely with all its wrinkles and details when she stooped near to his mouth to catch what he said. Dearest, she repeated again, what was he thinking when he uttered that word? What is he thinking now? This question suddenly presented itself to her, and in the answer 
She saw him before her with the expression that was on his face as he lay in his coffin, with his chin bound up with a white handkerchief. And the horror that had seized her when she touched him and convinced herself that that was not he, but something mysterious and horrible, seized her again. She tried to think of something else and to pray, but could do neither. With wide open eyes she gazed at the moonlight and the shadows, expecting every moment to see his dead face, and she felt that the silence brooding over the house and within it held her fast. Dunyasha, she whispered. Dunyasha, she screamed wildly, and tearing herself out of the silence, she ran to the servants' quarters to meet her old nurse and the maidservants who came running toward her. Chapter 13 Nicholas and Iyin ride to Bogucharabo. They are asked by Alpatich to protect the princess. Nicholas makes her acquaintance and places himself at her service. On the 17th of August, Rostov and Iyin, accompanied by Lavrushka, who had just returned from captivity, and by an hussar orderly, left their quarters at Yankovo, ten miles from Bogucharovo, and went for a ride to try a new horse Ilyin had bought and to find out whether there was any hay to be had in the villages. For the last three days, Bogucharovo had lain between the two hostile armies, so that it was as easy for the Russian rear guard to get to it as for the French vanguard. Rostov, as a careful squadron commander, wished to take such provisions as remained at Bogucharovo before the French could get them. Rostov and Ilyin were in the merriest of moods. On the way to Bogucharovo, a princely estate with a dwelling house and farm where they hoped to find many domestic serfs and pretty girls, they questioned Lavrushka about Napoleon and laughed at his stories and raced one another to try Ilyin's horse. Rostov had no idea that the village he was entering was the property of that very Bolkonsky who had been engaged to his sister. Rostov and Ilyin gave rein to their horses for a last race along the incline before reaching Bogucharovo, and Rostov, outstripping Ilyin, was the first to gallop into the village street. You're first, cried Ilyin, flushed. Yes, always first, both on the grassland and here, answered Rostov, stroking his heated Donetsk horse. And I'd have won on my Frenchie, Your Excellency, said Lavrushka from behind, alluding to his shabby cart horse. Only I didn't wish to mortify you. They rode at a foot-pace to the barn, where a large crowd of peasants was standing. Some of them bared their heads. Others stared at the new arrivals without doffing their caps. Two tall old peasants with wrinkled faces and scanty beards emerged from the tavern, smiling, staggering, and singing some incoherent song, and approached the officers. "'Fine fellows,' said Rostov, laughing. Is there any hay here? And how like one another, said Ilyin. A most merry company, sang one of the peasants with a blissful smile. One of the men came out of the crowd and went up to Rostov. Who do you belong to? he asked. The French, replied Ilyin jestingly, and here is Napoleon himself, and he pointed to Lavrushka. Then you are Russians? the peasant asked again. "'And is there a large force of you here?' said another, a short man, coming up. "'Very large,' answered Rostov. "'But why have you collected here?' he added. "'Is it a holiday?' "'The old men have met to talk over the business of the commune,' replied the peasant, moving away. At that moment, on the road leading from the big house, two women and a man in a white hat were seen coming toward the officers. "'The one in pink is mine, so keep off,' said Ilyin, on seeing Dunyasha running resolutely toward him. She'll be ours, said Lavrushka to Ilyin, winking. What do you want, my pretty? said Ilyin with a smile. The princess ordered me to ask your regiment and your name. This is Count Rostov, squadron commander, and I am your humble servant. A company, roared the tipsy peasant with a beatific smile as he looked at Ilyin talking to the girl. Following Dunyasha, Alpatich advanced to Rostov, having bared his head while still at a distance. "'May I make bold to trouble your honour? said he respectfully, but with a shade of contempt for the youthfulness of this officer, and with a hand thrust into his bosom. "'My mistress, daughter of General-in-Chief Prince Nicholas Bolkonsky, who died on the 15th of this month, 
finding herself in difficulties owing to the boorishness of these people, he pointed to the peasants, asks you to come up to the house. Won't you please ride on a little farther, said Alpatich with a melancholy smile, as it is not convenient in the presence of... Uh, he pointed to the two peasants who kept as close to him as horse flies to a horse. Ah, Alpatich, <laughs> Yakov Alpatich, grant, forgive us, for Christ's sake, eh? said the peasants, smiling joyfully at him. Rostov looked at the tipsy peasants and smiled. Or perhaps they amuse, Your Honour? remarked Alpatich with a staid air as he pointed at the old man with his free hand. No, there's not much to be amused at here, said Rostov, and rode on a little way. "'What's the matter?' he asked. "'I make bold to inform your honour "'that the rude peasants here don't wish to let the mistress leave the estate "'and threaten to unharness her horses, "'so that, though everything has been packed up since morning, "'Her Excellency cannot get away.' "'Impossible!' exclaimed Rostov. "'I have the honour to report to you the actual truth,' said Alpatich. "'Rostov dismounted, gave his horse to the orderly, and followed Alpatich to the house, questioning him as to the state of affairs. It appeared that the princess's offer of corn to the peasants the previous day, and her talk with Dron and at the meeting, had actually had so bad an effect that Dron had finally given up the keys and joined the peasants, and had not appeared when Alpatich sent for him, and that in the morning, when the princess gave orders to harness for her journey, the peasants had come in a large crowd to the barn and sent word that they would not let her leave the village that there was an order not to move, and that they would unharness the horses. Alpatich had gone out to admonish them, but was told, it was chiefly Karp who did the talking, Dron not showing himself in the crowd, that they could not let the princess go, that there was an order to the contrary, but that if she stayed, they would serve her as before and obey her in everything. At the moment when Rostov and Ilyin were galloping along the road, Princess Mary, despite the dissuasions of Alpatich, her nurse and the maids, had given orders to harness and intended to start. But when the cavalrymen were espied, they were taken for Frenchmen. The coachman ran away, and the women in the house began to wail. "'Father, benefactor, God has sent you!' exclaimed deeply moved voices as Rostov passed through the anteroom. Princess Mary was sitting helpless and bewildered in the large sitting-room when Rostov was shown in. She could not grasp who he was and why he had come or what was happening to her. When she saw his Russian face, and by his walk and the first words he uttered, recognized him as a man of her own class, she glanced at him with her deep, radiant look and began speaking in a voice that faltered and trembled with emotion. This meeting immediately struck Rostov as a romantic event. A helpless girl, overwhelmed with grief, left to the mercy of coarse, rioting peasants. And what a strange fate sent me here! What gentleness and nobility there are in her features and expression, thought he, as he looked at her and listened to her timid story. When she began to tell him that all this had happened the day after her father's funeral, her voice trembled. She turned away, and then, as if fearing he might take her words as meant to move him to pity, looked at him with an apprehensive glance of inquiry. There were tears in Rostov's eyes. Princess Mary noticed this and glanced gratefully at him with that radiant look which caused the plainness of her face to be forgotten. I cannot express, Princess, how glad I am that I happened to ride here and am able to show my readiness to serve you, said Rostov, rising. Go when you please, and I give you my word of honour that no one shall dare to cause you annoyance if only you will allow me to act as your escort. And bowing respectfully, as if to a lady of royal blood, he moved toward the door. Rostov's deferential tone seemed to indicate that though he would consider himself happy to be acquainted with her, he did not wish to take advantage of her misfortunes to intrude upon her. Princess Mary understood this and appreciated his delicacy. I am very, very grateful to you, she said in French, but I hope it was all a misunderstanding and that no one is to blame for it. She suddenly began to cry. Excuse me, she said. Rostov, knitting his brows, left the room with another low bow. Chapter 14 Nicholas calls the peasants to account and intimidates them. 
Carts and horses are provided for Princess Mary's departure. Princess Mary feels that she loves him. Well, is she pretty? Ah, friend, my pink one is delicious. Her name is Dunyasha. But on glancing at Rostov's face, Ilyin stopped short. He saw that his hero and commander was following quite a different train of thought. Rostov glanced angrily at Ilyin, and without replying, strode off with rapid steps to the village. I'll show them. I'll give it to them, the brigands, said he to himself. Alpatich, at a gliding trot, only just managing not to run, kept up with him with difficulty. What decision have you been pleased to come to? said he. Rostov stopped, and clenching his fists, suddenly and sternly turned on Alpatich. Decision? What decision? Old dotard! cried he. What have you been about, eh? The peasants are rioting, and you can't manage them. You're a traitor yourself. I know you. I'll flay you all alive. And as if afraid of wasting his store of anger, he left Alpatich and went rapidly forward. Alpatich, mastering his offended feelings, kept pace with Rostov at a gliding gait and continued to impart his views. He said the peasants were obdurate, and that at the present moment it would be imprudent to over-resist them without an armed force, and would it not be better first to send for the military? "'I'll give them armed force. I'll over-resist them,' uttered Rostov meaninglessly, breathless with irrational animal fury and the need to vent it. Without considering what he would do, he moved unconsciously with quick, resolute steps toward the crowd, and the nearer he drew to it, the more Alpatich felt that this unreasonable action might produce good results. The peasants in the crowd were similarly impressed when they saw Rostov's rapid, firm steps and resolute, frowning face. After the hussars had come to the village, and Rostov had gone to see the princess, a certain confusion and dissension had arisen among the crowd. Some of the peasants said that these new arrivals were Russians, and might take it amiss that the mistress was being detained. Dron was of this opinion, but as soon as he expressed it, Karp and others attacked their ex-elder. "'How many years have you been fattening on the commune?' Karp shouted at him. "'It's all one to you. You'll dig up your pot of money and take it away with you. What does it matter to you whether our homes are ruined or not? "'We've been told to keep order, and that no one is to leave their homes or take away a single grain, and that's all about it,' cried another. "'It was your son's turn to be conscripted, but no fear. You begrudged your lump of a son.' A little old man suddenly began attacking Dron, and so they took my Vanka to be shaved for a soldier. But we all have to die. But to be sure, we all have to die. I'm not against the commune, said Dron. That's it, not against it. You've filled your belly. The two tall peasants had their say. As soon as Rostov, followed by Ilyin, Lavrushka, and Alpatich, came up to the crowd, Karp, thrusting his fingers into his belt and smiling a little, walked to the front. Drone, on the contrary, retired to the rear, and the crowd drew closer together. "'Who is your elder here, eh?' Hey? shouted Rostov, coming up to the crowd with quick steps. "'The elder? What do you want with him?' asked Karp. But before the words were well out of his mouth, his cap flew off, and a fierce blow jerked his head to one side. "'Caps off, traitors!' shouted Rostov in a wrathful voice. "'Where's the elder?' he cried furiously. The elder, he wants the elder. Uh, Dron Zaharich, you! Meek and flustered voices here and there were heard calling, and caps began to come off their heads. We don't riot. We're following the orders, declared Karp. And at that moment several voices began speaking together. It's as the old men have decided. There's too many of you giving orders. Arguing? Mutiny! "'Brigands! Traitors!' cried Rostov unmeaningly, in a voice not his own, gripping Karp by the collar. "'Bind him! Bind him!' he shouted, though there was no one to bind him but Lavrushka and Alpatich. Lavrushka, however, ran up to Karp and seized him by the arms from behind. "'Shall I call up our men from beyond the hill?' he called out. Alpatich turned to the peasants and ordered two of them by name to come and bind Karp. The men obediently came out of the crowd and began taking off their belts. "'Where's the elder?' demanded Rostov in a loud voice. With a pale and frowning face, Dron stepped out of the crowd. "'Are you the elder?' "'Bind him, Lavrushka!' shouted Rostov, as if that order, too, could not possibly meet with any opposition. 
and in fact two more peasants began binding Dron, who took off his own belt and handed it to them as if to aid them. "'And you all listen to me,' said Rostov to the peasants. "'Be off to your houses at once, and don't let one of your voices be heard.' "'Why, we've not done any harm. We did it just out of foolishness. It's all nonsense. I said then that it was not an order.' Voices were heard bickering with one another. "'There, what did I say?' said Alpatich, coming into his own again. "'It's wrong, lads.' "'All our stupidity, Yakov Alpatich,' came the answers, and the crowd began at once to disperse through the village. The two bound men were led off to the master's house. The two drunken peasants followed them. "'Ay, when I look at you,' <laughs> said one of them to Karp, "'how can one talk to the masters like that?' "'What were you thinking of, you fool?' added the other. <laughs> "'A real fool!' Two hours later, the carts were standing in the courtyard of the Bogucharovo house. The peasants were briskly carrying out the proprietor's goods and packing them on the carts, and Dron, liberated at Princess Mary's wish from the cupboard where he had been confined, was standing in the yard directing the men. "'Don't put it in so carelessly,' said one of the peasants, a man with a round, smiling face, taking a casket from a housemaid. "'You know it has cost money. How can you chuck it in like that or shove it under the cord where it'll get rubbed?' I don't like that way of doing things. Let it all be done properly, according to rule. Look here, put it under the bast matting and cover it with hay. Eh, that's the way. Hey, books, books, said another peasant, bringing up Prince Andrew's library cupboards. Don't catch up against it. It's heavy, lads. Solid books. Yes. They worked all day and didn't play, remarked the tall, round-faced peasant gravely, pointing with a significant wink at the dictionaries that were on the top. Unwilling to obtrude himself on the princess, Rostov did not go back to the house, but remained in the village awaiting her departure. When her carriage drove out of the house, he mounted and accompanied her eight miles from Bogucharovo to where the road was occupied by our troops. At the inn at Yankovo, he respectfully took leave of her, for the first time permitting himself to kiss her hand. "'How can you speak so?' he blushingly replied to Princess Mary's expressions of gratitude for her deliverance as she termed what had occurred. "'Any police officer would have done as much. "'If we had had only peasants to fight, we should not have let the enemy come so far,' said he with a sense of shame and wishing to change the subject. "'I'm only happy to have had the opportunity of making your acquaintance. "'Good-bye, Princess. I wish you happiness and consolation.' and hope to meet you again in happier circumstances. If you don't want to make me blush, please don't thank me. But the princess, if she did not again thank him in words, thanked him with the whole expression of her face, radiant with gratitude and tenderness. She could not believe that there was nothing to thank him for. On the contrary, it seemed to her certain that had he not been there, she would have perished at the hands of the mutineers and of the French and that he had exposed himself to terrible and obvious danger to save her. And even more certain was it that he was a man of lofty and noble soul, able to understand her position and her sorrow. His kind, honest eyes, with the tears rising in them when she herself had begun to cry as she spoke of her loss, did not leave her memory. When she had taken leave of him and remained alone, she suddenly felt her eyes filling with tears. And then, not for the first time, the strange question presented itself to her. Did she love him? On the rest of the way to Moscow, though the princess's position was not a cheerful one, Dunyasha, who went with her in the carriage, more than once noticed that her mistress leaned out of the window and smiled at something with an expression of mingled joy and sorrow. Well, supposing I do love him, thought Princess Mary. Ashamed as she was of acknowledging to herself that she had fallen in love with a man who would perhaps never love her, she comforted herself with the thought that no one would ever know it, and that she would not be to blame if, without ever speaking of it to anyone, she continued to the end of her life to love the man with whom she had fallen in love for the first and last time in her life. Sometimes when she recalled his looks, his sympathy, and his words, happiness did not appear impossible to her. 
It was at those moments that Dunyasha noticed her smiling as she looked out of the carriage window. Was it not fate that brought him to Bogucharovo, and at that very moment, thought Princess Mary, and that caused his sister to refuse my brother? And in all this, Princess Mary saw the hand of Providence. Note. A woman might not marry her brother's or sister's brother-in-law, and vice versa, so that if Natasha had married Prince Andrew, it would have been an obstacle to marriage between Mary and Nicholas. The impression the princess made on Rostov was a very agreeable one. To remember her gave him pleasure, and when his comrades, hearing of his adventure at Bogucharovo, rallied him on having gone to look for hay and having picked up one of the wealthiest heiresses in Russia, he grew angry. It made him angry just because the idea of marrying the gentle Princess Mary, who was attractive to him and had an enormous fortune, had, against his will, more than once entered his head. For himself personally, Nicholas could not wish for a better wife. By marrying her, he would make the Countess his mother happy, would be able to put his father's affairs in order, and would even, he felt it, ensure Princess Mary's happiness. But Sonia and his plighted word. That was why Rostov grew angry when he was rallied about Princess Bolkonskaya. Chapter 15 Prince Andrew goes to headquarters and meets Denisov, who wants guerrilla troops to break the French line of communication. Kutuzov's reception of them. He transacts business. On receiving command of the armies, Kutuzov remembered Prince Andrew and sent an order for him to report at headquarters. Prince Andrew arrived at Tsarevo Zaimishche on the very day and at the very hour that Kutuzov was reviewing the troops for the first time. He stopped in the village at the priest's house, in front of which stood the commander-in-chief's carriage, and he sat down on the bench at the gate, awaiting His Serene Highness, as everyone now called Kutuzov. From the field beyond the village came now sounds of regimental music, and now the roar of many voices shouting hurrah, to the new commander-in-chief. Two orderlies, a courier and a major-domo, stood nearby, some ten paces from Prince Andrew, availing themselves of Kutuzov's absence and of the fine weather. A short, swarthy lieutenant-colonel of hussars, with thick moustaches and whiskers, rode up to the gate, and, glancing at Prince Andrew, inquired whether His Serene Highness was putting up there, and whether he would soon be back. Prince Andrew replied that he was not on His Serene Highness's staff, but was himself a new arrival. The lieutenant-colonel turned to a smart orderly, who, with the peculiar contempt with which a commander-in-chief's orderly speaks to officers, replied, What? His Serene Highness? I expect he'll be here soon. What do you want? The lieutenant-colonel of Hussars smiled beneath his moustache at the orderly's tone, dismounted, gave his horse to a dispatch runner, and approached Polkonsky with a slight bow. Polkonsky made room for him on the bench, and the lieutenant-colonel sat down beside him. "'You are also waiting for the commander-in-chief?' said he. "'They say he receives everyone, thank God. "'It's awful with those sausage-eaters. "'Yamolov had reason to ask to be promoted to be a German. <laughs> "'Now perhaps Russians will get a look in. "'As it was, devil only knows what was happening. "'We kept retreating and retreating. "'Did you take part in the campaign?' he asked. "'I had the pleasure,' replied Prince Andrew, not only of taking part in the retreat, but of losing in that retreat all I held dear, not to mention the estate and home of my birth, my father, who died of grief. I belong to the province of Smolensk. Ah, you're Prince Bolkonsky? Very glad to make your acquaintance. I'm uh, Lieutenant Colonel Denisov, better known as Vaska said Denisov, pressing Prince Andrew's hand and looking into his face with a particularly kindly attention. "'Yes, I heard,' said he sympathetically, and after a short pause added, "'Yes, it's Scythian warfare. It's all very well, only not for those who get it in the neck. So you are Prince Andrew Bolkonsky.' He swayed his head. "'Very pleased, Prince, to make your acquaintance.' He repeated again, smiling sadly, and he again pressed Prince Andrew's hand. Prince Andrew knew Denisov from what Natasha had told him of her first suitor. This memory carried him sadly and sweetly back to those painful feelings of which he had not thought lately, but which still found place in his soul. 
Of late he had received so many new and very serious impressions, such as the retreat from Smolensk, his visit to Bald Hills, and the recent news of his father's death, and had experienced so many emotions that for a long time past those memories had not entered his mind, and now that they did, they did not act on him with nearly their former strength. For Denisov, too, the memories awakened by the name of Bolkonsky belonged to a distant romantic past, when after supper and after Natasha's singing he had proposed to a little girl of fifteen without realizing what he was doing. He smiled at the recollection of that time and of his love for Natasha, and passed at once to what now interested him passionately and exclusively. This was a plan of campaign he had devised while serving at the outposts during the retreat. He had proposed that plan to Barclay de Tolly, and now wished to propose it to Kutuzov. The plan was based on the fact that the French line of operation was too extended, and it proposed that instead of, or concurrently with, action on the front to bar the advance of the French, we should attack their line of communication. He began explaining his plan to Prince Andrew. They can't hold all that line. It's impossible. I will undertake to break through. Give me five hundred men, and I will break the line. That's certain. There's only one way. Guerrilla warfare. Denisov rose and began gesticulating as he explained his plan to Bolkonsky. In the midst of his explanation, shouts were heard from the army, growing more incoherent and more diffused, mingling with music and songs, and coming from the field where the review was held. Sounds of hoofs and shouts were nearing the village. "'He's coming! He's coming!' shouted a Cossack standing at the gate. Bolkonsky and Denisov moved to the gate, at which a knot of soldiers, a guard of honour, was standing, and they saw Kutuzov coming down the street mounted on a rather small sorrel horse. A huge suite of generals rode behind him. Barclay was riding almost beside him, and a crowd of officers ran after and around them shouting hurrah. His adjutants galloped into the yard before him. Kutuzov was impatiently urging on his horse, which ambled smoothly under his weight, and he raised his hand to his white horse guard's cap with a red band and no peak, nodding his head continually. When he came up to the guard of honour, a fine set of grenadiers mostly wearing decorations who were giving him the salute, he looked at them silently and attentively for nearly a minute with the steady gaze of a commander, and then turned to the crowd of generals and officers surrounding him. Suddenly his face assumed a subtle expression. He shrugged his shoulders with an air of perplexity. And with such fine fellows to retreat and retreat. Well, goodbye, General, he added, and rode into the yard past Prince Andrew and Denisov. Hurrah! 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 shouted those behind him. Since Prince Andrew had last seen him, Kutuzov had grown still more corpulent, flaccid, and fat. But the bleached eyeball, the scar, and the familiar weariness of his expression were still the same. He was wearing the white horse guard's cap and a military overcoat, with a whip hanging over his shoulder by a thin strap. He sat heavily and swayed limply on his brisk little horse. He whistled just audibly as he rode into the yard. His face expressed the relief of relaxed strain felt by a man who means to rest after a ceremony. He drew his left foot out of the stirrup and, lurching with his whole body and puckering his face with the effort, raised it with difficulty onto the saddle, leaned on his knee, groaned, and slipped down into the arms of the Cossacks and adjutants who stood ready to assist him. He pulled himself together, looked round, screwing up his eyes, glanced at Prince Andrew, and, evidently not recognizing him, moved with his waddling gait to the porch. He whistled and again glanced at Prince Andrew. As often occurs with old men, it was only after some seconds that the impression produced by Prince Andrew's face linked itself up with Kutuzov's remembrance of his personality. Ah, how do you do, my dear prince? How do you do, my dear boy? Come along, said he, glancing wearily round, and he stepped onto the porch, which creaked under his weight. He unbuttoned his coat and sat down on a bench in the porch. And how's your father? I received news of his death yesterday, replied Prince Andrew abruptly. Kutuzov looked at him with eyes wide open with dismay, and then took off his cap and crossed himself. 
May the kingdom of heaven be his. God's will be done to us all. He sighed deeply, his whole chest heaving, and was silent for a while. I loved him and respected him, and sympathized with you with all my heart. He embraced Prince Andrew, pressing him to his fat breast, and for some time did not let him go. When he released him, Prince Andrew saw that Kutuzov's flabby lips were trembling, and the tears were in his eyes. He sighed and pressed on the bench with both hands to raise himself. Come, come with me, we'll have a talk, said he. But at that moment Denisov, no more intimidated by his superiors than by the enemy, came with jingling spurs up the steps of the porch, despite the angry whispers of the adjutants who tried to stop him. Kutuzov, his hands still pressed on the seat, glanced at him glumly. Denisov, having given his name, announced that he had to communicate to His Serene Highness a matter of great importance for their country's welfare. Kutuzov looked wearily at him, and lifting his hands with a gesture of annoyance, folded them across his stomach, repeating the words, For our country's welfare? Well, what is it? Speak. Denisov blushed like a girl. It was strange to see the color rise in that shaggy, bibulous, time-worn face, and boldly began to expound his plan of cutting the enemy's lines of communication between Smolensk and Vyazma. Denisov came from those parts and knew the country well. His plan seemed decidedly a good one, especially from the strength of conviction with which he spoke. Kutuzov looked down at his own legs, occasionally glancing at the door of the adjoining hut as if expecting something unpleasant to emerge from it. And from that hut, while Denisov was speaking, a general with a portfolio under his arm really did appear. What? said Kutuzov in the midst of Denisov's explanations. Are you ready so soon? Ready, Your Serene Highness, replied the general. Kutuzov swayed his head as much as to say, How is one man to deal with it all? and again listened to Denisov. I give my word of honor as a Russian officer, said Denisov, that I can break Napoleon's line of communication. What relation are you to Intendant General Kirill Andreevich Denisov? asked Kutuzov, interrupting him. He's my uncle, Your Serene Highness. Ah, we were friends, said Kutuzov cheerfully. All right, all right, friends, stay here at the staff, and tomorrow we'll have a talk. With a nod to Denisov, he turned away and put out his hand for the papers Konovnitsyn had brought him. Would not Your Serene Highness like to come inside? said the general on duty in a discontented voice. The plans must be examined, and several papers have to be signed. An adjutant came out and announced that everything was in readiness within. But Kutuzov evidently did not wish to enter that room till he was disengaged. He made a grimace. No, uh, tell them to bring a small table out here, my dear boy. I look at them here, said he. Don't go away, he added, turning to Prince Andrew, who remained in the porch and listened to the general's report. While this was being given, Prince Andrew heard the whisper of a woman's voice and the rustle of a silk dress behind the door. Several times, on glancing that way, he noticed behind that door a plump, rosy, handsome woman in a pink dress with a lilac silk kerchief on her head, holding a dish and evidently awaiting the entrance of the commander-in-chief. Kutuzov's adjutant whispered to Prince Andrew that this was the wife of the priest whose home it was, and that she intended to offer His Serene Highness bread and salt. Note, it is a custom, a Russian custom, to present bread and salt to anyone who is taking up residence in a new place. Her husband has welcomed His Serene Highness with the cross at the church, and she intends to welcome him in the house. She's very pretty, added the adjutant with a smile. At those words Kutuzov looked round. He was listening to the general's report, which consisted chiefly of a criticism of the position at Tsarivo Zaymishche, as he had listened to Denisov, and seven years previously had listened to the discussion at the Austerlitz Council of War. He evidently listened only because he had ears which, though there was a piece of toe in one of them, could not help hearing. But it was evident that nothing the general could say would surprise or even interest him, that he knew all that would be said beforehand, and heard it all only because he had to, as one has to listen to the chanting of a service of prayer. All that Denisov had said was clever and to the point. What the general was saying was even more clever and to the point. But it was evident that Kutuzov despised knowledge and cleverness, 
and knew of something else that would decide the matter, something independent of cleverness and knowledge. Prince Andrew watched the Commander-in-Chief's face attentively, and the only expression he could see there was one of boredom, curiosity as to the meaning of the feminine whispering behind the door, and a desire to observe propriety. It was evident that Kutuzov despised cleverness and learning, and even the patriotic feeling shown by Denisov, but despised them not because of his own intellect, feelings, or knowledge. He did not try to display any of these, but because of something else. He despised them because of his old age and experience of life. The only instruction Kutuzov gave of his own accord during that report referred to looting by the Russian troops. At the end of the report, the general put before him for signature a paper relating to the recovery of payment from army commanders for green oats mowed down by the soldiers when landowners lodged petitions for compensation. After hearing the matter, Kutuzov smacked his lips together and shook his head. Into the stove, into the fire with it. I tell you once for all, my dear fellow, said he, into the fire with all such things. Let them cut the crops and burn wood to their heart's content. I don't order it or allow it, but I don't exact compensation either. One can't get on without it. When wood is chopped, the chips will fly. He looked at the paper again. Oh, this German precision, he muttered, shaking his head. Chapter 16. The priest's wife offers Kutuzov bread and salt. He has a further talk with Prince Andrew, who declines a place on the staff. Patience and time. Prince Andrew's confidence in Kutuzov. Well, that's all, said Kutuzov, as he signed the last of the documents, and rising heavily and smoothing out the folds in his fat white neck, he moved toward the door with a more cheerful expression. The priest's wife, flushing rosy red, caught up the dish she had after all not managed to present at the right moment, though she had so long been preparing for it, and with a low bow offered it to Kutuzov. He screwed up his eyes, smiled, lifted her chin with his hand, and said, Ah, oh, what a beauty! Thank you, sweetheart. He took some gold pieces from his trouser pocket and put them on the dish for her. Well, my dear, and how are we getting on? he asked, moving to the door of the room assigned to him. The priest's wife smiled, and with dimples in her rosy cheeks followed him into the room. The adjutant came out to the porch and asked Prince Andrew to lunch with him. Half an hour later Prince Andrew was again called to Kutuzov. He found him reclining in an armchair, still in the same unbuttoned overcoat. He had in his hand a French book, which he closed as Prince Andrew entered, marking the place with a knife. Prince Andrew saw by the cover that it was Les Chevaliers du Cygne by Madame de Genlis. Well, sit down, sit down here, let's have a talk, said Kutuzov. It's sad, very sad. But remember, my dear fellow, that I'm a father to you, a second father. Prince Andrew told Kutuzov all he knew of his father's death and what he had seen at Bald Hills when he passed through it. What? What they have brought us to? Kutuzov suddenly cried in an agitated voice, evidently picturing vividly to himself from Prince Andrew's story the condition Russia was in. But give me time, give me time, he said with a grim look, evidently not wishing to continue this agitating conversation, and added, I sent for you to keep you with me. I thank your Serene Highness, but I fear I'm no longer fit for the staff replied Prince Andrew with a smile which Kutuzov noticed. Kutuzov glanced inquiringly at him. But above all, added Prince Andrew, I've grown used to my regiment, am fond of the officers, and I fancy the men also like me. I should be sorry to leave the regiment. If I decline the honour of being with you, believe me... A shrewd, kindly, yet subtly derisive expression lit up Kutuzov's podgy face. He cut Bolkonsky short. I'm sorry for I need you. But you're right, you're right. It's not here that men are needed. Advisers are always plentiful, but men are not. The regiments would not be what they are if the would-be advisers served there as you do. I remember you at Austerlitz. I remember. Yes, I remember you with the standard, said Kutuzov, and a flush of pleasure suffused Prince Andrew's face at this recollection. 
Taking Prince Andrew's hand and drawing him downwards, Kutuzov offered his cheek to be kissed, and again Prince Andrew noticed tears in the old man's eyes. Though Prince Andrew knew that Kutuzov's tears came easily, and that he was particularly tender to and considerate of him from a wish to show sympathy with his loss, yet the reminder he had just given him of Austerlitz was both pleasant and flattering to him. Go your way, and God be with you. I know your path is the path of honour. He paused. I missed you at Bucharest, but I needed someone to send. And changing the subject, Kutuzov began to speak of the Turkish war and the peace that had been concluded. Yes, I have been much blamed, he said, both for that war and the peace. But everything came at the right time. Tout vient à point à celui qui sait attendre. Everything comes in time to him who knows how to wait. And there were as many advisers there as here, he went on, returning to the subject of advisers, which evidently occupied him. Ah, those advisers, said he. If we'd listened to them all, we should not have made peace with Turkey and should not have been through with that war. Everything in haste, but more haste, less speed. Kamyansky would have been lost if he had not died. He stormed fortresses with 30,000 men. It is not difficult to capture a fortress, but it is difficult to win a campaign. For that, not storming and attacking, but patience and time are wanted. Kamyansky sent soldiers to Rushchuk, but I only employed these two things and took more fortresses than Kamyansky and made the Turks eat horse flesh. He swayed his head. And the French shall too, believe me, he went on, growing warmer and beating his chest. I'll make them eat horse flesh. And tears again dimmed his eyes. But shan't we have to accept battle, remarked Prince Andrew. We shall, if everybody wants it. It can't be helped. But believe me, my dear boy, there is nothing stronger than those two. Patience and time. They will do it all. But the advisers n'entend pas de cette oreille, voilà le mal. Don't see it that way, that's the trouble. Some want a thing, others don't. What's one to do? He asked, evidently expecting an answer. Well, what do you want us to do? He repeated, and his eyes shone with a deep, shrewd look. I'll tell you what to do, he continued, as Prince Andrew still did not reply. I will tell you what to do, and what I do. Dans le doute, mon cher. When in doubt, my dear fellow, he paused. Abstiens-toi. Do nothing. He articulated the French proverb deliberately. Well, goodbye, my dear fellow. Remember that with all my heart I share your sorrow, and that for you I am not a serene highness, nor a prince, nor a commander-in-chief. But a father, if you want anything, come straight to me. Goodbye, my dear boy. Again he embraced and kissed Prince Andrew. But before the latter had left the room, Kutuzov gave a sigh of relief and went on with his unfinished novel, Les Chevaliers du Cygne, by Madame de Genlis. Prince Andrew could not have explained how or why it was, but after that interview with Kutuzov, he went back to his regiment, reassured as to the general course of affairs and as to the man to whom it had been entrusted. The more he realized the absence of all personal motive in that old man, in whom there seemed to remain only the habit of passions, and in place of an intellect, grouping events and drawing conclusions, only the capacity calmly to contemplate the course of events, the more reassured he was that everything would be as it should. He will not bring in any plan of his own. He will not devise or undertake anything, thought Prince Andrew. But he will hear everything, remember everything, and put everything in its place. He will not hinder anything useful, nor allow anything harmful. He understands that there is something stronger and more important than his own will the inevitable course of events. And he can see them and grasp their significance 
and seeing that significance can refrain from meddling and renounce his personal wish directed to something else. And above all, thought Prince Andrew, one believes in him because he's Russian, despite the novel by Jean Lys and the French proverbs, and because his voice shook when he said what they have brought us to, and had a sob in it when he said he would make them eat horse flesh. On such feelings, more or less dimly shared by all, the unanimity and general approval were founded with which, despite court influences, the popular choice of Kutuzov as commander-in-chief was received. Chapter 17 Moscow after the Emperor's visit Rostopchin's broadsheets Julie's farewell soiree Forfeits for speaking French Pierre hears of Princess Mary's arrival in Moscow after the emperor had left Moscow, life flowed on there in its usual course, and its course was so very usual that it was difficult to remember the recent days of patriotic elation and ardor. Hard to believe that Russia was really in danger, and that the members of the English club were also sons of the fatherland, ready to sacrifice everything for it. The one thing that recalled the patriotic fervor everyone had displayed during the emperor's stay was the call for contributions of men and money, a necessity that, as soon as the promises had been made, assumed a legal, official form and became unavoidable. With the enemy's approach to Moscow, the Muscovites' view of their situation did not grow more serious, but, on the contrary, became even more frivolous, as always happens with people who see a great danger approaching. At the approach of danger, there are always two voices that speak with equal power in the human soul. One very reasonably tells a man to consider the nature of the danger and the means of escaping it. The other, still more reasonably, says that it is too depressing and painful to think of the danger, since it is not in man's power to foresee everything and avert the general course of events, and it is therefore better to disregard what is painful till it comes, and to think about what is pleasant. In solitude, a man generally listens to the first voice, but in society to the second. So it was now with the inhabitants of Moscow. It was long since people had been as gay in Moscow as that year. Rostopchin's broadsheets, headed by woodcuts of a drink shop, a potman, and a Moscow burger called Karpushka Chigirin, who, having been a militiaman and having had rather too much at the pub, heard that Napoleon wished to come to Moscow, grew angry, abused the French in very bad language, came out of the drink shop, and under the sign of the eagle began to address the assembled people, were read and discussed, together with the latest of Vasily Lvovich Pushkin's Bourrime. In the corner room at the club, members gathered to read these broadsheets, and some liked the way Karpushka jeered at the French, saying, They will swell up with Russian cabbage, burst with our buckwheat porridge, and choke themselves with cabbage soup. They're all dwarfs, and one peasant woman will toss three of them with a hay fork. Others did not like that tone, and said it was stupid and vulgar. It was said that Rostopchin had expelled all Frenchmen, and even all foreigners, from Moscow and that there had been some spies and agents of Napoleon among them. But this was told chiefly to introduce Rostopchin's witty remark on that occasion. The foreigners were deported to Nizhny by boat, and Rostopchin had said to them in French, Rentrez en vous-même, entrez dans la barque, et n'en faites pas une barque de caron. Think it over, get into the barque, and take care not to make it a barque of caron. There was talk of all the government offices having been already removed from Moscow, and to this Shinshin's witticism was added, that for that alone Moscow ought to be grateful to Napoleon. It was said that Mamonov's regiment would cost him 800,000 rubles, and that Bezukhov had spent even more on his, but that the best thing about Bezukhov's action was that he himself was going to don a uniform and ride at the head of his regiment without charging anything for the show. You don't spare anyone, 
said Julie Drubitskaya, as she collected and pressed together a bunch of raveled lint with her thin, beringed fingers. Julie was preparing to leave Moscow next day and was giving a farewell soiree. Bezukhov est ridicule. Bezukhov is absurd. But he is so kind and good-natured. What pleasure is there to be so caustique? A forfeit, cried a young man in militia uniform, whom Julie called Mon Chevalier, and who was going with her to Nizhny. In Julie's set, as in many other circles in Moscow, it had been agreed that they would speak nothing but Russian, and that those who made a slip and spoke French should pay fines to the Committee of Voluntary Contributions. Another forfeit for a gallicism, said a Russian writer who was present. What pleasure is there to be is not Russian. You spare no one, continued Julie to the young man, without heeding the author's remark. For caustique, I am guilty and will pay, and I am prepared to pay again for the pleasure of telling you the truth. For gallicisms, I won't be responsible, she remarked, turning to the author. I have neither the money nor the time, like Prince Galitsin, to engage a master to teach me Russian. Ah, here he is, she added. Quand on, uh, no, no, she said to the militia officer, you won't catch me. Speak of the sun and you see its rays. And she smiled amiably at Pierre. We were just talking of you, she said with the facility in lying natural to a society woman. We were saying that your regiment would be sure to be better than Mamonov's. Oh, don't talk to me of my regiment, replied Pierre, kissing his hostess's hand and taking a seat beside her. I'm so sick of it. You will, of course, command it yourself, said Julie, directing a sly, sarcastic glance toward the militia officer. The latter, in Pierre's presence, had ceased to be caustic, and his face expressed perplexity as to what Julie's smile might mean. In spite of his absent-mindedness and good nature, Pierre's personality immediately checked any attempt to ridicule him to his face. No, said Pierre, with a laughing glance at his big stout body, I should make too good a target for the French. Besides, I am afraid I should hardly be able to climb onto a horse. Among those whom Julie's guests happened to choose to gossip about were the Rostovs. I hear that their affairs are in a very bad way, said Julie, and he is so unreasonable, the Count himself, I mean. The Razumovskys wanted to buy his house and his estate near Moscow, but it drags on and on. He asks too much. No, I, I think the sale will come off in a few days, said someone, though it is madness to buy anything in Moscow now. Why? asked Julie. You don't think Moscow is in danger? Then why are you leaving? I? What a question. I'm going because... Well, because everyone is going. And besides, I'm not Joan of Arc or an Amazon. Well, of course, of course. Uh, let me have some more strips of linen. If he manages the business properly, he will be able to pay off all his debts, said the militia officer, speaking of Rostov. A kindly old man, but not up to much. And why do they stay on so long in Moscow? They meant to leave for the country long ago. Natalie is quite well again now, isn't she? Julie asked Pierre with a knowing smile. They are waiting for their younger son, Pierre replied. He joined Obolensky's Cossacks and went to Bielaya Tserkov, where the regiment is being formed, but now they've had him transferred to my regiment and are expecting him every day. The Count wanted to leave long ago, but the Countess won't on any account leave Moscow till her son returns. I met them the day before yesterday at the Archarovs. Natalie has recovered her looks and is brighter. She sang a song. How easily some people get over everything. Get over what? inquired Pierre, looking displeased. Julie smiled. You know, Count, such knights as you <laughs> are only found in Madame de Souza's novels. What knights? What, what do you mean? demanded Pierre, blushing. Oh, come, my dear Count. C'est la fable de tout Moscou. Je vous admire, ma parole d'honneur. It is the talk of all Moscow. My word, I admire you. Forfeit, forfeit, cried the militia officer. All right, one can't talk. How tiresome. What is the talk of all Moscow? Pierre asked angrily, rising to his feet. Come now, can't you know? I don't know anything about it, said Pierre. I know you were friendly with Natalie, and so... But I was always more friendly with Viera, 
Dear Viera. No, madame, Pierre continued in a tone of displeasure. I have not taken on myself the role of Natalie Rostova's knight at all, and have not been to their house for nearly a month. But I cannot understand the cruelty. Qui s'excuse, s'accuse. Who excuses himself, accuses himself, said Julie, smiling and waving the lint triumphantly, and to have the last word she promptly changed the subject. Do you know what I heard today? Poor Mary Bolkonskaya arrived in Moscow yesterday. Do you know that she's lost her father? Really? Where is she? I should like very much to see her, said Pierre. I spent the evening with her yesterday. She's going to their estate near Moscow either today or tomorrow morning with her nephew. Well, and how is she? asked Pierre. She's well, but sad. But do you know who rescued her? It is quite a romance. Nicholas Rostov. She was surrounded, and they wanted to kill her, and had wounded some of her people. He rushed in and saved her. Another romance, said the militia officer. Really, this general flight has been arranged to get all the old maids married off. Katish is one, and Princess Bolkonskaya another. Do you know, I really believe she is un petit peu amoureuse du jeune homme. A little bit in love with the young man. Forfeit, forfeit, forfeit. But how could one say that in Russian? Chapter 18 Rostopchin's Broadsheets Pierre and the Eldest Princess Lepich's Balloon A Public Flogging Pierre Leaves Moscow for the Army When Pierre returned home, he was handed two of Rostopchin's broadsheets that had been brought that day. The first declared that the report that Count Rostopchin had forbidden people to leave Moscow was false. On the contrary, he was glad that ladies' and tradesmen's wives were leaving the city. There will be less panic and less gossip, ran the broadsheet. But I will stake my life on it that that scoundrel will not enter Moscow. These words showed Pierre clearly for the first time that the French would enter Moscow. 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 The second broadsheet stated that our headquarters were at Vyazma, that Count Wittgenstein had defeated the French, but that as many of the inhabitants of Moscow wished to be armed, weapons were ready for them at the arsenal, sabers, pistols, and muskets, which could be had at a low price. The tone of the proclamation was not as jocose as in the former Chigirin talks. Pierre pondered over these broadsheets. Evidently the terrible storm-cloud he had desired with the whole strength of his soul, but which yet aroused involuntary horror in him, was drawing near. Shall I join the army and enter the service, or wait, he asked himself for the hundredth time. He took a pack of cards that lay on the table and began to lay them out for a game of patience. If this patience comes out, he said to himself, after shuffling the cards, holding them in his hand and lifting his head, if it comes out, it means... What does it mean? He had not decided what it should mean when he heard the voice of the eldest princess at the door asking whether she might come in. Then it will mean that I must go to the army, said Pierre to himself. Come in, come in, he added to the princess. Only the eldest princess, the one with the stony face and long waist, was still living in Pierre's house. The two younger ones had both married. "'Excuse my coming to you, cousin,' she said in a reproachful and agitated voice. "'You know, some decision must be come to. "'What is going to happen? "'Everyone has left Moscow, and the people are rioting. "'How is it that we are staying on?' "'On the contrary, things seem satisfactory, ma cousine,' "'said Pierre in the bantering tone he habitually adopted toward her, "'always feeling uncomfortable in the role of her benefactor. "'Satisfactory indeed!' Very satisfactory. Barbara Ivanovna told me today how our troops are distinguishing themselves. It certainly does them credit. And the people, too, are quite mutinous. They no longer obey. Even my maid has taken to being rude. At this rate they will soon begin beating us. One can't walk in the streets. But above all, the French will be here any day now, so what are we waiting for? I ask just one thing of you, cousin, she went on. Arrange for me to be taken to Petersburg. 
Whatever I may be, I can't live under Bonaparte's rule. Oh, come, ma cousine. Where do you get your information from? On the contrary, I won't submit to your Napoleon. Others may if they please. If you don't want to do this, but I will. I'll give the order at once. The princess was apparently vexed at not having anyone to be angry with. Muttering to herself, she sat down on a chair. But you've been misinformed, said Pierre. Everything is quiet in the city, and there is not the slightest danger. See, I've just been reading. He showed her the broadsheet. Count Rostopchin writes that he will stake his life on it that the enemy will not enter Moscow. Oh, that count of yours, said the princess malevolently. He is a hypocrite, a rascal who has himself roused the people to riot. Didn't he write in those idiotic broadsheets that anyone, whoever it might be, should be dragged to the lock-up by his hair? How silly! And honor and glory to whoever captures him, he says. This is what his cajolery has brought us to. Barbara Ivanovna told me the mob nearly killed her because she said something in French. Oh, but it's so... You take everything so to heart, said Pierre, and began laying out his cards for patience. Although that patience did come out, Pierre did not join the army, but remained in deserted Moscow, ever in the same state of agitation, irresolution, and alarm, yet at the same time joyfully expecting something terrible. Next day, toward evening, the princess set off, and Pierre's head steward came to inform him that the money needed for the equipment of his regiment could not be found without selling one of the estates. In general, the head steward made out to Pierre that his project of raising a regiment would ruin him. Pierre listened to him, scarcely able to repress a smile. Well, then sell it, said he. What's to be done? I can't draw back now. The worse everything became, especially his own affairs, the better was Pierre pleased, and the more evident was it that the catastrophe he accepted was approaching. Hardly anyone he knew was left in town. Julie had gone, and so had Princess Mary. Of his intimate friends, only the Rostovs remained, but he did not go to see them. To distract his thoughts, he drove that day to the village of Voronzovo to see the great balloon Lepich was constructing to destroy the foe, and a trial balloon that was to go up next day. The balloon was not yet ready, but Pierre learned that it was being constructed by the Emperor's desire. The Emperor had written to Count Rostopchin as follows. As soon as Lepich is ready, get together a crew of reliable and intelligent men for his car, and send a courier to General Kutuzov to let him know. I have informed him of the matter. Please impress upon Lepich to be very careful where he descends for the first time, that he may not make a mistake and fall into the enemy's hands. It is essential for him to combine his movements with those of the Commander-in-Chief. On his way home from Voronzovo, as he was passing the Bolotnoye place, Pierre, seeing a large crowd round the Lobnoye place, stopped and got out of his trap. A French cook, accused of being a spy, was being flogged. The flogging was only just over, and the executioner was releasing from the flogging bench a stout man with red whiskers in blue stockings and a green jacket who was moaning piteously. Another criminal, thin and pale, stood near. Judging by their faces, they were both Frenchmen. With a frightened and suffering look resembling that on the thin Frenchman's face, Pierre pushed his way in through the crowd. What is it? Who is it? What is it for? he kept asking. But the attention of the crowd, officials, burghers, shopkeepers, peasants, and women in cloaks and in pelisses, was so eagerly centered on what was passing in Lobnoya Place that no one answered him. The stout man rose, frowned, shrugged his shoulders, and, evidently trying to appear firm, began to pull on his jacket without looking about him. But suddenly his lips trembled, and he began to cry, in the way full-blooded grown-up men cry, though angry with himself for doing so. In the crowd people began talking loudly to stifle their feelings of pity, as it seemed to Pierre. He's cooked as some prince. Hey, Monsieur, Russian sauce seems to be sour to a Frenchman. Sets his teeth on edge. 
said a wrinkled clerk who was standing behind Pierre when the Frenchman began to cry. The clerk glanced round, evidently hoping that his joke would be appreciated. Some people began to laugh. Others continued to watch in dismay the executioner who was undressing the other man. Pierre choked, his face puckered, and he turned hastily away, went back to his trap, muttering something to himself as he went, and took his seat. As they drove along, he shuddered and exclaimed several times so audibly that the coachman asked him, "'What is your pleasure?' "'Where are you going?' shouted Pierre to the man who was driving to Lubyanka Street. "'To the governor's, as you ordered,' answered the coachman. "'Fool! Idiot!' shouted Pierre, abusing his coachman, a thing he rarely did. "'Home, I told you! And drive faster, blockhead! "'I must get away this very day,' he murmured to himself. At the sight of the tortured Frenchman and the crowd surrounding the Lobnoya place, Pierre had so definitely made up his mind that he could no longer remain in Moscow and would leave for the army that very day, that it seemed to him that either he had told the coachman this or that the man ought to have known it for himself. On reaching home, Pierre gave orders to Evstafi, his head coachman, who knew everything, could do anything, and was known to all Moscow, that he would leave that night for the army at Mozhaisk, and that his saddle horses should be sent there. This could not all be arranged that day, so on Evstafi's re representation, Pierre had to put off his departure till next day to allow time for the relay horses to be sent on in advance. On the 24th, the weather cleared up after a spell of rain, and after dinner Pierre left Moscow. When changing horses that night in Perhushkovo, he learned that there had been a great battle that evening. This was the Battle of Shevardino. He was told that there in Perhushkovo the earth trembled from the firing, but nobody could answer his questions as to who had won. At dawn next day, Pierre was approaching Mozhaisk. Every house in Mozhaisk had soldiers quartered in it, and at the hostel where Pierre was met by his groom and coachman, there was no room to be had. It was full of officers. Everywhere in Mozhaisk and beyond it, troops were stationed or on the march. Cossacks, foot and horse soldiers, wagons, caissons, and cannon were everywhere. Pierre pushed forward as fast as he could, and the farther he left Moscow behind, and the deeper he plunged into that sea of troops, the more was he overcome by restless agitation and a new and joyful feeling he had not experienced before. It was a feeling akin to what he had felt at the Sloboda Palace during the Emperor's visit, a sense of the necessity of undertaking something and sacrificing something. He now experienced a glad consciousness that everything that constitutes men's happiness, the comforts of life, wealth, even life itself, is rubbish it is pleasant to throw away compared with something... with what? Pierre could not say, and he did not try to determine for whom and for what he felt such particular delight in sacrificing everything. He was not occupied with the question of what to sacrifice for. The fact of sacrificing in itself afforded him a new and joyous sensation. Chapter 19 Senselessness of the Battle of Borodino and Erroneousness of the Historian's Accounts of it Where and How it was Fought On the 24th of August, the Battle of the Shivardino Redoubt was fought. On the 25th, not a shot was fired by either side, and on the 26th, the Battle of Borodino itself took place. Why and how were the battles of Shevardino and Borodino given and accepted? Why was the Battle of Borodino fought? There was not the least sense in it for either the French or the Russians. Its immediate result for the Russians was, and was bound to be, that we were brought nearer to the destruction of Moscow, which we feared more than anything in the world. And for the French, its immediate result was that they were brought nearer to the destruction of their whole army, which they feared more than anything in the world. What the result must be was quite obvious, and yet Napoleon offered and Kutuzov accepted that battle. If the commanders had been guided by reason, 
it would seem that it must have been obvious to Napoleon that by advancing 1,300 miles and giving battle with the probability of losing a quarter of his army, he was advancing to certain destruction. And it must have been equally clear to Kutuzov that by accepting battle and risking the loss of a quarter of his army, he would certainly lose Moscow. For Kutuzov, this was mathematically clear, as it is that if when playing drafts I have one man less and go on exchanging, I shall certainly lose, and therefore should not exchange. When my opponent has sixteen men and I have fourteen, I am only one-eighth weaker than he. But when I have exchanged thirteen more men, he will be three times as strong as I am. Before the Battle of Borodino, our strength in proportion to the French was about as five to six, but after that battle it was little more than one to two. Previously we had a hundred thousand against a hundred and twenty thousand, afterwards little more than fifty thousand against a hundred thousand. Yet the shrewd and experienced Kutuzov accepted the battle, while Napoleon, who was said to be a commander of genius, gave it, losing a quarter of his army and lengthening his lines of communication still more. If it is said that he expected to end the campaign by occupying Moscow, as he had ended a previous campaign by occupying Vienna, there is much evidence to the contrary. Napoleon's historians themselves tell us that from Smolensk onwards he wished to stop, knew the danger of his extended position, and knew that the occupation of Moscow would not be the end of the campaign for he had seen at Smolensk the state in which Russian towns were left to him, and had not received a single reply to his repeated announcements of his wish to negotiate. In giving and accepting battle at Borodino, Kutuzov acted involuntarily and irrationally. But later on, to fit what had occurred, the historians provided cunningly devised evidence of the foresight and genius of the generals, who of all the blind tools of history were the most enslaved and involuntary. The ancients have left us model heroic poems in which the heroes furnish the whole interest of the story, and we are still unable to accustom ourselves to the fact that for our epoch histories of that kind are meaningless. On the other question, how the Battle of Borodino and the preceding Battle of Shevardino were fought, there also exists a definite and well-known but quite false conception. All the historians describe the affair as follows. The Russian army, they say, in its retreat from Smolensk, sought out for itself the best position for a general engagement and found such a position at Borodino. The Russians, they say, fortified this position in advance on the left of the high road from Moscow to Smolensk and almost at a right angle to it from Borodino to Utitsa at the very place where the battle was fought. In front of this position, they say, a fortified outpost was set up on the Shevardino mound to observe the enemy. On the 24th, we are told, Napoleon attacked this advanced post and took it, and on the 26th attacked the whole Russian army which was in position on the field of Borodino. So the history said. And it is all quite wrong as anyone who cares to look into the matter can easily convince himself. The Russians did not seek out the best position, but on the contrary, during the retreat passed many positions better than Borodino. They did not stop at any one of these positions because Kutuzov did not wish to occupy a position he had not himself chosen, because the popular demand for a battle had not yet expressed itself strongly enough, and because Miloradovich had not yet arrived with the militia and for many other reasons. The fact is that other positions they had passed were stronger, and that the position at Borodino, the one where the battle was fought, far from being strong, was no more a position than any other spot one might find in the Russian Empire by sticking a pin into the map at hazard. Not only did the Russians not fortify the position on the field of Borodino to the left of and at a right angle to the high road, that is, the position in which the battle took place, but never till the 25th of August 1812 did they think that a battle might be fought there. This was shown 
First, by the fact that there were no entrenchments there by the 25th, and that those begun on the 25th and 26th were not completed. And secondly, by the position of the Shevardino Redoubt. That redoubt was quite senseless in front of the position where the battle was accepted. Why was it more strongly fortified than any other post? And why were all efforts exhausted and 6,000 men sacrificed to defend it till late at night on the 24th? A Cossack patrol would have sufficed to observe the enemy. Thirdly, as proof that the position on which the battle was fought had not been foreseen and that the Shevardino Redoubt was not an advanced post of that position, we have the fact that up to the 25th, Barclay de Tolly and Bagration were convinced that the Shevardino Redoubt was the left flank of the position, and that Kutuzov himself, in his report, written in hot haste after the battle, speaks of the Shevardino Redoubt as the left flank of the position. It was much later, when reports on the Battle of Bordino were written at leisure, that the incorrect and extraordinary statement was invented, probably to justify the mistakes of a commander-in-chief who had to be represented as infallible, that the Shevardino Redoubt was an advanced post, whereas in reality it was simply a fortified point on the left flank, and that the Battle of Borodino was fought by us on an entrenched position previously selected, whereas it was fought on a quite unexpected spot which was almost unentrenched. The case was evidently this. A position was selected along the river Kolocha, which crosses the high road not at a right angle but at an acute angle, so that the left flank was at Shevardino, the right flank near the village of Novoye, and the center at Borodino, at the confluence of the rivers Kolocha and Boina. To anyone who looks at the field of Borodino without thinking of how the battle was actually fought, this position, protected by the river Kolocha, presents itself as obvious for an army whose object was to prevent an enemy from advancing along the Smolensk road to Moscow. Napoleon, riding to Valuyevo on the 24th, did not see, as the history books say he did, the position of the Russians from Utica to Borodino. He could not have seen that position because it did not exist. Nor did he see an advanced post of the Russian army. But while pursuing the Russian rearguard, he came upon the left flank of the Russian position, at the Shevardino Redoubt, and, unexpectedly for the Russians, moved his army across the Kolocha. And the Russians, not having time to begin a general engagement, withdrew their left wing from the position they had intended to occupy and took up a new position which had not been foreseen and was not fortified. By crossing to the other side of the Kolocha, to the left of the high road, Napoleon shifted the whole forthcoming battle from right to left, looking from the Russian side, and transferred it to the plain between Utica, Semyonovsk, and Borodino, a plain no more advantageous as a position than any other plain in Russia. And there the whole battle of the 26th of August took place. Had Napoleon not ridden out on the evening of the 24th to the Kolocha, and had he not then ordered an immediate attack on the redoubt, but had begun the attack next morning, no one would have doubted that the Shevardino redoubt was the left flank of our position, and the battle would have taken place where we expected it. In that case, we should probably have defended the Shevardino redoubt, our left flank, still more obstinately. We should have attacked Napoleon in the center or on the right, and the engagement would have taken place on the 25th, in the position we intended and had fortified. But as the attack on our left flank took place in the evening after the retreat of our rear guard, that is, immediately after the fight at Gridnova, and as the Russian commanders did not wish or were not in time to begin a general engagement then on the evening of the 24th, the first and chief action of the Battle of Borodino was already lost on the 24th and obviously led to the loss of the one fort on the 26th. After the loss of the Shevardino Redoubt, we found ourselves on the morning of the 25th without a position for our left flank and were forced to bend it back and hastily entrench it where it chanced to be. 
Not only was the Russian army on the 26th defended by weak, unfinished entrenchments, but the disadvantage of that position was increased by the fact that the Russian commanders, not having fully realized what had happened, namely the loss of our position on the left flank and the shifting of the whole field of the forthcoming battle from right to left, maintained their extended position from the village of Novoye to Utitsa, and consequently had to move their forces from right to left during the battle. So it happened that throughout the whole battle, the Russians opposed the entire French army launched against our left flank with but half as many men. Poniatowski's action against Utitsa and Uvarov's on the right flank against the French were actions distinct from the main course of the battle. So the Battle of Borodino did not take place at all, as in an effort to conceal our commander's mistakes even at the cost of diminishing the glory due to the Russian army and people, it has been described. The Battle of Borodino was not fought on a chosen and entrenched position with forces only slightly weaker than those of the enemy, but, as a result of the loss of the Shevardino Redoubt, the Russians fought the Battle of Borodino on an open and almost unentrenched position with forces only half as numerous as the French. That is to say, under conditions in which it was not merely unthinkable to fight for ten hours and secure an indecisive result, but unthinkable to keep an army even from complete disintegration and flight. Chapter 20 Pierre encounters cavalry advancing and carts of wounded retiring. He talks to an army doctor. Pierre looks for the position occupied by the army. Peasant militia digging entrenchments. On the morning of the 25th, Pierre was leaving Mozhaisk. At the descent of the high, steep hill, down which a winding road led out of the town past the cathedral on the right, where a service was being held and the bells were ringing, Pierre got out of his vehicle and proceeded on foot. Behind him, a cavalry regiment was coming down the hill, preceded by its singers. Coming up toward him was a train of carts carrying men who had been wounded in the engagement the day before. The peasant drivers, shouting and lashing their horses, kept crossing from side to side. The carts, in each of which three or four wounded soldiers were lying or sitting, jolted over the stones that had been thrown on the steep incline to make it something like a road. The wounded, bandaged with rags, with pale cheeks, compressed lips, and knitted brows, held on to the sides of the carts as they were jolted against one another. Almost all of them stared with naive, childlike curiosity at Pierre's white hat and green swallowtail coat. Pierre's coachman shouted angrily at the convoy of wounded to keep to one side of the road. The cavalry regiment, as it descended the hill with its singers, surrounded Pierre's carriage and blocked the road. Pierre stopped, being pressed against the side of the cutting in which the road ran. The sunshine from behind the hill did not penetrate into the cutting, and there it was cold and damp. But above Pierre's head was the bright August sunshine, and the bells sounded merrily. One of the carts with wounded stopped by the side of the road close to Pierre. The driver in his bast shoes ran panting up to it, placed a stone under one of its tireless hind wheels and began arranging the breech band on his little horse. One of the wounded, an old soldier with a bandaged arm who was following the cart on foot, caught hold of it with his sound hand and turned to look at Pierre. I say, fellow countrymen, will they set us down here or take us on to Moscow? he asked. Pierre was so deep in thought that he did not hear the question. He was looking now at the cavalry regiment that had met the convoy of wounded, now at the cart by which he was standing in which two wounded men were sitting and one was lying. One of those sitting up in the cart had probably been wounded in the cheek. His whole head was wrapped in rags, and one cheek was swollen to the size of a baby's head. His nose and mouth were twisted to one side. This soldier was looking at the cathedral and crossing himself. Another, a young lad, a fair-haired recruit as white as though there were no blood in his thin face, looked at Pierre kindly with a fixed smile. The third lay prone so that his face was not visible. 
The cavalry singers were passing close by. Ah, lost, quite lost, is my head so keen, living in a foreign land, they sang their soldiers' dance song. As if responding to them, but with a different sort of merriment, the metallic sound of the bells reverberated high above, and the hot rays of the sun bathed the top of the opposite slope with yet another sort of merriment. But beneath the slope, by the cart with the wounded, near the panting little nag where Pierre stood, it was damp, sober, and sad. The soldier with the swollen cheek looked angrily at the cavalry singers. Oh, the coxcombs, he muttered reproachfully. It's not the soldiers only, but I've seen peasants today, too. The peasants, even they have to go, said the soldier behind the cart, addressing Pierre with a sad smile. No distinctions made nowadays. They want the whole nation to fall on them. In a word, it's Moscow. They want to make an end of it. In spite of the obscurity of the soldier's words, Pierre understood what he wanted to say and nodded approval. The road was clear again. Pierre descended the hill and drove on. He kept looking to either side of the road for familiar faces, but only saw everywhere the unfamiliar faces of various military men of different branches of the service, who all looked with astonishment at his white hat and green tailcoat. Having gone nearly three miles, he at last met an acquaintance and eagerly addressed him. This was one of the head army doctors. He was driving toward Pierre in a covered gig, sitting beside a young surgeon and on recognizing Pierre, he told the Cossack who occupied the driver's seat to pull up. Count, Your Excellency, how come you to be here? asked the doctor. Well, you know, I wanted to see... Yes, yes, there will be something to see. Pierre got out and talked to the doctor, explaining his intention of taking part in a battle. The doctor advised him to apply direct to Kutuzov. Why should you be God knows where out of sight during the battle? He said, exchanging glances with his young companion. Anyhow, His Serene Highness knows you and will receive you graciously. That's what you must do. The doctor seemed tired and in a hurry. You think so? I, I, I also wanted to ask you where our position is exactly, said Pierre. The position, repeated the doctor. Uh, well, uh, that's not my line. Uh, drive past Tatarinova. A lot of digging is going on there. Uh, go up the hillock and you'll see. Can one see from there? If you would... But the doctor interrupted him and moved toward his gig. I would go with you, but uh, on my honor I'm up to here. And he pointed to his throat. I'm galloping to the commander of the corps. How do matters stand? You know, Count, there'll be a battle tomorrow. Out of an army of a hundred thousand, we must expect at least twenty thousand wounded, and we haven't stretchers or bunks or dressers or doctors enough for six thousand. We have ten thousand carts, but we need other things as well. We must manage as best we can. The strange thought that of the thousands of men, young and old, who had stared with merry surprise at his hat, perhaps the very men he had noticed, twenty thousand were inevitably doomed to wounds and death amazed Pierre. They may die tomorrow. Why are they thinking of anything but death? And by some latent sequence of thought, the descent of the Mujaisk hill, the carts with the wounded, the ringing bells, the slanting rays of the sun, and the songs of the cavalrymen, vividly recurred to his mind. A cavalry ride to battle and meet the wounded, and do not for a moment think of what awaits them, but pass by, winking at the wounded. Yet from among these men, twenty thousand are doomed to die. And they wonder at my hat. Strange, thought Pierre, continuing his way to Tatarinova. In front of a landowner's house to the left of the road stood carriages, wagons, and crowds of orderlies and sentinels. The commander-in-chief was putting up there, but just when Pierre arrived, he was not in, and hardly any of his staff were there. They had gone to the church service. Pierre drove on toward Gorky. When he had ascended the hill and reached the little village street, 
He saw for the first time peasant militiamen in their white shirts and with crosses on their caps, who, talking and laughing loudly, animated and perspiring, were at work on a huge knoll overgrown with grass to the right of the road. Some of them were digging, others were wheeling barrow loads of earth along planks, while others stood about doing nothing. Two officers were standing on the knoll directing the men. On seeing these peasants, who were evidently still amused by the novelty of their position as soldiers, Pierre once more thought of the wounded men at Mujaisk, and understood what the soldier had meant when he said, they want the whole nation to fall on them. The sight of these bearded peasants at work on the battlefield, with their queer clumsy boots and perspiring necks, and their shirts opening from the left toward the middle, unfastened, exposing their sunburned collarbones, impressed Pierre more strongly with the solemnity and importance of the moment than anything he had yet seen or heard. Chapter 21 Pierre ascends a knoll at Gorky, surveys the scene, and inquires as to the position occupied. A procession carrying the Smolensk Mother of God, the reverence of the crowd and of Kutuzov. Pierre stepped out of his carriage, and passing the toiling militiamen, ascended the knoll, from which, according to the doctor, the battlefield could be seen. It was about eleven o'clock. The sun shone somewhat to the left and behind him, and brightly lit up the enormous panorama which, rising like an amphitheatre, extended before him in the clear, rarefied atmosphere. From above on the left, bisecting that amphitheatre, wound the Smolensk High Road, passing through a village with a white church, some five hundred paces in front of the knoll and below it. This was Borodino. Below the village, the road crossed the river by a bridge, and winding down and up, rose higher and higher to the village of Valuyevo, visible about four miles away, where Napoleon was then stationed. Beyond Valuyevo, the road disappeared into a yellowing forest on the horizon. Far in the distance in that birch and fir forest to the right of the road, the cross and belfry of the Kolocha Monastery gleamed in the sun. Here and there, over the whole of that blue expanse, to right and left of the forest and the road, smoking campfires could be seen, and indefinite masses of troops, ours and the enemy's. The ground to the right, along the course of the Kolocha and Moskva rivers, was broken and hilly. Between the hollows, the villages of Bezubova and Zakharino showed in the distance. On the left, the ground was more level. There were fields of grain, and the smoking ruins of Semyonovsk, which had been burned down, could be seen. All that Pierre saw was so indefinite that neither the left nor the right side of the field fully satisfied his expectations. Nowhere could he see the battlefield he had expected to find, but only fields, meadows, troops, woods, the smoke of campfires, villages, mounds, and streams. And try as he would, he could descry no military position in this place which teemed with life, nor could he even distinguish our troops from the enemy's. I must ask someone who knows, he thought, and addressed an officer who was looking with curiosity at his huge, unmilitary figure. May I ask you, said Pierre, what village that is in front? Good, you know, isn't it? said the officer, turning to his companion. What did he know? the other corrected him. The officer, evidently glad of an opportunity for a talk, moved up to Pierre. Are those our men there? Pierre inquired. Yes, and there further on are the French, said the officer. There they are, there. You can see them. Where? Where? asked Pierre. One can see them with the naked eye. Why, there? The officer pointed with his hand to the smoke visible on the left beyond the river, and the same stern and serious expression that Pierre had noticed on many of the faces he had met came into his face. Ah, so those are the French, said Pierre. And over there, he pointed to a knoll on the left near which some troops could be seen. Those are ours, said the officer. Ah, ours. And there, Pierre pointed to another knoll in the distance with a big tree on it, near a village that lay in a hollow, where also some campfires were smoking and something black was visible. That's his again, said the officer. It was the Shevardino Redoubt. 
It was ours yesterday, but now it is his. Then how about our position? Our position, replied the officer with a smile of satisfaction, I can tell you quite clearly because I constructed nearly all our entrenchments. There, you see? There's our center at Borodino, just there. And he pointed to the village in front of them with a the white church. That's where one crosses the Kolocha. You see down there where the rows of hay are lying in the hollow? There's the bridge. That's our center. Our right flank is over there. He pointed sharply to the right, far away in the broken ground. That's where the Moskva River is, and we've thrown up three redoubts there, very strong ones. The left flank... Here the officer paused. Well, you see, that's difficult to explain. Uh, yesterday our left flank was there at Shevardino. You see where the oak is? But now we've withdrawn our left wing. Uh, now it's uh, over there. Do you see that village in the smoke? That's Semyonovsk. Yes, there. He pointed to Rayevsky's knoll. But the battle will hardly be there. His having moved his troops there is only a ruse. He will probably pass round to the right of the Moskva. But wherever it may be, many a man will be missing tomorrow, he remarked. An elderly sergeant who had approached the officer while he was giving these explanations had waited in silence for him to finish speaking, but at this point, evidently not liking the officer's remark, interrupted him. Gabians must be sent for, said he sternly. The officer appeared abashed, as though he understood that one might think of how many men would be missing tomorrow, but ought not to speak of it. Well, send number three company again, the officer replied hurriedly. And you, are you one of the doctors? No, I've come on my own, answered Pierre, and he went down the hill again, passing the militiamen. Oh, those damn fellows, muttered the officer who followed him holding his nose as he ran past the men at work. There they are, bringing her coming. There they are. They'll be here in a minute, voices were suddenly heard saying, and officers, soldiers, and militiamen began running forward along the road. A church procession was coming up the hill from Borodino. First along the dusty road came the infantry in ranks, bareheaded and with arms reversed. From behind them came the sound of church singing. Soldiers and militiamen ran bareheaded past Pierre toward the procession. They're bringing her, our protectress, the Iberian mother of God, someone cried. The Smolensk mother of God, another corrected him. The militiamen, both those who had been in the village and those who had been at work on the battery, threw down their spades and ran to meet the church procession. Following the battalion that marched along the dusty road came priests in their vestments, one little old man in a hood with attendants and singers. Behind them, soldiers and officers bore a large, dark-faced icon with an embossed metal cover. This was the icon that had been brought from Smolensk and had since accompanied the army. Behind, before, and on both sides, crowds of militiamen with bared heads walked, ran, and bowed to the ground. At the summit of the hill they stopped with the icon. The men who had been holding it up by the linen bands attached to it were relieved by others. The chanters relit their censers, and service began. The hot rays of the sun beat down vertically, and a fresh soft wind played with the hair of the bared heads and with the ribbons decorating the icon. The singing did not sound loud under the open sky. An immense crowd of bareheaded officers, soldiers, and militiamen surrounded the icon. Behind the priest and the chanter stood the notabilities on a spot reserved for them. A bald general with a St. George's cross on his neck stood just behind the priest's back, and without crossing himself, he was evidently a German, patiently awaited the end of the service which he considered it necessary to hear to the end, probably to arouse the patriotism of the Russian people. Another general stood in a martial pose, crossing himself by shaking his hand in front of his chest while looking about him. Standing among the crowd of peasants, Pierre recognized several acquaintances among these notables, but did not look at them. His whole attention was absorbed in watching the serious expression on the faces of the crowd of soldiers and militiamen who were all gazing eagerly at the icon. 
As soon as the tired chanters, who were singing the service for the twentieth time that day, began lazily and mechanically to sing, Save from calamity thy servants, O Mother of God, and the priest and deacon chimed in, For to thee under God we all flee, as to an inviolable bulwark and protection. There again kindled in all those faces the same expression of consciousness of the solemnity of the impending moment that Pierre had seen on the faces at the foot of the hill at Merzhaisk, and momentarily on many and many faces he had met that morning, and heads were bowed more frequently, and hair tossed back, and sighs and the sound men made as they crossed themselves were heard. The crowd round the icon suddenly parted and pressed against Pierre. Someone, a very important personage, judging by the haste with which way was made for him, was approaching the icon. It was Kutuzov, who had been riding round the position, and on his way back to Tatarinova had stopped where the service was being held. Pierre recognized him at once by his peculiar figure, which distinguished him from everybody else. With a long overcoat on his exceedingly stout, round-shouldered body, with uncovered white head and puffy face showing the white ball of the eye he had lost, Kutuzov walked with plunging, swaying gait into the crowd and stopped behind the priest. He crossed himself with an accustomed movement, bent till he touched the ground with his hand, and bowed his white head with a deep sigh. Behind Kutuzov was Benningson and the suite. Despite the presence of the commander-in-chief who attracted the attention of all the superior officers, the militiamen and soldiers continued their prayers without looking at him. When the service was over, Kutuzov stepped up to the icon, sank heavily to his knees, bowed to the ground, and for a long time tried vainly to rise, but could not do so on account of his weakness and weight. His white head twitched with the effort. At last he rose, kissed the icon as a child does with naively pouting lips, and again bowed till he touched the ground with his hand. The other generals followed his example, then the officers, and after them, with excited faces pressing on one another, crowding, panting, and pushing, scrambled the soldiers and militiamen. Chapter 22 Boris Meets Pierre Dolokhov makes his way to Kutuzov. Kutuzov notices Pierre. Dolokhov asks Pierre to be reconciled. Staggering amid the crush, Pierre looked about him. Count Peter Kirillovich, how did you get here? said a voice. Pierre looked round. Boris Drubetskoy, brushing his knees with his hand, he had probably soiled them when he too had knelt before the icon, came up to him smiling. Boris was elegantly dressed, with a slightly martial touch appropriate to a campaign. He wore a long coat, and like Kutuzov had a whip slung across his shoulder. Meanwhile Kutuzov had reached the village and seated himself in the shade of the nearest house, on a bench which one Cossack had run to fetch and another had hastily covered with a rug. An immense and brilliant suite surrounded him. The icon was carried further, accompanied by the throng. Pierre stopped some thirty paces from Kutuzov, talking to Boris. He explained his wish to be present at the battle and to see the position. This is what you must do, said Boris. I will do the honors of the camp to you. You will see everything best from where Count Benningson will be. I am in attendance on him, you know. I'll mention it to him. But if you want to ride round the position, come along with us. We're just going to the left flank. Then, when we get back, do spend the night with me and we'll arrange a game of cards. Of course, you know Dmitri Sergeyevich. Those are his quarters. And he pointed to the third house in the village of Gorky. But I should like to see the right flank. They say it's very strong, said Pierre. I should like to start from the Moskva River and ride round the whole position. Well, you can do that later, but the chief thing is the left flank. Yes, yes, but where is uh, Prince Bolkonsky's regiment? Can you point it out to me? Prince Andrews? We shall pass it, and I'll take you to him. What about the left flank? asked Pierre. Well, to tell you the truth, between ourselves, God only knows what state our left flank is in, said Boris, confidentially lowering his voice. It is not at all what Count Benningson intended. He meant to fortify that knoll quite differently, but... Boris shrugged his shoulders. 
His Serene Highness would not have it, or someone persuaded him. You see, but Boris did not finish, for at that moment Kaisarov, Kutuzov's adjutant, came up to Pierre. Ah, Kaisarov, said Boris, addressing him with an unembarrassed smile. I was just trying to explain our position to the Count. It is amazing how His Serene Highness could so foresee the intentions of the French. You mean the left flank? asked Kaisarov. Yes, exactly. The left flank is now extremely strong. Though Kutuzov had dismissed all unnecessary men from the staff, Boris had contrived to remain at headquarters after the changes. He had established himself with Count Benningsen, who, like all on whom Boris had been in attendance, considered young Prince Trubetskoy an invaluable man. In the higher command there were two sharply defined parties, Kutuzov's party and that of Benningsen, the chief of staff. Boris belonged to the latter, and no one else, while showing servile respect to Kutuzov, could so create an impression that the old fellow was not much good and that Benningsen managed everything. Now the decisive moment of battle had come when Kutuzov would be destroyed and the power passed to Benningsen. Or even if Kutuzov won the battle, it would be felt that everything was done by Benningsen. In any case, many great rewards would have to be given for tomorrow's action, and new men would come to the front. So Boris was full of nervous vivacity all that day. After Kaisarov, others whom Pierre knew came up to him, and he had not time to reply to all the questions about Moscow that were showered upon him, or to listen to all that was told him. The faces all expressed animation and apprehension. But it seemed to Pierre that the cause of the excitement shown in some of these faces lay chiefly in questions of personal success. His mind, however, was occupied by the different expression he saw on other faces, an expression that spoke not of personal matters, but of the universal questions of life and death. Kutuzov noticed Pierre's figure and the group gathered round him. Call him to me, said Kutuzov. An adjutant told Pierre of His Serene Highness's wish, and Pierre went toward Kutuzov's bench. But a militiaman got there before him. It was Dolohov. How did that fellow get here? asked Pierre. He's a creature that wriggles in anywhere, was the answer. He's been degraded, you know. Now he wants to bob up again. He's been proposing some scheme or other and has crawled into the enemy's picket line at night. He's a brave fellow. Pierre took off his hat and bowed respectfully to Kutuzov. I concluded that if I reported to your Serene Highness, you might send me away or say that you knew what I was reporting, but then I shouldn't lose anything, Dolokhov was saying. Yes, yes. But if I were right, I should be rendering a service to my fatherland, for which I am ready to die. Yes, yes. And should your Serene Highness require a man who will not spare his skin, please think of me. Perhaps I may prove useful to your Serene Highness. Yes, yes, Kutuzov repeated, his laughing eye narrowing more and more as he looked at Pierre. Just then, Boris, with his courtier-like adroitness, stepped up to Pierre's side near Kutuzov, and in a most natural manner, without raising his voice, said to Pierre, as though continuing an interrupted conversation, The militia have put on clean white shirts to be ready to die. What heroism, Count! Boris evidently said this to Pierre in order to be overheard by His Serene Highness. He knew Kutuzov's attention would be caught by those words. And so it was. What are you saying about the militia? he asked Boris. Preparing for tomorrow, Your Serene Highness, for death. They put on clean shirts. Ah, a wonderful, a matchless people, said Kutuzov, and he closed his eyes and swayed his head. A matchless people, he repeated with a sigh. So you want to smell gunpowder, he said to Pierre. Yes, it's a pleasant smell. I have the honor to be one of your wife's adorers. Is she well? My quarters are at your service. And as often happens with old people, Kutuzov began looking about absent-mindedly as if forgetting all he wanted to say or do. Then, evidently remembering what he wanted, he beckoned to Andrew Kaisarov, his adjutant's brother. Those verses, those uh, verses of Marian's, how did they go, eh? Those he wrote about Gerakov, lectures for the corps indicting. Recite them, recite them, said he, evidently preparing to laugh. Kaisarov recited. 
Kutuzov smilingly nodded his head to the rhythm of the verses. When Pierre had left Kutuzov, Dolokhov came up to him and took his hand. I'm very glad to meet you here, Count, he said aloud, regardless of the presence of strangers and in a particularly resolute and solemn tone. On the eve of a day when God alone knows who of us is fated to survive, I am glad of this opportunity to tell you that I regret the misunderstandings that occurred between us, and should wish you not to have any ill feeling for me. I beg you to forgive me. Pierre looked at Dolokhov with a smile, not knowing what to say to him. With tears in his eyes, Dolokhov embraced Pierre and kissed him. Boris said a few words to his general, and Count Benningsen turned to Pierre and proposed that he should ride with him along the line. It will interest you, said he. Yes, very much, replied Pierre. Half an hour later, Kutuzov left for Tatarinova, and Benningsen and his suite, with Pierre among them, set out on their ride along the line. Chapter 23 Pierre rides to the left flank with Benningsen, who explains the position in a way Pierre does not understand, and changes one of Kutuzov's dispositions. From Gorky, Benningsen descended the high road to the bridge, which, when they had looked at it from the hill, the officer had pointed out as being the centre of our position, and where rows of fragrant new-mown hay lay by the riverside. They rode across that bridge into the village of Borodino, and thence turned to the left, passing an enormous number of troops and guns, and came to a high knoll where militiamen were digging. This was the redoubt, as yet unnamed, which afterwards became known as the Rayevsky Redoubt, or the Knoll Battery. But Pierre paid no special attention to it. He did not know that it would become more memorable to him than any other spot on the plain of Borodino. They then crossed the hollow to Semyonovsk, where the soldiers were dragging away the last logs from the huts and barns. Then they rode downhill and uphill, across a rye field trodden and beaten down as if by hail, following a track freshly made by the artillery over the furrows of the ploughed land, and reached some fleshes which were still being dug. At the fleshes, Benningsen stopped and began looking at the Shevardino redoubt opposite, which had been ours the day before, and where several horsemen could be described. The officers said that either Napoleon or Murat was there, and they all gazed eagerly at this little group of horsemen. Pierre also looked at them, trying to guess which of the scarcely discernible figures was Napoleon. At last, those mounted men rode away from the mound and disappeared. Benningsen spoke to a general who approached him and began explaining the whole position of our troops. Pierre listened to him, straining each faculty to understand the essential points of the impending battle, but was mortified to feel that his mental capacity was inadequate for the task. He could make nothing of it. Benningsen stopped speaking, and noticing that Pierre was listening, suddenly said to him, I don't think this interests you. On the contrary, it's very interesting, replied Pierre, not quite truthfully. From the fleshes, they rode still farther to the left, along a road winding through a thick, low-growing birch wood. In the middle of the wood, a brown hare with white feet sprang out, and, scared by the tramp of the many horses, grew so confused that it leaped along the road in front of them for some time arousing general attention and laughter, and only when several voices shouted at it did it dart to one side and disappear in the thicket. After going through the wood for about a mile and a half, they came out on a glade where troops of Tuchkov's corps were stationed to defend the left flank. Here at the extreme left flank, Benningsen talked a great deal and with much heat, and as it seemed to Pierre gave orders of great military importance. In front of Tuchkov's troops was some high ground not occupied by troops. Benningsen loudly criticized this mistake, saying that it was madness to leave a height which commanded the country around unoccupied, and to place troops below it. Some of the generals expressed the same opinion. One in particular declared with martial heat that they were put there to be slaughtered. Benningsen, on his own authority, ordered the troops to occupy the high ground. This disposition on the left flank increased Pierre's doubt of his own capacity to understand military matters. Listening to Benningsen and the generals criticizing the position of the troops behind the hill, he quite understood them and shared their opinion, 
but for that very reason he could not understand how the man who put them there behind the hill could have made so gross and palpable a blunder. Pierre did not know that these troops were not, as Bennigsen supposed, put there to defend the position, but were in a concealed position as an ambush, that they should not be seen and might be able to strike an approaching enemy unexpectedly. Bennigsen did not know this, and moved the troops forward according to his own ideas, without mentioning the matter to the commander-in-chief. Chapter 24 Prince Andrew's Reflections on Life and Death Pierre Comes to See Him On that bright evening of August 25th, Prince Andrew lay leaning on his elbow in a broken-down shed in the village of Knyazkovo at the further end of his regiment's encampment. Through a gap in the broken wall he could see beside the wooden fence a row of thirty-year-old birches with their lower branches lopped off, a field on which shocks of oats were standing, and some bushes near which rose the smoke of campfires, the soldiers' kitchens. Narrow and burdensome and useless to anyone as his life now seemed to him, Prince Andrew, on the eve of battle, felt agitated and irritable, as he had done seven years before at Austerlitz. He had received and given the orders for next day's battle, and had nothing more to do. But his thoughts, the simplest, clearest, and therefore most terrible thoughts, would give him no peace. He knew that tomorrow's battle would be the most terrible of all he had taken part in, and for the first time in his life the possibility of death presented itself to him, not in relation to any worldly matter or with reference to its effect on others, but simply in relation to himself to his own soul, vividly, plainly, terribly, and almost as a certainty. And from the height of this perception, all that had previously tormented and preoccupied him suddenly became illumined by a cold white light without shadows, without perspective, and without distinction of outline. All life appeared to him like magic lantern pictures, at which he had long been gazing by artificial light through a glass. Now he suddenly saw those badly daubed pictures in clear daylight and without a glass. Yes, yes, there they are, those false images that agitated and raptured and tormented me, said he to himself, passing in review the principal pictures of the magic lantern of life and regarding them now in the cold white daylight of his clear perception of death. There they are, those rudely painted figures that once seemed splendid and mysterious. Glory, the good of society, love of a woman, the fatherland itself. How important these pictures appeared to me, with what profound meaning they seemed to be filled. And it is all so simple, pale and crude in the cold white light of this morning which I feel is dawning for me. The three great sorrows of his life held his attention in particular, his love for a woman, his father's death, and the French invasion which had overrun half Russia. Love, that little girl who seemed to me brimming over with mystic forces. Yes, indeed, I loved her. I made romantic plans of love and happiness with her. Oh, what a boy I was, he said aloud bitterly. Ah, me, I believed in some ideal love which was to keep her faithful to me for the whole year of my absence. Like the gentle dove in the fable, she was to pine apart from me. But it was much simpler, really. It was all very simple and horrible. When my father built bald hills, he thought the place was his, his land, his heir, his peasants. But Napoleon came and swept him aside, unconscious of his existence, as he might brush a chip from his path, and his bald hills and his whole life fell to pieces. Princess Mary says it is a trial sent from above. What is the trial for, when he is not here and will never return? He is not here. For whom, then, is the trial intended? The fatherland, the destruction of Moscow. And tomorrow I shall be killed, perhaps not even by a Frenchman, 
but by one of our own men, by a soldier discharging a musket close to my ear as one of them did yesterday. And the French will come and take me by the head and heels and fling me into a hole that I may not stink under their noses. And new conditions of life will arise which will seem quite ordinary to others and about which I shall know nothing. I shall not exist. He looked at the row of birches shining in the sunshine with their motionless green and yellow foliage and white bark. To die, to be killed tomorrow. That I should not exist. That all this should still be, but no me. And the birches with their light and shade, the curly clouds, the smoke of the campfires, and all that was around him, changed and seemed terrible and menacing. A cold shiver ran down his spine. He rose quickly, went out of the shed, and began to walk about. After Prince Andrew had returned to the shed, voices were heard outside. Who's that? he cried. The red-nosed Captain Timochin, formerly Dolokhov's squadron commander, but now from lack of officers a battalion commander, shyly entered the shed, followed by an adjutant and the regimental paymaster. Prince Andrew rose hastily, listened to the business they had come about, gave them some further instructions, and was about to dismiss them when he heard a familiar lisping voice behind the shed. Devil take it, said the voice of a man stumbling over something. Prince Andrew looked out of the shed and saw Pierre, who had tripped over a pole on the ground and had nearly fallen, coming his way. It was unpleasant to Prince Andrew to meet people of his own set in general, and Pierre especially, for he reminded him of all the painful moments of his last visit to Moscow. You? What a surprise, said he. What brings you here? This is unexpected. As he said this, his eyes and face expressed more than coldness. They expressed hostility, which Pierre noticed at once. He had approached the shed full of animation, but on seeing Prince Andrew's face he felt constrained and ill at ease. I, I've come simply, you know, come. It, it, it interests me, said Pierre, who had so often that day senselessly repeated the word interesting. I wish to see the battle. Oh, yes. And what do the Masonic brothers say about war? How would they stop it? said Prince Andrew sarcastically. Well, and how's Moscow? And my people, have they reached Moscow at last? he asked seriously. Yes, they have. Julie Drubetskaya told me so. I went to see them, but missed them. They've gone to your estate near Moscow. Chapter 25 Timohin's Opinion of Kutuzov Prince Andrew on Barclay de Tolly, War and Chess, The Spirit of the Army, Volzogen and Clausewitz. The war must be extended widely. Pierre understands the importance of this war. Not take prisoners. What is war? Prince Andrew thinks of Natasha. The officers were about to take leave, but Prince Andrew, apparently reluctant to be left alone with his friend, asked them to stay and have tea. Seats were brought in, and so was the tea. The officers gazed with surprise at Pierre's huge, stout figure, and listened to his talk of Moscow and the position of our army, round which he had ridden. Prince Andrew remained silent, and his expression was so forbidding that Pierre addressed his remarks chiefly to Timochin, the good-natured battalion commander. So you understand the whole position of our troops, Prince Andrew interrupted him. Yes, Th that is, how do you mean, said Pierre. Not being a military man, I can't say I've understood it fully, but I understand the general position. Well, then you know more than anyone else, be it who it may, said Prince Andrew. Oh, said Pierre, looking over his spectacles in perplexity at Prince Andrew. Well, uh, and uh, what do you think of Kutuzov's appointment, he asked. I was very glad of his appointment, that's all I know, replied Prince Andrew. And uh, tell me your opinion of Barclay de Tolly. In Moscow they're saying heaven knows what about him. What do you think of him? Ask them, replied Prince Andrew, indicating the officers. 
Pierre looked at Timochin with the condescendingly interrogative smile with which everybody involuntarily addressed that officer. "'We see light again since his serenity has been appointed, Your Excellency,' said Timochin timidly, and continually turning to glance at his colonel. "'Why so?' asked Pierre. "'Well, to mention only firewood and fodder, let me inform you. Why, when we were retreating from Svensiani, we dare not touch a stick or a wisp of hay or anything. You see, we were going away, so he, the enemy was always he to the Russians, so he would get it all. Wasn't it so, Your Excellency? And again Timochin turned to the prince. But we daren't. In our regiment, two officers were court-martialed for that kind of thing. But when his serenity took command, everything became straightforward. Now we see light. Then why was it forbidden? Timochin looked about in confusion, not knowing what or how to answer such a question. Pierre put the same question to Prince Andrew. Why, so as not to lay waste the country we were abandoning to the enemy, said Prince Andrew with venomous irony. It is very sound. One can't permit the land to be pillaged and accustom the troops to marauding. At Smolensk, too, he judged correctly that the French might outflank us, as they had larger forces. But he could not understand this, cried Prince Andrew in a shrill voice that seemed to escape him involuntarily. He could not understand that there, for the first time, we were fighting for Russian soil, and that there was a spirit in the men such as I had never seen before, that we had held the French for two days, and that that success had increased our strength tenfold. He ordered us to retreat and all our efforts and losses went for nothing. He had no thought of betraying us. He tried to do the best he could. He thought out everything, and that is why he is unsuitable. He is unsuitable now just because he plans out everything very thoroughly and accurately as every German has to. How can I explain? Well, say your father has a German valet, and he's a splendid valet and satisfies your father's requirements better than you could. Then it's all right to let him serve. But if your father is mortally sick, you'll send the valet away and attend to your father with your own unpractised, awkward hands, and will soothe him better than a skilled man who was a stranger could. So it has been with Barclay. While Russia was well, a foreigner could serve her and be a splendid minister. But as soon as she's in danger, she needs one of her own kin. But in your club, they've been making him out a traitor. They slander him as a traitor. And the only result will be that afterwards, ashamed of their false accusations, they will make him out a hero or a genius instead of a traitor. And that will be still more unjust. He is an honest and very punctilious German. And they say he's a skillful commander, rejoined Pierre. I don't understand what is meant by a skillful commander, replied Prince Andrew ironically. A skillful commander, replied Pierre. Why, uh, one who foresees all contingencies and foresees the adversary's intentions. But that's impossible, said Prince Andrew, as if it were a matter settled long ago. Pierre looked at him in surprise. And yet they say that war is like a game of chess, he remarked. Yes, replied Prince Andrew, but with this little difference that in chess you may think over each move as long as you please and are not limited for time, and with this difference, too, that a knight is always stronger than a pawn, and two pawns are always stronger than one, while in war a battalion is sometimes stronger than a division and sometimes weaker than a company. The relative strength of bodies of troops can never be known to anyone. Believe me, he went on. If things depended on arrangements made by the staff, I should be there making arrangements. But instead of that, I have the honor to serve here in the regiment with these gentlemen, and I consider that on us tomorrow's battle will depend, and not on those others. Success never depends, and never will depend, on position or equipment, or even on numbers, and least of all on position. But on what, then? On the feeling that is in me and in him he pointed to Timochin, and in each soldier. Prince Andrew glanced at Timochin, who looked at his commander in alarm and bewilderment. And bewilderment. And bewilderment. And bewilderment. And bewilderment. And bewilderment. 
In contrast to his former reticent taciturnity, Prince Andrew now seemed excited. He could apparently not refrain from expressing the thoughts that had suddenly occurred to him. A battle is won by those who firmly resolved to win it. Why did we lose the battle at Austerlitz? The French losses were almost equal to ours, but very early we said to ourselves that we were losing the battle, and we did lose it. And we said so because we had nothing to fight for there. We wanted to get away from the battlefield as soon as we could. We've lost, so let us run. And we ran. If we had not said that till the evening, heaven knows what might not have happened. But tomorrow we shan't say it. You talk about our position, the left flank weak and the right flank too extended, he went on. That's all nonsense. There's nothing of the kind. But what awaits us tomorrow? A hundred million most diverse chances which will be decided on the instant by the fact that our men or theirs run or do not run and that this man or that man is killed. But all that is being done at present is only play. The fact is that those men with whom you have ridden round the position not only do not help matters, but hinder. They're only concerned with their own petty interests. At such a moment, said Pierre reproachfully, at such a moment, Prince Andrew repeated, to them it is only a moment affording opportunities to undermine a rival and obtain an extra cross or ribbon. For me, tomorrow means this, a Russian army of a hundred thousand, and a French army of a hundred thousand have met to fight, and the thing is that these two hundred thousand men will fight, and the sight that fights more fiercely and spares itself least will win. And if you like, I will tell you what, that whatever happens, and whatever muddles those at the top may make, we shall win tomorrow's battle. Tomorrow, happen what may, we shall win. There now, Your Excellency, that's the truth, the real truth, said Timochin. Who would spare himself now? The soldiers in my battalion, believe me, wouldn't drink their vodka. It's not the day for that, they say. All were silent. The officers rose. Prince Andrew went out of the shed with them, giving final orders to the adjutant. After they had gone, Pierre approached Prince Andrew and was about to start a conversation when they heard the clatter of three horses' hooves on the road not far from the shed, and, looking in that direction, Prince Andrew recognized Voltsogen and Clausewitz, accompanied by a Cossack. They rode close by, continuing to converse, and Prince Andrew involuntarily heard these words. Der Krieg muss in Raum verlegt werden. Der Ansicht kann ich nicht genug preisgeben. The war must be extended widely. I cannot sufficiently commend that view, said one of them. Oh, ja, said the other. Der Zweck ist nur den Feind zu schwächen. So can man gewiss nicht den Verlust der Privatpersonen in Achtung nehmen. The only aim is to weaken the enemy, so of course one cannot take into account the loss of private individuals. Oh, no, agreed the other. Extend widely, said Prince Andrew with an angry snort when they had ridden past. In that extend were my father, son, and sister at Bald Hills. That's all the same to him. That's what I was saying to you. Those German gentlemen won't win the battle tomorrow, but will only make all the mess they can, because they've nothing in their German heads but theories not worth an empty eggshell, and haven't in their hearts the one thing needed tomorrow, that which Timochin has. They've yielded up all Europe to him, and have now come to teach us. Fine teachers! And again his voice grew shrill. So you think we shall win tomorrow's battle? asked Pierre. Yes, yes, answered Prince Andrew absently. What, one thing I would do if I had the power, he began again. I would not take prisoners. Why take prisoners? It's chivalry. The French have destroyed my home and are on their way to destroy Moscow. They've outraged and are outraging me every moment. They are my enemies. In my opinion, they're all criminals. And so thinks Timochin and the whole army. They should be executed. Since they are my foes, they cannot be my friends, whatever may have been said at Tilsit. Yes, yes, muttered Pierre, looking with shining eyes at Prince Andrew. I, I quite agree with you. The question that had perturbed Pierre on the Mozhaisk hill and all that day now seemed to him quite clear and completely solved. He now understood the whole meaning and importance of this war and of the impending battle. All he had seen that day, 
all the significant and stern expressions on the faces he had seen in passing were lit up for him by a new light. He understood that latent heat, as they say in physics, of patriotism, which was present in all these men he had seen, and this explained to him why they all prepared for death calmly and, as it were, light-heartedly. Not take prisoners, Prince Andrew continued. That by itself would quite change the whole war and make it less cruel. As it is, we've played at war. That's what's vile. We play at magnanimity and all that stuff. Such magnanimity and sensibility are like the magnanimity and sensibility of a lady who faints when she sees a calf being killed. She's so kind-hearted that she can't look at blood, but enjoys eating the calf served up with sauce. They talk to us of the rules of war, of chivalry, of flags of truce, of mercy to the unfortunate, and so on. It's all rubbish. I saw chivalry and flags of truce in 1805. They humbugged us, and we humbugged them. They plunder other people's houses, issue false paper money. Worst of all, they kill my children and my father, and then talk rules of war and magnanimity to foes. Take no prisoners, but kill and be killed. He who has come to this as I have, through the same suffering. Prince Andrew, who had thought it was all the same to him whether or not Moscow was taken as Smolensk had been, was suddenly checked in his speech by an unexpected cramp in his throat. He paced up and down a few times in silence, but his eyes glittered feverishly, and his lips quivered as he began to speak again. If there was none of this magnanimity in war, we should go to war only when it was worthwhile going to certain death, as now. Then there would not be war because Paul Ivanovich had offended Michael Ivanovich. And when there was a war like this one, it would be war. And then the determination of the troops would be quite different. Then all these Westphalians and Hessians whom Napoleon is leading would not follow him into Russia. And we should not go to fight in Austria and Prussia without knowing why. War is not courtesy, but the most horrible thing in life. And we ought to understand that and not play at war. We ought to accept this terrible necessity sternly and seriously. It all lies in that. Get rid of falsehood and let war be war and not a game. As it is now, war is the favorite pastime of the idle and frivolous. The military calling is the most highly honored. But what is war? What is needed for success in warfare? What are the habits of the military? The aim of war is murder. The methods of war are spying, treachery, and their encouragement, the ruin of a country's inhabitants, robbing them or stealing to provision the army, and fraud and falsehood termed military craft. The habits of the military class are the absence of freedom, that is, discipline, idleness, ignorance, cruelty, debauchery, and drunkenness. And in spite of all this, it is the highest class, respected by everyone. All the kings except the Chinese wear military uniforms, and he who kills most people receives the highest rewards. They meet, as we shall meet tomorrow, to murder one another. They kill and maim tens of thousands, and then have thanksgiving services for having killed so many people. They even exaggerate the number. And they announce a victory, supposing that the more people they have killed, the greater their achievement. How does God above look at them and hear them? exclaimed Prince Andrew in a shrill, piercing voice. Ah, my friend, it has of late become hard for me to live. I see that I have begun to understand too much. And it doesn't do for man to taste of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Oh, well, it's not for long, he added. However, you're sleepy, and it's time for me to sleep. Go back to Gorky, said Prince Andrew suddenly. Oh, no, Pierre replied, looking at Prince Andrew with frightened, compassionate eyes. Go, go, before a battle one must have one sleep out, repeated Prince Andrew. He came quickly up to Pierre and embraced and kissed him. 
Goodbye, be off, he shouted. Whether we meet again or not, and turning away hurriedly, he entered the shed. It was already dark, and Pierre could not make out whether the expression of Prince Andrew's face was angry or tender. For some time he stood in silence, considering whether he should follow him or go away. No, he does not want it, Pierre concluded. And I know that this is our last meeting. He sighed deeply and rode back to Gorky. On re-entering the shed, Prince Andrew lay down on a rug, but he could not sleep. He closed his eyes. One picture succeeded another in his imagination. On one of them he dwelt long and joyfully. He vividly recalled an evening in Petersburg. Natasha, with animated and excited face, was telling him how she had gone to look for mushrooms the previous summer and had lost her way in the big forest. She incoherently described the depths of the forest, her feelings, and a talk with a beekeeper she met, and constantly interrupted her story to say, No, I, I can't. I'm not telling it right. No, you don't understand. Though he encouraged her by saying that he did understand, and he really had understood all she wanted to say. But Natasha was not satisfied with her own words. She felt that they did not convey the passionately poetic feeling she had experienced that day and wished to convey. He was such a delightful old man, and it was so dark in the forest, and he had such kind... No, I, I can't describe it, she had said, flushed and excited. Prince Andrew smiled now, the same happy smile as then when he had looked into her eyes. I understood her, he thought. I not only understood her, but it was just that inner spiritual force, that sincerity, that frankness of soul, that very soul of hers which seemed to be fettered by her body. It was that soul I loved in her, loved so strongly and happily. And suddenly he remembered how his love had ended. He did not need anything of that kind. He neither saw nor understood anything of the sort. He only saw in her a pretty and fresh young girl with whom he did not deign to unite his fate. And I... And he is still alive and gay. Prince Andrew jumped up as if someone had burned him and again began pacing up and down in front of the shed. Note. Prince Andrew, in this chapter, expresses an opinion of the campaign of 1812 near to that held by Tolstoy when writing the novel, and in some places even expresses Tolstoy's later view of war as an absolutely evil social phenomenon. When writing War and Peace, that view had not yet sunk deeply or occupied a permanent place in Tolstoy's outlook on life. That occurred considerably later. But it here flashes out in certain sentences like the lightning of a coming storm. Even before this, in The Raid, one of his very first stories, 1853, describing a march through beautiful Caucasian scenery, he had written, Can it be that there is not room for all men on this beautiful earth? under these immeasurable starry heavens. Can it be possible that in the midst of this entrancing nature, feelings of hatred, vengeance, or the passion for exterminating their fellows can endure in the souls of men? All that is unkind in the hearts of men ought, one would think, to vanish at the touch of nature, that most direct expression of beauty and goodness. And at the end of Sevastopol in May, published in 1855, the same feeling was again expressed. We have here an instance of the way in which feelings Tolstoy experienced before thinking matters out planted seed in his soul that many years later grew into great trees throwing their shade far around. End of note. Chapter 26 De Bosset brings a portrait of the King of Rome to Napoleon. Napoleon's Proclamation. On August 25th, the eve of the Battle of Borodino, Monsieur de Bosset, prefect of the French Emperor's palace, arrived at Napoleon's quarters at Valuyevo with Colonel Fabvier, the former from Paris 
and the latter from Madrid. Donning his court uniform, Monsieur de Bosset ordered a box he had brought for the Emperor to be carried before him and entered the first compartment of Napoleon's tent, where he began opening the box while conversing with Napoleon's aides-de-camp who surrounded him. Fabvier, not entering the tent, remained at the entrance talking to some generals of his acquaintance. The Emperor Napoleon had not yet left his bedroom and was finishing his toilet. Slightly snorting and grunting, he presented now his back and now his plump, hairy chest to the brush with which his valet was rubbing him down. Another valet, with his finger over the mouth of a bottle, was sprinkling eau de cologne on the Emperor's pampered body with an expression which seemed to say that he alone knew where and how much eau de cologne should be sprinkled. Napoleon's short hair was wet and matted on the forehead, but his face, though puffy and yellow, expressed physical satisfaction. Go on, harder, go on, he muttered to the valet who was rubbing him, slightly twitching and grunting. An aide-de-camp who had entered the bedroom to report to the emperor the number of prisoners taken in yesterday's action was standing by the door after delivering his message, awaiting permission to withdraw. Napoleon, frowning, looked at him from under his brows. No prisoners, said he, repeating the aide-de-camp's words. They're forcing us to exterminate them. So much the worse for the Russian army. Go on, harder, harder, he muttered, hunching his back and presenting his fat shoulders. All right, let Monsieur de Bosset enter, and Fabvier too, he said, nodding to the aide-de-camp. Yes, sire. And the aide-de-camp disappeared through the door of the tent. Two valets rapidly dressed his majesty, and wearing the blue uniform of the guards, he went with firm, quick steps to the reception room. De Bosset's hands, meanwhile, were busily engaged arranging the present he had brought from the Empress on two chairs directly in front of the entrance. But Napoleon had dressed and come out with such unexpected rapidity that he had not had time to finish arranging the surprise. Napoleon noticed at once what they were about and guessed that they were not ready. He did not wish to deprive them of the pleasure of giving him a surprise, so he pretended not to see de Bosset and called Fabvier to him, listening silently and with a stern frown to what Fabvier told him of the heroism and devotion of his troops fighting at Salamanca, at the other end of Europe, with but one thought, to be worthy of their emperor, and but one fear, to fail to please him. The result of that battle had been deplorable. Napoleon made ironic remarks during Fabvier's account, as if he had not expected that matters could go otherwise in his absence. I must make up for that in Moscow said Napoleon. I'll see you later, he added, and summoned de Bosset, who by that time had prepared the surprise, having placed something on the chairs and covered it with a cloth. De Bosset bowed low with that courtly French bow which only the old retainers of the Bourbons knew how to make, and approached Napoleon, presenting an envelope. Napoleon turned to him gaily and pulled his ear. You've hurried here. I'm very glad. Well, what is Paris saying? he asked suddenly changing his former stern expression for a most cordial tone. "'Sire, all Paris regrets your absence,' replied de Bosset, as was proper. But though Napoleon knew that de Bosset had to say something of this kind, and though in his lucid moments he knew it was untrue, he was pleased to hear it from him. Again he honoured him by touching his ear. "'I'm very sorry to have made you travel so far,' said he. "'Sire, I expected nothing less than to find you at the gates of Moscow.' replied de Bosset. Napoleon smiled, and, lifting his head absent-mindedly, glanced to the right. An aide-de-camp approached with gliding steps and offered him a gold snuff-box, which he took. "'Yes, it has happened luckily for you,' he said, raising the open snuff-box to his nose. "'You are fond of travel, and in three days you will see Moscow. You surely did not expect to see that Asiatic capital. You will have a pleasant journey.' De Bosset bowed gratefully at this regard for his taste for travel, of which he had not till then been aware. Huh, what's this? asked Napoleon, noticing that all the courtiers were looking at something concealed under a cloth. With courtly adroitness, de Bosset half turned, and without turning his back to the emperor, retired two steps, twitching off the cloth at the same time, and said, A present to your majesty from the empress. It was a portrait painted in bright colours by Gérard, of the son born to Napoleon by the daughter of the Emperor of Austria, 
the boy whom for some reason everyone called the King of Rome. A very pretty curly-headed boy with the look of the Christ in the Sistine Madonna was depicted playing at stick and ball. The ball represented the terrestrial globe and the stick in his other hand a scepter. Though it was not clear what the artist meant to express by depicting the so-called King of Rome spiking the earth with a stick, the allegory apparently seemed to Napoleon, as it had done to all who had seen it in Paris, quite clear and very pleasing. The King of Rome, he said, pointing to the portrait with a graceful gesture. Admirable. With the natural capacity of an Italian for changing the expression of his face at will, he drew nearer to the portrait and assumed a look of pensive tenderness. He felt that what he now said and did would be historical, and it seemed to him that it would now be best for him, whose grandeur enabled his son to play stick and ball with the terrestrial globe, to show, in contrast to that grandeur, the simplest paternal tenderness. His eyes grew dim. He moved forward, glanced round at a chair, which seemed to place itself under him, and sat down on it before the portrait. At a single gesture from him, everyone went out on tiptoe, leaving the great man to himself and his emotion. Having sat still for a while, he touched, himself not knowing why, the thick spot of paint representing the highest light in the portrait, rose, and recalled de Bosset and the officer on duty. He ordered the portrait to be carried outside his tent, that the old guard stationed round it might not be deprived of the pleasure of seeing the King of Rome, the son and heir of their adored monarch. And while he was doing Monsieur de Bosset the honour of breakfasting with him, they heard, as Napoleon had anticipated, the rapturous cries of the officers and men of the old guard who had run up to see the portrait. Vive l'Empereur! Vive le Roi de Rome! Vive l'Empereur! came those ecstatic cries. After breakfast, Napoleon, in de Bosset's presence, dictated his order of the day to the army. Short and energetic, he remarked, when he had read over the proclamation which he had dictated straight off without corrections. It ran, Soldiers, this is the battle you have so longed for. Victory depends on you. It is essential for us. It will give us all we need. Comfortable quarters and a speedy return to our country. Behave as you did at Austerlitz, Friedland, Vitebsk, and Smolensk. Let our remotest posterity recall your achievements this day with pride. Let it be said of each of you, he was in the great battle before Moscow. Before Moscow, repeated Napoleon, and inviting Monsieur de Bosset, who was so fond of travel, to accompany him on his ride, he went out of the tent to where the horses stood saddled. Your Majesty is too kind, replied de Bosset, to the invitation to accompany the Emperor. He wanted to sleep, did not know how to ride, and was afraid of doing so. But Napoleon nodded to the traveller, and de Bosset had to mount. When Napoleon came out of the tent, the shouting of the guards before his son's portrait grew still louder. Napoleon frowned. Take him away, he said, pointing with a gracefully majestic gesture to the portrait. It is too soon for him to see a field of battle. De Bosset closed his eyes, bowed his head, and sighed deeply to indicate how profoundly he valued and comprehended the Emperor's words. Chapter 27 Napoleon's Dispositions for the Battle of Borodino They were not carried out. On the 25th of August, so his historians tell us, Napoleon spent the whole day on horseback inspecting the locality, considering plans submitted to him by his marshals and personally giving commands to his generals. The original line of the Russian forces along the river Kolocha had been dislocated by the capture of the Shevardino Redoubt on the 24th, and part of the line, the left flank, had been drawn back. That part of the line was not entrenched, and in front of it, the ground was more open and level than elsewhere. It was evident to anyone, military or not, that it was here the French should attack. It would seem that not much consideration was needed to reach this conclusion, nor any particular care or trouble on the part of the Emperor and his marshals. Nor was there any need of that 
special and supreme quality called genius that people are so apt to ascribe to Napoleon. Yet the historians who described the event later and the men who then surrounded Napoleon, and he himself, thought otherwise. Napoleon rode over the plain and surveyed the locality with a profound air and in silence, nodded with approval or shook his head dubiously, and without communicating to the generals around him the profound course of ideas which guided his decisions, merely gave them his final conclusions in the form of commands. Having listened to a suggestion from Davout, who was now called Prince d'Ecmule, to turn the Russian left wing, Napoleon said it should not be done, without explaining why not. To a proposal made by General Campon, who was to attack the Fleches, to lead his division through the woods, Napoleon agreed, though the so-called Duke of Elchingen, nay, ventured to remark that a movement through the woods was dangerous and might disorder the division. Having inspected the country opposite the Shevardino Redoubt, Napoleon pondered a little in silence, and then indicated the spots where two batteries should be set up by the morrow to act against the Russian entrenchments, and the places where, in line with them, the field artillery should be placed. After giving these and other commands, he returned to his tent, and the dispositions for the battle were written down from his dictation. These dispositions of which the French historians write with enthusiasm and other historians with profound respect were as follows. At dawn, the two new batteries established during the night on the plain occupied by the Prince d'Ecmule will open fire on the two opposing batteries of the enemy. At the same time, the commander of the artillery of the First Corps, General Pernetti, with 30 cannon of Campon's division and all the howitzers of Dessay's and Friant's divisions will move forward, open fire, and overwhelm with shell fire the enemy's battery, against which will operate 24 guns of the artillery of the guards, 30 guns of Campon's division, and 8 guns of Friant's and Dessay's divisions, in all 62 guns. The commander of the artillery of the 3rd Corps, General Fouché, will place the howitzers of the 3rd and 8th Corps, 16 in all, on the flanks of the battery that is to bombard the entrenchment on the left, which will have 40 guns in all directed against it. General Sorbier must be ready at the first order to advance with all the howitzers of the guard's artillery against either one or other of the entrenchments. During the cannonade, Prince Poniatowski is to advance through the wood on the village and turn the enemy's position. General Campon will move through the wood to seize the first fortification. After the advance has begun in this manner, orders will be given in accordance with the enemy's movements. The cannonade on the left flank will begin as soon as the guns of the right wing are heard. The sharpshooters of Moron's division and of the Vice King's Murat, division will open a heavy fire on seeing the attack commence on the right wing. The vice king will occupy the village, Borodino, and cross by its three bridges, advancing to the same heights as Moron's and Gerard's divisions, which under his leadership will be directed against the redoubt and come into line with the rest of the forces. All this must be done in good order. Le tout se fera avec ordre et méthode, as far as possible retaining troops in reserve. The imperial camp near Mojaisk. September 6th, 1812. Note, the date of this French proclamation is new style and corresponds to August 25th, old style. These dispositions, which are very obscure and confused if one allows oneself to regard the arrangements without religious awe of his genius, related to Napoleon's orders to deal with four points, four different orders. Not one of these was or could be carried out. In the disposition it is said, first, that the batteries placed on the spot chosen by Napoleon, with the guns of Pernetti and Fouché, which were to come in line with them, 102 guns in all, were to open fire and shower shells on the Russian fleches and redoubts. This could not be done, as from the spots selected by Napoleon the projectiles did not carry to the Russian works and those 102 guns shot into the air 
until the nearest commander, contrary to Napoleon's instructions, moved them forward. The second order was that Poniatowski, moving to the village through the wood, should turn the Russian left flank. This could not be done and was not done because Poniatowski, advancing on the village through the wood, met Tuchkov there, barring his way, and could not and did not turn the Russian position. The third order was, General Campon will move through the wood to seize the first fortification. General Campon's division did not seize the first fortification, but was driven back, for on emerging from the wood, it had to reform under grape shot, of which Napoleon was unaware. The fourth order was, the vice-king will occupy the village, Borodino, and cross by its three bridges, advancing to the same heights as Moron's and Gerard's divisions, for whose movements no directions are given, which under his leadership will be directed against the redoubt and come into line with the rest of the forces. As far as one can make out, not so much from this unintelligible sentence as from the attempts the vice-king made to execute the orders given him, he was to advance from the left through Borodino to the redoubt, while the divisions of Moran and Gérard were to advance simultaneously from the front. All this, like the other parts of the disposition, was not and could not be executed. After passing through Borodino, the vice-king was driven back to the Colocha and could get no farther while the divisions of Moran and, G and Gérard did not take the redoubt, but were driven back, and the redoubt was only taken at the end of the battle by the cavalry, a thing probably unforeseen and not heard of by Napoleon. So, not one of the orders in the disposition was or could be executed. But in the disposition, it is said that after the fight has commenced in this manner, orders will be given in accordance with the enemy's movements. And so it might be supposed that all necessary arrangements would be made by Napoleon during the battle. But this was not and could not be done, for during the whole battle Napoleon was so far away that, as appeared later, he could not know the course of the battle, and not one of his orders during the fight could be executed. Chapter 28. Napoleon's Cold. Why the battle had to be fought. Many historians say that the French did not win the Battle of Borodino because Napoleon had a cold, and that if he had not had a cold, the orders he gave before and during the battle would have been still more full of genius, and Russia would have been lost, and the face of the world have been changed. To historians who believe that Russia was shaped by the will of one man, Peter the Great, and that France from a republic became an empire and French armies went to Russia at the will of one man, Napoleon. To say that Russia remained a power because Napoleon had a bad cold on the 24th of August may seem logical and convincing. If it had depended on Napoleon's will to fight or not to fight the Battle of Borodino, and if this or that other arrangement depended on his will, then evidently a cold affecting the manifestation of his will might have saved Russia, and consequently the valet who omitted to bring Napoleon his waterproof boots on the 24th would have been the saviour of Russia. Along that line of thought, such a deduction is indubitable, as indubitable as the deduction Voltaire made in jest, without knowing what he was jesting at, when he saw that the massacre of St. Bartholomew was due to Charles the Ninth's stomach being deranged. But to men who do not admit that Russia was formed by the will of one man, Peter I, or that the French Empire was formed and the war with Russia begun by the will of one man, Napoleon, that argument seems not merely untrue and irrational, but contrary to all human reality. To the question of what causes historic events, another answer presents itself, namely, that the course of human events is predetermined from on high, depends on the coincidence of the wills of all who take part in the events, and that a Napoleon's influence on the course of these events is purely external and fictitious. Strange as at first glance it may seem to suppose that the massacre of St. Bartholomew was not due to Charles IX's will, 
though he gave the order for it, and though it was done as a result of that order. And strange as it may seem to suppose that the slaughter of 80,000 men at Borodino was not due to Napoleon's will, though he ordered the commencement and conduct of the battle, and thought it was done because he ordered it, strange as these suppositions appear, yet human dignity, which tells me that each of us is, if not more, at least not less a man than the great Napoleon, demands the acceptance of that solution of the question, and historic investigation abundantly confirms it. At the Battle of Borodino, Napoleon shot at no one and killed no one. That was all done by the soldiers. Therefore, it was not he who killed people. The French soldiers went to kill and be killed at the Battle of Borodino, not because of Napoleon's orders, but by their own volition. The whole army, French, Italian, German, Polish, and Dutch, hungry, ragged, and weary of the campaign, felt at the sight of an army blocking their road to Moscow that the wine was drawn and must be drunk. Had Napoleon then forbidden them to fight the Russians, they would have killed him and have proceeded to fight the Russians because it was inevitable. When they heard Napoleon's proclamation offering them as compensation for mutilation and death, the words of posterity about their having been in the battle before Moscow, they cried, Vive l'Empereur, just as they had cried, Vive l'Empereur, at the sight of the portrait of the boy piercing the terrestrial globe with a toy stick, and just as they would have cried, Vive l'Empereur, at any nonsense that might be told them. There was nothing left for them to do but cry, Vive l'Empereur, and go to fight in order to get food and rest as conquerors in Moscow. So it was not because of Napoleon's commands that they killed their fellow men. And it was not Napoleon who directed the course of the battle, for none of his orders were executed, and during the battle he did not know what was going on before him. So the way in which these people killed one another was not decided by Napoleon's will, but occurred independently of him in accord with the will of hundreds of thousands of people who took part in the common action. It only seemed to Napoleon that it all took place by his will. And so the question whether he had or had not a cold has no more historic interest than the cold of the least of the transport soldiers. Moreover, the assertion made by various writers that his cold was the cause of his dispositions not being as well planned as on former occasions, and of his orders during the battle not being as good as previously, is quite baseless, which again shows that Napoleon's cold on the 26th of August was unimportant. The dispositions cited above are not at all worse, but are even better than previous dispositions by which he had won victories. His pseudo-orders during the battle were also no worse than formerly, but much the same as usual. These dispositions and orders only seem worse than previous ones because the Battle of Borodino was the first Napoleon did not win. The profoundest and most excellent dispositions and orders seem very bad, and every learned militarist criticizes them with looks of importance when they relate to a battle that has been lost and the very worst dispositions and orders seem very good, and serious people fill whole volumes to demonstrate their merits when they relate to a battle that has been won. The dispositions drawn up by Weirota for the Battle of Austerlitz were a model of perfection for that kind of composition, but still they were criticized, criticized for their very perfection, for their excessive minuteness. Napoleon, at the Battle of Borodino, fulfilled his office as representative of authority, as well as and even better than at other battles. He did nothing harmful to the progress of the battle, he inclined to the most reasonable opinions, he made no confusion, did not contradict himself, did not get frightened or run away from the field of battle, but with his great tact and military experience carried out his role of appearing to command calmly and with dignity. Chapter 29. Napoleon's talk to de Bosset and Rapp. The game begins. On returning from a second careful inspection of the lines, Napoleon remarked, 
The chess men are set up. The game will begin tomorrow. Having ordered Punch and summoned de Bosset, he began to talk to him about Paris and about some changes he meant to make in the Empress's household, surprising the prefect by his memory of minute details relating to the court. He showed an interest in trifles, joked about de Bosset's love of travel, and chatted carelessly as a famous self-confident surgeon who knows his job does when turning up his sleeves and putting on his apron while a patient is being strapped to the operating table. The matter is in my hands and is clear and definite in my head. When the time comes to set to work, I shall do it as no one else could. But now I can jest, and the more I jest and the calmer I am, the more tranquil and confident you ought to be, and the more amazed at my genius. Having finished his second glass of punch, Napoleon went to rest before the serious business which he considered awaited him next day. He was so much interested in that task that he was unable to sleep, and in spite of his cold, which had grown worse from the dampness of the evening, he went into the large division of the tent at three o'clock in the morning, loudly blowing his nose. He asked whether the Russians had not withdrawn, and was told that the enemy's fires were still in the same places. He nodded approval. The adjutant in attendance came into the tent. Well, Rapp, do you think we shall do good business today? Napoleon asked him. Without doubt, sire, replied Rapp. Napoleon looked at him. Do you remember, sire, what you did me the honor to say at Smolensk? continued Rapp. The wine is drawn and must be drunk. Napoleon frowned and sat silent for a long time, leaning his head on his hand. This poor army, he suddenly remarked, it has diminished greatly since Smolensk. Fortune is frankly a courtesan rap. I've always said so, and I'm beginning to experience it. But the guards, rap. The guards are intact, he remarked interrogatively. Yes, sire, replied rap. Napoleon took a lozenge, put it in his mouth, and glanced at his watch. He was not sleepy, and it was still not nearly morning. It was impossible to give further orders for the sake of killing time, for the orders had all been given and were now being executed. Have the biscuits and rice been served out to the regiments of the guards? asked Napoleon sternly. Yes, sire. The rice, too? Rapp replied that he had given the emperor's order about the rice, but Napoleon shook his head in dissatisfaction, as if not believing that his order had been executed. An attendant came in with punch. Napoleon ordered another glass to be brought for Rapp, and silently sipped his own. I have neither taste nor smell, he remarked, sniffing at his glass. This cold is tiresome. They talk about medicine. What is the good of medicine when it can't cure a cold? Corbizar gave me these lozenges, but they don't help at all. What can doctors cure? One can't cure anything. Our body is a machine for living. It is organized for that. It is its nature. Let life go on in it unhindered and let it defend itself. It will do more than if you paralyze it by encumbering it with remedies. Our body is like a perfect watch that should go for a certain time. The watchmaker cannot open it. He can only adjust it by fumbling and that blindfold. Yes, our body is a machine for living. That is all. And having entered on the path of definition of which he was fond, Napoleon suddenly and unexpectedly gave a new one. Do you know, Rapp, what military art is? asked he. It is the art of being stronger than the enemy at a given moment. That's all. Rapp made no reply. Tomorrow we shall have to deal with Kutuzov, said Napoleon. We shall see. Do you remember at Braunau he commanded an army for three weeks and did not once mount a horse to inspect his entrenchments? We shall see. Napoleon looked at his watch. It was still only four o'clock. He did not feel sleepy. The punch was finished and there was still nothing to do. He rose, walked to and fro, put on a warm overcoat and a hat, and went out of the tent. The night was dark and damp. A scarcely perceptible moisture was descending from above. 
Nearby, the campfires were dimly burning among the French guards, and in the distance, those of the Russian line shone through the smoke. The weather was calm, and the rustle and tramp of the French troops already beginning to move to take up their positions were clearly audible. Napoleon walked about in front of his tent, looked at the fires, and listened to these sounds. And as he was passing a tall guardsman in a shaggy cap who was standing sentinel before his tent and had drawn himself up like a black pillar at sight of the emperor, Napoleon stopped in front of him. What year did you enter the service? he asked with that affectation of military bluntness and geniality with which he always addressed the soldiers. The man answered the question. Ah, one of the old ones. Has your regiment had its rice? It has your majesty. Napoleon nodded and walked away. At half past five, Napoleon rode to the village of Shivardino. It was growing light. The sky was clearing. Only a single cloud lay in the east. The abandoned campfires were burning themselves out in the faint morning light. On the right, a single deep report of a cannon resounded and died away in the prevailing silence. Some minutes passed. A second and a third report shook the air, then a fourth and a fifth boomed solemnly nearby on the right. The first shots had not yet ceased to reverberate before others rang out, and yet more were heard, mingling with and overtaking one another. Napoleon, with his suite, rode up to the Shevardino Redoubt, where he dismounted. The game had begun. Chapter 30 Pierre views the battlefield from the knoll at Gorky. On returning to Gorky, after having seen Prince Andrew, Pierre ordered his groom to get the horses ready and to call him early in the morning, and then immediately fell asleep behind a partition in a corner Boris had given up to him. Before he was thoroughly awake next morning, everybody had already left the hut. The panes were rattling in the little windows, and his groom was shaking him. Your Excellency! Your Excellency! Your Excellency, he kept repeating pertinaciously while he shook Pierre by the shoulder without looking at him, having apparently lost hope of getting him to wake up. What? Uh, has it begun? Is it time? Pierre asked, waking up. Hear the firing, said the groom, a discharged soldier. All the gentlemen have gone out, and His Serene Highness himself rode past long ago. Pierre dressed hastily and ran out onto the porch. Outside, all was bright, fresh, dewy, and cheerful. The sun, just bursting forth from behind a cloud that had concealed it, was shining, with rays still half broken by the clouds, over the roofs of the street opposite, on the dew-besprinkled dust of the road, on the walls of the houses, on the windows, the fence, and on Pierre's horses standing before the hut. The roar of guns sounded more distinct outside. An adjutant, accompanied by a Cossack, passed by at a sharp trot. It's time, Count, it's time, cried the adjutant. Telling the groom to follow him with the horses, Pierre went down the street to the knoll from which he had looked at the field of battle the day before. A crowd of military men was assembled there. Members of the staff could be heard conversing in French, and Kutuzov's gray head in a white cap with a red band was visible, his gray nape sunk between his shoulders. He was looking through a field glass down the high road before him. Mounting the steps to the knoll, Pierre looked at the scene before him, spellbound by its beauty. It was the same panorama he had admired from that spot the day before, but now the whole place was full of troops and covered by smoke clouds from the guns, and the slanting rays of the bright sun, rising slightly to the left behind Pierre, cast upon it through the clear morning air penetrating streaks of rosy golden-tinted light and long dark shadows. The forest, at the farthest extremity of the panorama, seemed carved in some precious stone of a yellowish-green color. Its undulating outline was silhouetted against the horizon and was pierced beyond Valuyevo by the Smolensk high road, crowded with troops. Nearer at hand glittered golden cornfields interspersed with copses. There were troops to be seen everywhere, in front and to the right and left. All this was vivid, majestic, and unexpected. But what impressed Pierre most of all was the view of the battlefield itself, of Borodino and the hollows on both sides of the Kolochak. Above the Kolochak, 
in Borodino and on both sides of it, especially to the left where the Vaina, flowing between its marshy banks, falls into the Kolocha. A mist had spread which seemed to melt, to dissolve, and to become translucent when the brilliant sun appeared and magically colored and outlined everything. The smoke of the guns mingled with this mist, and over the whole expanse and through that mist the rays of the morning sun were reflected, flashing back like lightning from the water, from the dew, and from the bayonets of the troops crowded together by the river banks and in Borodino. A white church could be seen through the mist, and here and there the roofs of huts in Borodino, as well as dense masses of soldiers or green ammunition chests and ordnance. And all this moved, or seemed to move, as the smoke and mist spread out over the whole space. Just as in the mist-enveloped hollow near Borodino, so along the entire line outside and above it, and especially in the woods and fields to the left, in the valleys and on the summits of the high ground, clouds of powder smoke seemed continually to spring up out of nothing, now singly, now several at a time, some translucent, others dense which, swelling, growing, rolling, and blending, extended over the whole expanse. These puffs of smoke, and, strange to say, the sound of the firing, produced the chief beauty of the spectacle. Puff! Suddenly, a round, compact cloud of smoke was seen merging from violet into gray and milky white, and boom! came the report a second later. Puff! Puff! And two clouds arose, pushing one another and blending together. And boom, boom, came the sounds, confirming what the eye had seen. Pierre glanced round at the first cloud, which he had seen as a round, compact ball, and in its place already were balloons of smoke floating to one side. And puff, with a pause, puff, puff, Three, and then four more appeared, and then from each, with the same interval, boom, 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 came the fine, firm, precise sounds in reply. It seemed as if those smoke clouds sometimes ran and sometimes stood still, while woods, fields, and glittering bayonets ran past them. From the left, over fields and bushes, those large balls of smoke were continually appearing, followed by their solemn reports, while nearer still, in the hollows and woods, there burst from the muskets small cloudlets that had no time to become balls, but had their little echoes in just the same way. Thrack, da, 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 came the frequent crackle of musketry, but it was irregular and feeble in comparison with the reports of the cannon. Pierre wished to be there with that smoke, those shining bayonets, that movement and those sounds. He turned to look at Kutuzov and his suite, to compare his impressions with those of others. They were all looking at the field of battle as he was, and, as it seemed to him, with the same feelings. All their faces were now shining with that latent warmth of feeling Pierre had noticed the day before and had fully understood after his talk with Prince Andrew. Go, my dear fellow, go, and Christ be with you, Kutuzov was saying to a general who stood beside him, not taking his eye from the battlefield. Having received this order, the general passed by Pierre on his way down the knoll. To the crossing, said the general coldly and sternly, in reply to one of the staff who asked where he was going. I'll go there too. I too, thought Pierre, and followed the general. The general mounted a horse a Cossack had brought him. Pierre went to his groom, who was holding his horses, and asking which was the quietest, clambered onto it, seized it by the mane, and turning out his toes, pressed his heels against its sides and, feeling that his spectacles were slipping off, but unable to let go of the mane and reins, he galloped after the general, causing the staff officers to smile as they watched him from the knoll. Chapter 31 Pierre at the Borodino Bridge, under fire, goes to Raevsky's redoubt, his horse wounded under him. The Raevsky redoubt. The young officer. Pierre is accepted at the redoubt as one of the family the flame of hidden fire in the men's souls. Shortage of ammunition. Pierre sees ammunition wagons blown up. Having descended the hill, the general after whom Pierre was galloping turned sharply to the left, and Pierre, losing sight of him, galloped in among some ranks of infantry marching ahead of him. 
He tried to pass either in front of them or to the right or left, but there were soldiers everywhere, all with the same preoccupied expression and busy with some unseen but evidently important task. They all gazed with the same dissatisfied and inquiring expression at this stout man in a white hat who for some unknown reason threatened to trample them under his horse's hoofs. Why ride into the middle of the battalion? One of them shouted at him. Another prodded his horse with the butt end of a musket and Pierre, bending over his saddle bow and hardly able to control his shying horse, galloped ahead of the soldiers where there was a free space. There was a bridge ahead of him where other soldiers stood firing. Pierre rode up to them. Without being aware of it, he had come to the bridge across the Colocha between Gorky and Borodino, which the French, having occupied Borodino, were attacking in the first phase of the battle. Pierre saw that there was a bridge in front of him and that soldiers were doing something on both sides of it and in the meadow among the rows of new-mown hay, which he had taken no notice of amid the smoke of the campfires the day before. But despite the incessant firing going on there, he had no idea that this was the field of battle. He did not notice the sound of the bullets whistling from every side, or the projectiles that flew over him, did not see the enemy on the other side of the river, and for a long time did not notice the killed and wounded, though many fell near him. He looked about him with a smile which did not leave his face. Why is that fellow in front of the line? shouted somebody at him again. To the left! Keep to the right, the men shouted to him. Pierre went to the right and unexpectedly encountered one of Raevsky's adjutants whom he knew. The adjutant looked angrily at him, evidently also intending to shout at him, but on recognizing him he nodded. How have you got here, he said, and galloped on. Pierre, feeling out of place there, having nothing to do, and afraid of getting in someone's way again, galloped after the adjutant. What's happening here? May I come with you? he asked. One moment, one moment, replied the adjutant, and riding up to a stout colonel who was standing in the meadow, he gave him some message and then addressed Pierre. Why have you come here, Count? he asked with a smile. Still inquisitive? Yes, yes, assented Pierre. But the adjutant turned his horse about and rode on. Here it's tolerable, said he, but with Bagration on the left flank they're getting it frightfully hot. Really, said Pierre, where is that? Come along with me to our knoll. We can get a view from there, and in our battery it is still bearable, said the adjutant. Will you come? Yes, I'll come with you, replied Pierre, looking round for his groom. It was only now that he noticed wounded men staggering along or being carried on stretchers. On that very meadow he had ridden over the day before, a soldier was lying athwart the rows of scented hay, with his head thrown awkwardly back and his shako off. Why haven't they carried him away? Pierre was about to ask, but seeing the stern expression of the adjutant, who was also looking that way, he checked himself. Pierre did not find his groom, and rode along the hollow with the adjutant to Raevsky's redoubt. His horse lagged behind the adjutant's and jolted him at every step. You don't seem to be used to riding, Count, remarked the adjutant. No, it's not that, but her action seems so jerky said Pierre in a puzzled tone. Why, she's wounded, said the adjutant, in the off foreleg above the knee. A bullet, no doubt. I congratulate you, Count, on your baptism of fire. Having ridden in the smoke past the Sixth Corps, behind the artillery which had been moved forward and was in action, deafening them with the noise of firing, they came to a small wood. There it was cool and quiet, with a scent of autumn. Pierre and the adjutant dismounted and walked up the hill on foot. "'Is the general here?' asked the adjutant on reaching the knoll. "'He was here a minute ago, but has just gone that way,' someone told him, pointing to the right. The adjutant looked at Pierre as if puzzled what to do with him now. D "'Don't trouble about me,' said Pierre. "'I'll go up onto the knoll, if I may.' "'Yes, do. You'll see everything from there, and it's less dangerous, and I'll come for you.' Pierre went to the battery, and the adjutant rode on. They did not meet again, and only much later did Pierre learn that he lost an arm that day. The knoll to which Pierre ascended was that famous one afterwards known to the Russians as the Knoll Battery, or Raevsky's Redoubt, and to the French as La Grande Redoute, La Fatale Redoute, La Redoute du Centre, around which tens of thousands fell, 
and which the French regarded as the key to the whole position. This redoubt consisted of a knoll on three sides of which trenches had been dug. Within the entrenchment stood ten guns that were being fired through openings in the earthwork. In line with the knoll on both sides stood other guns which also fired incessantly. A little behind the guns stood infantry. When ascending that knoll, Pierre had no notion that this spot on which small trenches had been dug and from which a few guns were firing was the most important point of the battle. On the contrary, just because he happened to be there, he thought it one of the least significant parts of the field. Having reached the knoll, Pierre sat down at one end of a trench surrounding the battery and gazed at what was going on around him with an unconsciously happy smile. Occasionally he rose and walked about the battery, still with that same smile, trying not to obstruct the soldiers who were loading, hauling the guns, and continually running past him with bags and charges. The guns of that battery were being fired continually, one after another, with a deafening roar, enveloping the whole neighborhood in powder smoke. In contrast with the dread felt by the infantrymen placed in support, here in the battery, where a small number of men busy at their work were separated from the rest by a trench, everyone experienced a common and, as it were, family feeling of animation. The intrusion of Pierre's non-military figure in a white hat made an unpleasant impression at first. The soldiers looked askance at him with surprise and even alarm as they went past him. The senior artillery officer, a tall, long-legged, pock-marked man, moved over to Pierre as if to see the action of the farthest gun, and looked at him with curiosity. A young round-faced officer, quite a boy still, and evidently only just out of the cadet college, who was zealously commanding the two guns entrusted to him, addressed Pierre sternly. Sir, he said, permit me to ask you to stand aside. You must not be here. The soldiers shook their heads disapprovingly as they looked at Pierre. But when they had convinced themselves that this man in the white hat was doing no harm, but either sat quietly on the slope of the trench with a shy smile, or politely making way for the soldiers paced up and down the battery under fire as calmly as if he were on a boulevard, their feeling of hostile distrust gradually began to change into a kindly and bantering sympathy, such as soldiers feel for their dogs, cocks, goats, and in general for the animals that live with the regiment. The men soon accepted Pierre into their family, adopted him, gave him a nickname, our gentleman, and made kindly fun of him among themselves. A shell tore up the earth two paces from Pierre, and he looked around with a smile as he brushed from his clothes some earth it had thrown up. "'And how's it you're not afraid, sir, really now?' a red-faced, broad-shouldered soldier asked Pierre with a grin that disclosed a set of sound white teeth. "'Are you afraid, then?' said Pierre. Well, "'What else do you expect?' answered the soldier. "'She has no mercy, you know. "'When she comes spluttering down, out go your innards. <laughs> "'One can't help being afraid,' he said, laughing. Several of the men with bright, kindly faces stopped beside Pierre. They seemed not to have expected him to talk like anybody else, and the discovery that he did so delighted them. It's the business of us soldiers, but in a gentleman it's wonderful. There's a gentleman for you. To your places, cried the young officer to the men gathered round Pierre. The young officer was evidently exercising his duties for the first or second time, and therefore treated both his superiors and the men with great precision and formality. The booming cannonade and the fusillade of musketry were growing more intense over the whole field, especially to the left, where Bagration's fleshes were. But where Pierre was, the smoke of the firing made it almost impossible to distinguish anything. Moreover, his whole attention was engrossed by watching the family circle, separated from all else, formed by the men in the battery. His first unconscious feeling of joyful animation produced by the sights and sounds of the battlefield was now replaced by another, especially since he had seen that soldier lying alone in the hayfield. Now, seated on the slope of the trench, he observed the faces of those around him. By ten o'clock some twenty men had already been carried away from the battery. Two guns were smashed, and cannonballs fell more and more frequently on the battery, and spent bullets buzzed and whistled around. But the men in the battery seemed not to notice this, and merry voices and jokes were heard on all sides. "'A live one!' shouted a man as a whistling shell approached. 
Not this way, to the infantry, added another with loud laughter, seeing the shell fly past and fall into the ranks of the supports. Are you bowing to a friend, eh? remarked another, chaffing a peasant who ducked low as a cannonball flew over. Several soldiers gathered by the wall of the trench, looking out to see what was happening in front. They've withdrawn the front line. It has retired, said they, pointing over the earthwork. Mind your own business, an old sergeant shouted at them. If they've retired, it's because there's work for them to do farther back. And the sergeant, taking one of the men by the shoulders, gave him a shove with his knee. This was followed by a burst of laughter. To the fifth gun, wheel it up, came shouts from one side. Now then, all together, like bargees, rose the merry voices of those who were moving the gun. Oh, she nearly knocked our gentleman's hat off, cried the red-faced humorist, showing his teeth and chaffing Pierre. Awkward baggage, he added reproachfully to a cannonball that struck a cannon wheel in a man's leg. Now then, you foxes, said another, laughing at some militiamen who, stooping low, entered the battery to carry away the wounded man. So this gruel isn't to your taste. Oh, you crows! You're scared! They shouted at the militiamen who stood hesitating before the man whose leg had been torn off. There, lads, ooh, ooh, they mimicked the peasants. They don't like it at all. Pierre noticed that after every ball that hit the redoubt and after every loss, the liveliness increased more and more. As the flames of the fire hidden within come more and more vividly and rapidly from an approaching thundercloud, so, as if in opposition to what was taking place, the lightning of hidden fire growing more and more intense glowed in the faces of these men. Pierre did not look out at the battlefield and was not concerned to know what was happening there. He was entirely absorbed in watching this fire which burned ever more brightly and which he felt was flaming up in the same way in his own soul. At ten o'clock, the infantry that had been among the bushes in front of the battery and along the Kamienka streamlet retreated. From the battery, they could be seen running back past it, carrying their wounded on their muskets. A general with his suite came to the battery, and after speaking to the colonel, gave Pierre an angry look and went away again, having ordered the infantry supports behind the battery to lie down, so as to be less exposed to fire. After this, from amid the ranks of infantry to the right of the battery, came the sound of a drum and shouts of command, and from the battery one saw how those ranks of infantry moved forward. Pierre looked over the wall of the trench and was particularly struck by a pale young officer who, letting his sword hang down, was walking backwards and kept glancing uneasily around. The ranks of the infantry disappeared amid the smoke but their long-drawn shout and rapid musketry firing could still be heard. A few minutes later, crowds of wounded men and stretcher-bearers came back from that direction. Projectiles began to fall still more frequently in the battery. Several men were lying about who had not been removed. Around the cannon, the men moved still more briskly and busily. No one any longer took notice of Pierre. Once or twice he was shouted at for being in the way. The senior officer moved with big rapid strides from one gun to another with a frowning face. The young officer, with his face still more flushed, commanded the men more scrupulously than ever. The soldiers handed up the charges, turned, loaded, and did their business with strained smartness. They gave little jumps as they walked, as though they were on springs. The storm cloud had come upon them, and in every face the fire which Pierre had watched kindle burned up brightly. Pierre was standing beside the commanding officer. The young officer, his hand to his shako, ran up to his superior. I have the honor to report, sir, that only eight rounds are left. Are we to continue firing? he asked. Grape shot, the senior shouted, without answering the question, looking over the wall of the trench. Suddenly something happened. The young officer gave a gasp, and bending double, sat down on the ground like a bird shot on the wing. Everything became strange, confused, and misty in Pierre's eyes. One cannonball after another whistled by and struck the earthwork, a soldier or a gun. Pierre, who had not noticed these sounds before, now heard nothing else. On the right of the battery, soldiers shouting hurrah were running not forwards but backwards, it seemed to Pierre. A cannonball struck the very end of the earthwork by which he was standing, crumbling down the earth. 
A black ball flashed before his eyes and at the same instant plumped into something. Some militiamen who were entering the battery ran back. All with grape shot, shouted the officer. The sergeant ran up to the officer and in a frightened whisper informed him, as a butler at dinner informs his master that there is no more of some wine asked for, that there were no more charges. The scoundrels, what are they doing? shouted the officer, turning to Pierre. The officer's face was red and perspiring, and his eyes glittered under his frowning brow. Run to the reserves and bring up the ammunition boxes, he yelled, angrily avoiding Pierre with his eyes and speaking to his men. I'll go, said Pierre. The officer, without answering him, strode across to the opposite side. Don't fire! Wait! he shouted. The man who had been ordered to go for ammunition stumbled against Pierre. Hey, sir, this is no place for you, said he, and ran down the slope. Pierre ran after him, avoiding the spot where the young officer was sitting. One cannon ball, another and a third flew over him, falling in front, beside and behind him. Pierre ran down the slope. Where am I going? he suddenly asked himself, when he was already near the green ammunition wagons. He halted irresolutely, not knowing whether to return or go on. Suddenly a terrible concussion threw him backwards to the ground. At the same instant he was dazzled by a great flash of flame, and immediately a deafening roar, crackling and whistling made his ears tingle. When he came to himself, he was sitting on the ground, leaning on his hands. The ammunition wagons he had been approaching no longer existed. Only charred green boards and rags littered the scorched grass, and a horse, dangling fragments of its shaft behind it, galloped past, while another horse lay like Pierre on the ground, uttering prolonged and piercing cries. Chapter 32 The Redoubt Captured by the French Pierre's Conflict with the French Officer The Redoubt Retaken by the Russians Beside himself with terror, Pierre jumped up and ran back to the battery as to the only refuge from the horrors that surrounded him. On entering the earthwork, he noticed that there were men doing something there, but that no shots were being fired from the battery. He had no time to realize who these men were. He saw the senior officer lying on the earth wall with his back turned as if he were examining something down below, and that one of the soldiers he had noticed before was struggling forward, shouting, Brothers! and trying to free himself from some men who were holding him by the arm. He also saw something else that was strange. But he had not time to realize that the colonel had been killed, that the soldier shouting, Brothers! was a prisoner, and that another man had been bayoneted in the back before his eyes, for hardly had he run into the redoubt before a thin, sallow-faced, perspiring man in a blue uniform rushed on him, sword in hand, shouting something. Instinctively guarding against the shock, for they had been running together at full speed before they saw one another, Pierre put out his hands and seized the man, a Fre French officer, by the shoulder with one hand and by the throat with the other. The officer, dropping his sword, seized Pierre by his collar. For some seconds they gazed with frightened eyes at one another's unfamiliar faces, and both were perplexed at what they had done and what they were to do next. Am I taken prisoner, or have I taken him prisoner? each was thinking. But the French officer was evidently more inclined to think he had been taken prisoner, because Pierre's strong hand, impelled by instinctive fear, squeezed his throat ever tighter and tighter. The Frenchman was about to say something, when just above their heads, terrible and low, a cannonball whistled, and it seemed to Pierre that the French officer's head had been torn off, so swiftly had he ducked it. Pierre, too, bent his head and let his hands fall. Without further thought as to who had taken whom prisoner, the Frenchman ran back to the battery, and Pierre ran down the slope, stumbling over the dead and wounded who had seemed to him caught at his feet. But before he reached the foot of the knoll, he was met by a dense crowd of Russian soldiers who, stumbling, tripping up and shouting, ran merrily and wildly toward the battery. This was the attack for which Yermolov claimed the credit, declaring that only his courage and good luck made such a feat possible. It was the attack in which he was said to have thrown some St. George's crosses he had in his pocket into the battery for the first soldiers to take who got there. The French who had occupied the battery fled, 
and our troop, shouting hurrah, pursued them so far beyond the battery that it was difficult to call them back. The prisoners were brought down from the battery, and among them was a wounded French general whom the officers surrounded. Crowds of wounded, some known to Pierre and some unknown, Russians and French, with faces distorted by suffering, walked, crawled, and were carried on stretchers from the battery. Pierre again went up onto the knoll where he had spent over an hour, and of that family circle which had received him as a member, he did not find a single one. There were many dead whom he did not know, but some he recognized. The young officer still sat in the same way, bent double in a pool of blood at the edge of the earth wall. The red-faced man was still twitching, but they did not carry him away. Pierre ran down the slope once more. Now they will stop it. Now they will be horrified at what they have done, he thought aimlessly going toward a crowd of stretcher-bearers moving from the battlefield. But behind the veil of smoke the sun was still high, and in front, and especially to the left, near Semyonovsk, something seemed to be seething in the smoke, and the roar of cannon and musketry did not diminish, but even increased to desperation, like a man who, straining himself, shrieks with all his remaining strength. Chapter 33. The Course of the Battle. Difficulty of discerning what was going on. Things take their own course apart from the orders issued. The chief action of the Battle of Borodino was fought within the 7,000 feet between Borodino and Bagration's fleshes. Beyond that space, there was on the one side a demonstration made by the Russians with Uvarov's cavalry at midday, and on the other side, beyond Utitsa, Ponyatovsky's collision with Tuchkov. But these two were detached and feeble actions in comparison with what took place in the center of the battlefield. On the field between Borodino and the Fleches, beside the wood, the chief action of the day took place on an open space visible from both sides and was fought in the simplest and most artless way. The battle began on both sides with a cannonade from several hundred guns. Then, when the whole field was covered with smoke, two divisions, Campons and Dessais, advanced from the French right, while Murat's troops advanced on Borodino from their left. From the Chevardino Redoubt, where Napoleon was standing, the fleches were two-thirds of a mile away, and it was more than a mile as the crow flies to Borodino, so that Napoleon could not see what was happening there, especially as the smoke mingling with the mist hid the whole locality. The soldiers of Dessay's division, advancing against the fleshes, could only be seen till they had entered the hollow that lay between them and the fleshes. As soon as they had descended into that hollow, the smoke of the guns and musketry on the fleshes grew so dense that it covered the whole approach on that side of it. Through the smoke, glimpses could be caught of something black, probably men, and at times the glint of bayonets. But whether they were moving or stationary, whether they were French or Russian, could not be discovered from the Chevardino Redoubt. The sun had risen brightly, and its slanting rays struck straight into Napoleon's face, as, shading his eyes with his hand, he looked at the fleshes. The smoke spread out before them, and at times it looked as if the smoke were moving, at times as if the troops moved. Sometimes shouts were heard through the firing, but it was impossible to tell what was being done there. Napoleon, standing on the knoll, looked through a field glass, and in its small circlet saw smoke and men, sometimes his own and sometimes Russians, but when he looked again with the naked eye, he could not tell where what he had seen was. He descended the knoll and began walking up and down before it. Occasionally he stopped, listened to the firing, and gazed intently at the battlefield. But not only was it impossible to make out what was happening from where he was standing down below or from the knoll above on which some of his generals had taken their stand, but even from the fleshes themselves, in which by this time there were now Russian and now French soldiers, alternately or together, dead, wounded, alive, frightened or maddened, even at those fleshes themselves it was impossible to make out what was taking place. 
There, for several hours, amid incessant cannon and musketry fire, now Russians were seen alone, now Frenchmen alone, now infantry and now cavalry. They appeared, fired, fell, collided, not knowing what to do with one another, screamed and ran back again. From the battlefield, adjutants he had sent out and orderlies from his marshals kept galloping up to Napoleon with reports of the progress of the action. But all these reports were false, both because it was impossible in the heat of battle to say what was happening at any given moment, and because many of the adjutants did not go to the actual place of conflict, but reported what they had heard from others. And also, because while an adjutant was riding more than a mile to Napoleon, circumstances changed and the news he brought was already becoming false. Thus, an adjutant galloped up from Murat with tidings that Borodino had been occupied and the bridge over the Kolocha was in the hands of the French. The adjutant asked whether Napoleon wished the troops to cross it. Napoleon gave orders that the troops should form up on the farther side and wait. But before that order was given, almost as soon, in fact, as the adjutant had left Borodino, the bridge had been retaken by the Russians and burned in the very skirmish at which Pierre had been present at the beginning of the battle. An adjutant galloped up from the fleshes with a pale and frightened face and reported to Napoleon that their attack had been repulsed, Campon wounded and Davout killed. Yet at the very time the adjutant had been told that the French had been repulsed, the fleshes had in fact been recaptured by other French troops, and Davout was alive and only slightly bruised. On the basis of these necessarily untrustworthy reports, Napoleon gave his orders, which had either been executed before he gave them, or could not be and were not executed. The marshals and generals, who were nearer to the field of battle, but like Napoleon did not take part in the actual fighting and only occasionally went within musket range, made their own arrangements without asking Napoleon, and issued orders where and in what direction to fire and where cavalry should gallop and infantry should run. But even their orders, like Napoleon's, were seldom carried out, and then but partially. For the most part, things happened contrary to their orders. Soldiers ordered to advance ran back on meeting grapeshot. Soldiers ordered to remain where they were, suddenly seeing Russians unexpectedly before them, sometimes rushed back and sometimes forward and the cavalry dashed without orders in pursuit of the flying Russians. In this way, two cavalry regiments galloped through the Semyonovsk hollow, and as soon as they reached the top of the incline, turned round and galloped full speed back again. The infantry moved in the same way, sometimes running to quite other places than those they were ordered to go to. All orders as to where and when to move the guns when to send infantry to shoot or horsemen to ride down the Russian infantry, all such orders were given by the officers on the spot nearest to the units concerned without asking either Ney, Davout or Murat, much less Napoleon. They did not fear getting into trouble for not fulfilling orders or for acting on their own initiative, for in battle what is at stake is what is dearest to man, his own life, and it sometimes seems that safety lies in running back, sometimes in running forward. And these men who were right in the heat of the battle acted according to the mood of the moment. In reality, however, all these movements forward and backward did not improve or alter the position of the troops. All their rushing and galloping at one another did little harm. The harm of disablement and death was caused by the balls and bullets that flew over the fields on which these men were floundering about. As soon as they left the place where the balls and bullets were flying about, their superiors, located in the background, reformed them and brought them under discipline, and under the influence of that discipline led them back to the zone of fire, where under the influence of fear of death they lost their discipline and rushed about according to the chance promptings of the throng. Chapter 34 Reinforcements Belliard appeals to Napoleon De Bosset proposes breakfast Friant's division sent in support. The expected success not secured. Continuous and useless slaughter. Napoleon's generals, Davout, Ney, and Murat, who were near that region of fire and sometimes even entered it, repeatedly led into it huge masses of well-ordered troops. 
But contrary to what had always happened in their former battles, instead of the news they expected of the enemy's flight, these orderly masses returned thence as disorganized and terrified mobs. The generals reformed them, but their numbers constantly decreased. In the middle of the day, Murat sent his adjutant to Napoleon to demand reinforcements. Napoleon sat at the foot of the knoll drinking punch when Murat's adjutant galloped up with an assurance that the Russians would be routed if His Majesty would let him have another division. Reinforcements? said Napoleon in a tone of stern surprise, looking at the adjutant, a handsome lad with long black curls arranged like Murat's own, as though he did not understand his words. Reinforcements, thought Napoleon to himself. How can they need reinforcements when they already have half the army directed against a weak, unentrenched Russian wing? Tell the king of Naples, said he sternly, that it is not noon yet, and I don't yet see my chessboard clearly. Go. The handsome boy adjutant with the long hair sighed deeply without removing his hand from his hat and galloped back to where men were being slaughtered. Napoleon rose and, having summoned Colancourt and Berthier, began talking to them about matters unconnected with the battle. In the midst of this conversation, which was beginning to interest Napoleon, Berthier's eyes turned to look at a general with a suite who was galloping toward the knoll on a lathering horse. It was Belliard. Having dismounted, he went up to the Emperor with rapid strides, and in a loud voice began boldly demonstrating the necessity of sending reinforcements. He swore on his honour that the Russians were lost if the Emperor would give another division. Napoleon shrugged his shoulders and continued to pace up and down without replying. Belliard began talking loudly and eagerly to the generals of the suite around him. "'You are very fiery, Belliard,' said Napoleon, when he again came up to the general. In the heat of a battle it is easy to make a mistake. Go and have another look, and then come back to me. Before Belliard was out of sight, a messenger from another part of the battlefield galloped up. Now then, what do you want? asked Napoleon, in the tone of a man irritated at being continually disturbed. Sire, the prince, began the adjutant, asks for reinforcements, said Napoleon with an angry gesture. The adjutant bent his head affirmatively and began to report. But the Emperor turned from him, took a couple of steps, stopped, came back, and called Berthier. "'We must give reserves,' he said, moving his arms slightly apart. "'Who do you think should be sent there?' he asked of Berthier, whom he subsequently termed, "'That gosling I have made an eagle.' "'Send Claparède's division, sire,' replied Berthier, who knew all the divisions, regiments, and battalions by heart. Napoleon nodded assent. The adjutant galloped to Claparède's division, and a few minutes later the young guard, stationed behind the knoll, moved forward. Napoleon gazed silently in that direction. No, he suddenly said to Berthier, I can't send Claparède. Send uh, Friant's division. Though there was no advantage in sending Friant's division instead of Claparède's, and even an obvious inconvenience and delay in stopping Claparède and sending Friant now, the order was carried out exactly. Napoleon did not notice that, in regard to his army, he was playing the part of a doctor who hinders by his medicines, a role he so justly understood and condemned. Friant's division disappeared, as the others had done, into the smoke of the battlefield. From all sides, adjutants continued to arrive at a gallop, and, as if by agreement, all said the same thing. They all asked for reinforcements, and all said that the Russians were holding their positions and maintaining a hellish fire under which the French army was melting away. Napoleon sat on a camp-stool, wrapped in thought. Monsieur de Bosset, the man so fond of travel, having fasted since morning, came up to the Emperor and ventured respectfully to suggest lunch to His Majesty. "'I hope I may now congratulate Your Majesty on a victory,' said he. Napoleon silently shook his head in negation. Assuming the negation to refer only to the victory and not to the lunch, M. de Bosset ventured with respectful jocularity to remark that there is no reason for not having lunch when one can get it. "'Go away!' exclaimed Napoleon suddenly and morosely, and turned aside. A beatific smile of regret, repentance, and ecstasy beamed on M. de Bosset's face, and he glided away to the other generals. 
Napoleon was experiencing a feeling of depression, like that of an ever-lucky gambler who, after recklessly flinging money about and always winning, suddenly, just when he has calculated all the chances of the game, finds that the more he considers his play, the more surely he loses. His troops were the same, his generals the same. The same preparations had been made, the same dispositions, and the same proclamation, courte et énergique. He himself was still the same. He knew that, and he knew that he was now even more experienced and skillful than before. Even the enemy was the same as at Austerlitz and Friedland, yet the terrible stroke of his arm had supernaturally become impotent. All the old methods that had been unfailingly crowned with success, the concentration of batteries on one point, an attack by reserves to break the enemy's line, and a cavalry attack by the men of iron, all these methods had already been employed. Yet not only was there no victory, but from all sides came the same news of generals killed and wounded, of reinforcements needed, of the impossibility of driving back the Russians, and of disorganization among his own troops. Formerly, after he had given two or three orders and uttered a few phrases, marshals and adjutants had come galloping up with congratulations and happy faces, announcing the trophies taken, the corps of prisoners, bundles of enemy eagles and standards, cannon and stores, and Murat had only begged leave to loose the cavalry to gather in the baggage wagons. So it had been at Lodi, Marengo, Arcola, Jena, Austerlitz, Wagram, and so on. But now something strange was happening to his troops. Despite news of the capture of the fleshes, Napoleon saw that this was not the same, not at all the same, as what had happened in his former battles. He saw that what he was feeling was felt by all the men about him experienced in the art of war. All their faces looked dejected, and they all shunned one another's eyes. Only a de Bosset could fail to grasp the meaning of what was happening. But Napoleon, with his long experience of war, well knew the meaning of a battle not gained by the attacking side in eight hours after all efforts had been expended. He knew that it was a lost battle, and that the least accident might now, with the fight balanced on such a strained center, destroy him and his army. When he ran his mind over the whole of this strange Russian campaign, in which not one battle had been won, and in which not a flag or cannon or army corps had been captured in two months, when he looked at the concealed depression on the faces around him, and heard reports of the Russians still holding their ground, a terrible feeling like a nightmare took possession of him, and all the unlucky accidents that might destroy him occurred to his mind. The Russians might fall on his left wing might break through his center. He himself might be killed by a stray cannonball. All this was possible. In former battles, he had only considered the possibilities of success. But now, innumerable unlucky chances presented themselves, and he expected them all. Yes, it was like a dream in which a man fancies that a ruffian is coming to attack him, and raises his arm to strike that ruffian a terrible blow which he knows should annihilate him, but then feels that his arm drops powerless and limp like a rag, and the horror of unavoidable destruction seizes him in his helplessness. The news that the Russians were attacking the left flank of the French army aroused that horror in Napoleon. He sat silently on a camp stool below the knoll, with head bowed and elbows on his knees. Berthier approached and suggested that they should ride along the line to ascertain the position of affairs. What? What do you say? asked Napoleon. Yes, tell them to bring me my horse. He mounted and rode toward Semyonovsk. Amid the powder smoke, slowly dispersing over the whole space through which Napoleon rode, horses and men were lying in pools of blood, singly or in heaps. Neither Napoleon nor any of his generals had ever before seen such horrors or so many slain in such a small area. The roar of guns that had not ceased for ten hours wearied the ear and gave a peculiar significance to the spectacle, as music does to tableau vivant. Napoleon rode up the high ground at Semyonovsk, and through the smoke saw ranks of men in uniforms of a color unfamiliar to him. 
They were Russians. The Russians stood in serried ranks behind Semyonovsk village and its knoll, and their guns boomed incessantly along their line and sent forth clouds of smoke. It was no longer a battle. It was a continuous slaughter which could be of no avail either to the French or the Russians. Napoleon stopped his horse and again fell into the reverie from which Berthier had roused him. He could not stop what was going on before him and around him and was supposed to be directed by him and to depend on him. And from its lack of success, this affair for the first time seemed to him unnecessary and horrible. One of the generals rode up to Napoleon and ventured to offer to lead the old guard into action. Ney and Berthier, standing near Napoleon, exchanged looks and smiled contemptuously at this general's senseless offer. Napoleon bowed his head and remained silent a long time. At eight hundred leagues from France, I will not have my guard destroyed, he said, and turning his horse, rode back to Shevardino. Chapter 35. Kutuzov. His rebuke to Volzogen. An order of the day for an attack tomorrow. The spirit of the army. On the rug-covered bench where Pierre had seen him in the morning sat Kutuzov, his grey head hanging, his heavy body relaxed. He gave no orders, but only assented to or dissented from what others suggested. Yes, yes, do that, he replied to various proposals. Yes, yes. Go, dear boy, and have a look, he would say to one or another of those about him. Or, no, don't. We'd better wait. He listened to the reports that were brought him and gave directions when his subordinates demanded that of him. But when listening to the reports, it seemed as if he were not interested in the import of the words spoken, but rather in something else, in the expression of face and tone of voice of those who were reporting. By long years of military experience, he knew, and with the wisdom of age understood, that it is impossible for one man to direct hundreds of thousands of others struggling with death. And he knew that the result of a battle is decided not by the orders of a commander-in-chief, nor the place where the troops are stationed, nor by the number of cannon or of slaughtered men, but by that intangible force called the spirit of the army and he watched this force and guided it in as far as that was in his power. Kutuzov's general expression was one of concentrated, quiet attention, and his face wore a strained look, as if he found it difficult to master the fatigue of his old and feeble body. At eleven o'clock they brought him news that the flèches captured by the French had been retaken, but that Prince Bagration was wounded. Kutuzov groaned and swayed his head. Ride over to Prince Peter Ivanovich, Bagration, and find out about it exactly, he said to one of his adjutants, and then turned to the Duke of Württemberg, who was standing behind him. Will your highness please take command of the First Army? Soon after the Duke's departure, before he could possibly have reached Semyonovsk, his adjutant came back from him and told Kutuzov that the Duke asked for more troops. Kutuzov made a grimace, and sent an order to Dokhturov to take over the command of the First Army, and a request to the Duke, whom he said he could not spare at such an important moment, to return to him. When they brought him news that Murat had been taken prisoner and the staff officers congratulated him, Kutuzov smiled. "'Wait a little, gentlemen,' said he. "'The battle is won, and there is nothing extraordinary in the capture of Murat. Still, it is better to wait before we rejoice.' but he sent an adjutant to take the news round the army. When Scherbinin came galloping from the left flank with news that the French had captured the flèches in the village of Semyonovsk, Kutuzov, guessing by the sounds of the battle and by Scherbinin's looks that the news was bad, rose as if to stretch his legs, and taking Scherbinin's arm, led him aside. "'Go, my dear fellow,' he said to Yermolov, "'and see whether something can't be done.' Kutuzov was in Gorky, near the center of the Russian position. The attack directed by Napoleon against our left flank had been several times repulsed. In the center, the French had not got beyond Borodino, and on their left flank, Uvarov's cavalry had put the French to flight. 
Toward three o'clock the French attack ceased. On the faces of all who came from the field of battle and of those who stood around him, Kutuzov noticed an expression of extreme tension. He was satisfied with the day's success, a success exceeding his expectations. But the old man's strength was failing him. Several times his head dropped low as if it were falling, and he dozed off. Dinner was brought to him. Adjutant General Volzogen, the man who, when riding past Prince Andrew, had said the war should be extended widely, and whom Bagration so detested, rode up while Kutuzov was at dinner. Volzogen had come from Barclay de Torly to report on the progress of affairs on the left flank. The sagacious Barclay de Torly, seeing crowds of wounded men running back and the disordered rear of the army, weighed all the circumstances, concluded that the battle was lost, and sent his favorite officer to the commander-in-chief with that news. Kutuzov was chewing a piece of roast chicken with difficulty and glanced at Volzogen with eyes that brightened under their puckering lids. Volzogen, nonchalantly stretching his legs, approached Kutuzov with a half-contemptuous smile on his lips, scarcely touching the peak of his cap. He treated His Serene Highness with a somewhat affected nonchalance intended to show that, as a highly trained military man, he left it to Russians to make an idol of this useless old man but that he knew whom he was dealing with. Der alte Herr, the old man, as in their own set the Germans called Kutuzov, is making himself very comfortable, thought Volzogen. And looking severely at the dishes in front of Kutuzov, he began to report to the old gentleman the position of affairs on the left flank, as Barclay had ordered him to, and as he himself had seen and understood it. All the points of our position are in the enemy's hands, and we cannot dislodge them for lack of troops. The men are running away, and it is impossible to stop them, he reported. Kutuzov ceased chewing and fixed an astonished gaze on Volzogen, as if not understanding what was said to him. Volzogen, noticing the old gentleman's agitation, said with a smile, I have not considered it right to conceal from your Serene Highness what I have seen. The troops are in complete disorder, "'You have seen? You have seen?' Kutuzov shouted, frowning, and rising quickly he went up to Volzogen. How, "'How dare you?' he shouted, choking and making a threatening gesture with his trembling arms. "'How dare you, sir, say that to me? You know nothing about it. Tell General Barclay from me that his information is incorrect, and that the real course of the battle is better known to me, the commander-in-chief, than to him.' Volzogen was about to make a rejoinder, but Kutuzov interrupted him. The enemy has been repulsed on the left and defeated on the right flank. If you have seen a miss, sir, do not allow yourself to say what you don't know. Be so good as to ride to General Barclay and inform him of my firm intention to attack the enemy tomorrow, said Kutuzov sternly. All was silent, and the only sound audible was the heavy breathing of the panting old general. They are repulsed everywhere for which I thank God and our brave army. The enemy is beaten, and tomorrow we shall drive him from the sacred soil of Russia, said Kutuzov, crossing himself. And he suddenly sobbed as his eyes filled with tears. Volzogen, shrugging his shoulders and curling his lips, stepped silently aside, marveling at the old gentleman's conceited stupidity. Ah, here he is, my hero! said Kutuzov to a portly, handsome, dark-haired general who was just ascending the knoll. This was Raevsky, who had spent the whole day at the most important part of the field of Borodino. Raevsky reported that the troops were firmly holding their ground and that the French no longer ventured to attack. After hearing him, Kutuzov said in French, Then you do not think, like some others, that we must retreat? On the contrary, Your Highness, in indecisive actions it is always the most stubborn who remain victors, replied Raevsky. And in my opinion, Kaisarov, Kutuzov called to his adjutant, sit down and write out the order of the day for tomorrow. And you, he continued addressing another, ride along the line and announce that tomorrow we attack. While Kutuzov was talking to Raevsky and dictating the order of the day, Volzogen returned from Barclay and said that General Barclay wished to have written confirmation of the order the field marshal had given. Kutuzov, without looking at Volzogen, gave directions for the order to be written out, which the former commander-in-chief, to avoid personal responsibility, very judiciously wished to receive. 
and by means of that mysterious, indefinable bond which maintains throughout an army one and the same temper known as the spirit of the army, and which constitutes the chief sinew of war, Kutuzov's words, his order for a battle next day, immediately became known from one end of the army to the other. It was far from being the same words or the same order that reached the farthest links of that chain. The tales passing from mouth to mouth at different ends of the army did not even resemble what Kutuzov had said, but the sense of his words spread everywhere, because what he said was not the outcome of cunning calculations, but of a feeling that lay in the commander-in-chief's soul as in that of every Russian. And on learning that tomorrow they were to attack the enemy, and hearing from the highest quarters a confirmation of what they wanted to believe, the exhausted, wavering men felt comforted and inspirited. Chapter 36 Prince Andrew with the reserve under fire, hit by a bursting shell outside the dressing station. Prince Andrew's regiment was among the reserves which till after one o'clock were stationed inactive behind Semyonovsk under heavy artillery fire. Toward two o'clock, the regiment, having already lost more than two hundred men, was moved forward into a trampled oat field in the gap between Semyonovsk and the Knoll Battery, where thousands of men perished that day, and on which an intense concentrated fire from several hundred enemy guns was directed between one and two o'clock. Without moving from that spot or firing a single shot, the regiment here lost another third of its men. From in front, and especially from the right, in the unlifting smoke, the guns boomed, and out of the mysterious domain of smoke that overlay the whole space in front, quick hissing cannonballs and slow whistling shells flew unceasingly. At times, as if to allow them a respite, a quarter of an hour passed during which the cannonballs and shells all flew overhead, but sometimes several men were torn from the regiment in a minute, and the slain were continually being dragged away and the wounded carried off. With each fresh blow, less and less chance of life remained for those not yet killed. The regiment stood in columns of battalion, three hundred paces apart, but nevertheless the men were always in one and the same mood. All alike were taciturn and morose. Talk was rarely heard in the ranks, and it ceased altogether every time the thud of a successful shot and the cry of stretchers was heard. Most of the time, by their officer's order, the men sat on the ground. One, having taken off his shako, carefully loosened the gathers of its lining and drew them tight again. Another, rubbing some dry clay between his palms, polished his bayonet. Another fingered the strap and pulled the buckle of his bandolier, while another smoothed and refolded his leg bands and put his boots on again. Some built little houses of the tufts in the ploughed ground or plaited baskets from the straw in the cornfield. All seemed fully absorbed in these pursuits. When men were killed or wounded, when rows of stretchers went past, when some troops retreated, and when great masses of the enemy came into view through the smoke, no one paid any attention to these things. But when our artillery or cavalry advanced, or some of our infantry were seen to move forward, words of approval were heard on all sides. But the liveliest attention was attracted by occurrences quite apart from and unconnected with the battle. It was as if the minds of these morally exhausted men found relief in everyday commonplace occurrences. A battery of artillery was passing in front of the regiment. The horse of an ammunition cart put its leg over a trace. Hey, look at the trace horse. Get her leg out. She'll fall. Ah, they don't see it, came identical shouts from the ranks all along the regiment. Another time, general attention was attracted by a small brown dog, coming heaven knows whence, which trotted in a preoccupied manner in front of the ranks, with tail stiffly erect, till suddenly a shell fell close by, when it yelped, tucked its tail between its legs, and darted aside. Yells and shrieks of laughter rose from the whole regiment. But such distractions lasted only a moment, and for eight hours the men had been inactive, without food, in constant fear of death, and their pale and gloomy faces grew ever paler and gloomier. Prince Andrew, pale and gloomy like everyone in the regiment, paced up and down from the border of one patch to another at the edge of the meadow beside an oat field, 
with head bowed and arms behind his back. There was nothing for him to do and no orders to be given. Everything went on of itself. The killed were dragged from the front, the wounded carried away, and the ranks closed up. If any soldiers ran to the rear, they returned immediately and hastily. At first, Prince Andrew, considering it his duty to rouse the courage of the men and to set them an example, walked about among the ranks. But he soon became convinced that this was unnecessary and that there was nothing he could teach them. All the powers of his soul, as of every soldier there, were unconsciously bent on avoiding the contemplation of the horrors of their situation. He walked along the meadow, dragging his feet, rustling the grass, and gazing at the dust that covered his boots. Now he took big strides, trying to keep to the footprints left on the meadow by the mowers. Then he counted his steps, calculating how often he must walk from one strip to another to walk a mile. Then he stripped the flowers from the wormwood that grew along a boundary rut, rubbed them in his palms, and smelled their pungent, sweetly bitter scent. Nothing remained of the previous day's thoughts. He thought of nothing. He listened with weary ears to the ever-recurring sounds, distinguishing the whistle of flying projectiles from the booming of the reports, glanced at the tiresomely familiar faces of the men of the 1st Battalion, and waited. Here it comes. This one is coming our way again, he thought, listening to an approaching whistle in the hidden region of smoke. One. Another. Again. It has hit. He stopped and looked at the ranks. No, it has gone over. But this one has hit. And again he started trying to reach the boundary strip in sixteen paces. A whiz and a thud. Five paces from him, a cannonball tore up the dry earth and disappeared. A chill ran down his back. Again he glanced at the ranks. Probably many had been hit. A large crowd had gathered near the 2nd Battalion. Adjutant, he shouted, order them not to crowd together. The adjutant, having obeyed this instruction, approached Prince Andrew. From the other side, a battalion commander rode up. Look out! came a frightened cry from a soldier, and like a bird whirring in rapid flight and alighting on the ground, a shell dropped with little noise within two steps of Prince Andrew and close to the battalion commander's horse. The horse first, regardless of whether it was right or wrong to show fear, snorted, reared, almost throwing the major, and galloped aside. The horse's terror infected the men. Lie down! cried the adjutant, throwing himself flat on the ground. Prince Andrew hesitated. The smoking shell spun like a top between him and the prostrate adjutant near a wormwood plant between the field and the meadow. Can this be death? thought Prince Andrew, looking with a quite new, envious glance at the grass, the wormwood, and the streamlet of smoke that curled up from the rotating black ball. I cannot, I do not wish to die. I love life. I love this grass, this earth, this air. He thought this, and at the same time remembered that people were looking at him. "'It's shameful, sir,' he said to the adjutant. "'What?' He did not finish speaking. At one and the same moment came the sound of an explosion, a whistle of splinters as from a breaking window frame, a suffocating smell of powder, and Prince Andrew started to one side, raising his arm, and fell on his chest. Several officers ran up to him. From the right side of his abdomen, blood was welling out, making a large stain on the grass. The militiamen with stretchers, who were called up, stood behind the officers. Prince Andrew lay on his chest with his face in the grass, breathing heavily and noisily. "'What are you waiting for? Come along!' The peasants went up and took him by his shoulders and legs, but he moaned piteously, and, exchanging looks, they set him down again. "'Pick him up, lift him, it's all the same!' cried someone. They again took him by the shoulders and laid him on the stretcher. "'Oh, my God! Oh, God! What is it? The stomach? That means death! My God!' Voices among the officers were heard saying. "'It flew a hair's breadth past my ear,' said the adjutant. The peasants, adjusting the stretcher to their shoulders, started hurriedly along the path they had trodden down to the dressing station. "'Keep in step! Ah, those peasants!' 
shouted an officer, seizing by their shoulders and checking the peasants, who were walking unevenly and jolting the stretcher. Get into step, Fyodor. I say Fyodor, said the foremost peasant. Ah, oh, that's right, said the one behind joyfully when he had gotten into step. Your Excellency, a prince, said the trembling voice of Timochin, who had run up and was looking down on the stretcher. Prince Andrew opened his eyes and looked up at the speaker from the stretcher into which his head had sunk deep, and again his eyelids drooped. The militiamen carried Prince Andrew to the dressing station by the wood where wagons were stationed. The dressing station consisted of three tents with flaps turned back, pitched at the edge of a birch wood. In the wood, wagons and horses were standing. The horses were eating oats from their movable troughs, and sparrows flew down and pecked the grains that fell. Some crows, scenting blood, flew among the birch trees, cawing impatiently. Around the tents, over more than five acres, blood-stained men in various garbs stood, sat, or lay. Around the wounded stood crowds of soldier stretcher-bearers with dismal and attentive faces, whom the officers, keeping order, tried in vain to drive from the spot. Disregarding the officers' orders, the soldiers stood leaning against their stretchers and gazing intently, as if trying to comprehend the difficult problem of what was taking place before them. From the tents came now loud angry cries and now plaintive groans. Occasionally dressers ran out to fetch water or to point out those who were to be brought in next. The wounded men awaiting their turn outside the tents groaned, sighed, wept, screamed, swore or asked for vodka. Some were delirious. Prince Andrew's bearers, stepping over the wounded who had not yet been bandaged, took him as a regimental commander close up to one of the tents, and there stopped, awaiting instructions. Prince Andrew opened his eyes, and for a long time could not make out what was going on around him. He remembered the meadow, the wormwood, the field, the whirling black ball, and his sudden rush of passionate love of life. Two steps from him, leaning against a branch and talking loudly and attracting general attention, stood a tall, handsome, black-haired, non-commissioned officer with a bandaged head. He had been wounded in the head and leg by bullets. Around him, eagerly listening to his talk, a crowd of wounded and stretcher-bearers was gathered. We kicked him out from there so that he chucked everything. We've grabbed the king himself, cried he, looking around him with eyes that glittered with fever. If only reserves had come up just then, lads, there wouldn't have been... There, there wouldn't have been nothing left of them. I tell you, surely... Like all the others near the speaker, Prince Andrew looked at him with shining eyes and experienced a sense of comfort. But isn't it all the same now, thought he? And what will be there? And what has there been here? Why was I so reluctant to part with life? There was something in this life I did not and do not understand. Chapter 37 The Operating Tent Portion of Prince Andrew's thigh bone extracted Anatole's leg amputated Prince Andrew pities him One of the doctors came out of the tent in a blood-stained apron holding a cigar between the thumb and little finger of one of his small blood-stained hands so as not to smear it. He raised his head and looked about him, but above the level of the wounded men. He evidently wanted a little respite. After turning his head from right to left for some time, he sighed and looked down. All right, immediately, he replied to a dresser who pointed Prince Andrew out to him, and he told them to carry him into the tent. Murmurs arose among the wounded who were waiting. It seems that even in the next world only the gentry are to have a chance, remarked one. Prince Andrew was carried in and laid on a table that had only just been cleared and which a dresser was washing down. Prince Andrew could not make out distinctly what was in that tent. The pitiful groans from all sides and the torturing pain in his thigh, stomach and back distracted him. All he saw about him merged into a general impression of naked, bleeding human bodies that seemed to fill the whole of the low tent, as a few weeks previously, on that hot August day, such bodies had filled the dirty pond beside the Smolensk road. Yes, it was the same flesh, the same chair à canon, cannon fodder, 
the sight of which had even then filled him with horror as by a presentiment. There were three operating tables in the tent. Two were occupied, and on the third they placed Prince Andrew. For a little while he was left alone and involuntarily witnessed what was taking place on the other two tables. On the nearest one sat a Tartar, probably a Cossack, judging by the uniform thrown down beside him. Four soldiers were holding him, and a spectacled doctor was cutting into his muscular brown back. Mm. Mm. grunted the Tartar, and suddenly lifting up his swarthy, snub-nosed face with its high cheekbones and baring his white teeth, he began to wriggle and twitch his body and utter piercing, ringing, and prolonged yells. On the other table, round which many people were crowding, a tall, well-fed man lay on his back with his head thrown back. His curly hair, its color, and the shape of his head seemed strangely familiar to Prince Andrew. Several dressers were pressing on his chest to hold him down. One large, white, plump leg twitched rapidly all the time with a feverish tremor. The man was sobbing and choking convulsively. Two doctors, one of whom was pale and trembling, were silently doing something to this man's other gory leg. When he had finished with the Tartar, whom they covered with an overcoat, the spectacled doctor came up to Prince Andrew, wiping his hands. He glanced at Prince Andrew's face and quickly turned away. "'Undress him! What are you waiting for?' he cried angrily to the dressers. His first very first remotest recollections of childhood came back to Prince Andrew's mind when the dresser, with sleeves rolled up, began hastily to undo the buttons of his clothes and undressed him. The doctor bent down over the wound, felt it, and sighed deeply. Then he made a sign to someone, and the torturing pain in his abdomen caused Prince Andrew to lose consciousness. When he came to himself, the splintered portions of his thigh bone had been extracted, the torn flesh cut away, and the wound bandaged. Water was being sprinkled on his face. As soon as Prince Andrew opened his eyes, the doctor bent over, kissed him silently on the lips, and hurried away. After the sufferings he had been enduring, Prince Andrew enjoyed a blissful feeling such as he had not experienced for a long time. All the best and happiest moments of his life, especially his earliest childhood, when he used to be undressed and put to bed, and when leaning over him his nurse sang him to sleep, and he, burying his head in the pillow, felt happy in the mere consciousness of life, returned to his memory, not merely as something past, but as something present. The doctors were busily engaged with the wounded man, the shape of whose head seemed familiar to Prince Andrew. They were lifting him up and trying to quiet him. Show it to me. <laughs> His frightened moans could be heard, subdued by suffering and broken by sobs. Hearing those moans, Prince Andrew wanted to weep. Whether because he was dying without glory, or because he was sorry to part with life, or because of those memories of a childhood that could not return, or because he was suffering and others were suffering, and that man near him was groaning so piteously, he felt like weeping childlike, kindly, and almost happy tears. The wounded man was shown his amputated leg, stained with clotted blood, and with the boot still on. <laughs> he sobbed like a woman. The doctor, who had been standing beside him, preventing Prince Andrew from seeing his face, moved away. My God! What is this? Why is he here? said Prince Andrew to himself. In the miserable, sobbing, and feebled man whose leg had just been amputated, he recognized Anatol Kuragin. Men were supporting him in their arms and offering him a glass of water, but his trembling, swollen lips could not grasp its rim. Anatol was sobbing painfully. Yes, it is he. Yes, that man is somehow closely and painfully connected with me, thought Prince Andrew, not yet clearly grasping what he saw before him. What is the connection of that man with my childhood and my life? He asked himself, without finding an answer. And suddenly a new unexpected memory from that realm of pure and loving childhood presented itself to him. He remembered Natasha as he had seen her for the first time at the ball in 1810, with her slender neck and arms, 
and with a frightened, happy face ready for rapture. And love and tenderness for her, stronger and more vivid than ever, awoke in his soul. He now remembered the connection that existed between himself and this man who was dimly gazing at him through tears that filled his swollen eyes. He remembered everything, and ecstatic pity and love for that man overflowed his happy heart. Prince Andrew could no longer restrain himself and wept tender loving tears for his fellow men, for himself, and for his own and their errors. Compassion love of our brothers, for those who love us and for those who hate us, love of our enemies. Yes, that love which God preached on earth and which Princess Mary taught me, and I did not understand. That is what made me sorry to part with life. That is what remained for me had I lived. But now it is too late. I know it. Chapter 38 Napoleon is depressed, his mind and conscience darkened, his calculation that few Frenchmen perished in Russia. The terrible spectacle of the battlefield covered with dead and wounded, together with the heaviness of his head and the news that some twenty generals he knew personally had been killed or wounded, and the consciousness of the impotence of his once mighty arm, produced an unexpected impression on Napoleon, who usually liked to look at the killed and wounded, thereby, he considered, testing his strength of mind. This day, the horrible appearance of the battlefield overcame that strength of mind which he thought constituted his merit and his greatness. He rode hurriedly from the battlefield and returned to the Shevardino Knoll, where he sat on his camp stool, his sallow face swollen and heavy, his eyes dim, his nose red and his voice hoarse, involuntarily listening with downcast eyes to the sounds of firing. With painful dejection he awaited the end of this action in which he regarded himself as a participant and which he was unable to arrest. A personal human feeling for a brief moment got the better of the artificial phantasm of life he had served so long. He felt in his own person the sufferings and death he had witnessed on the battlefield. The heaviness of his head and chest reminded him of the possibility of suffering and death for himself. At that moment he did not desire Moscow or victory or glory. What need had he for any more glory? The one thing he wished for was rest, tranquility, and freedom. But when he had been on the Semyonovsk heights, the artillery commander had proposed to him to bring several batteries of artillery up to those heights to strengthen the fire on the Russian troops crowded in front of Knyazkovo. Napoleon had assented and had given orders that news should be brought him of the effect those batteries produced. An adjutant came now to inform him that the fire of 200 guns had been concentrated on the Russians as he had ordered, but that they still held their ground. Our fire is mowing them down by rows, but still they hold on said the adjutant. They want more, said Napoleon in a hoarse voice. Sire, asked the adjutant, who had not heard the remark. They want more, croaked Napoleon, frowning. Let them have it. Even before he gave that order, the thing he did not desire, and for which he gave the order only because he thought it was expected of him, was being done, and he fell back into that artificial realm of imaginary greatness, and again as a horse walking a treadmill thinks it is doing something for itself, he submissively fulfilled the cruel, sad, gloomy, and inhuman role predestined for him. And not for that day and hour alone were the mind and conscience darkened of this man on whom the responsibility for what was happening lay more than on all the others who took part in it. Never to the end of his life could he understand goodness, beauty, or truth or the significance of his actions which were too contrary to goodness and truth, too remote from everything human, for him ever to be able to grasp their meaning. He could not disavow his actions, belauded as they were by half the world, and so he had to repudiate truth, goodness, and all humanity. Not only on that day as he rode over the battlefield strewn with men killed and maimed by his will, as he believed, 
did he reckon as he looked at them how many Russians there were for each Frenchman, and deceiving himself, find reason for rejoicing in the calculation that there were five Russians for every Frenchman. Not on that day alone did he write in a letter to Paris that the battlefield was superb because fifty thousand corpses lay there, but even on the island of St. Helena, in the peaceful solitude where he said he intended to devote his leisure to an account of the great deeds he had done, he wrote, The Russian war should have been the most popular war of modern times. It was a war of good sense, for real interests, for the tranquility and security of all. It was purely pacific and conservative. It was a war for a great cause, the end of uncertainties and the beginning of security. A new horizon and new labors were opening out, full of well-being and prosperity for all. The European system was already founded. All that remained was to organize it. Satisfied on these great points, and with tranquility everywhere, I too should have had my Congress and my Holy Alliance. Those ideas were stolen from me. In that reunion of great sovereigns, we should have discussed our interests like one family, and have rendered account to the peoples as clerk to master. Europe would in this way soon have been in fact but one people, and anyone who travelled anywhere would have found himself always in the common fatherland. I should have demanded the freedom of all navigable rivers for everybody, that the seas should be common to all, and that the great standing army should be reduced henceforth to mere guards for the sovereigns. On returning to France, to the bosom of the great, strong, magnificent, peaceful, and glorious fatherland, I should have proclaimed her frontiers immutable. All future wars purely defensive, all aggrandizement anti-national. I should have associated my son in the empire. My dictatorship would have been finished, and his constitutional reign would have begun. Paris would have been the capital of the world, and the French the envy of the nations. My leisure then, and my old age, would have been devoted, in company with the Empress and during the royal apprenticeship of my son, to leisurely visiting with our own horses and like a true country couple every corner of the empire, receiving complaints, redressing wrongs, and scattering public buildings and benefactions on all sides and everywhere. Napoleon, predestined by providence for the gloomy role of executioner of the peoples, assured himself that the aim of his actions had been the people's welfare, and that he could control the fate of millions, and by the employment of power confer benefactions. Of four hundred thousand men who crossed the Vistula, he wrote further of the Russian war, half were Austrians, Prussians, Saxons, Poles, Bavarians, Württembergers, Mecklenburgers, Spaniards, Italians, and Neapolitans. The imperial army, strictly speaking, was one-third composed of Dutch, Belgians, men from the borders of the Rhine, Piedmontese, Swiss, Genovese, Tuscans, Romans, inhabitants of the 32nd Military Division, of Bremen, of Hamburg, and so on. It included scarcely 140,000 who spoke French. The Russian expedition actually cost France less than 50,000 men. The Russian army in its retreat from Vilna to Moscow, lost in the various battles four times more men than the French army. The burning of Moscow cost the lives of a hundred thousand Russians who died of cold and want in the woods. Finally, in its march from Moscow to the Oder, the Russian army also suffered from the severity of the season, so that by the time it reached Vilna, it numbered only fifty thousand, and at Kalish, less than eighteen thousand. He imagined that the war with Russia came about by his will, and the horrors that occurred did not stagger his soul. He boldly took the whole responsibility for what happened, and his darkened mind found justification in the belief that among the hundreds of thousands who perished, there were fewer Frenchmen than Hessians and Bavarians. Chapter 39 Appearance of the field at the end of the battle, doubts maturing in every soul. Only a little further effort needed to secure victory, but such effort impossible. Could Napoleon have used his old god? The Russians had gained a moral victory. 
Several tens of thousands of the slain lay in diverse postures and various uniforms on the fields and meadows belonging to the Davidov family and to the crown serfs. Those fields and meadows where for hundreds of years the peasants of Borodino, Gorky, Shevardino, and Semyonovsk had reaped their harvests and pastured their cattle. At the dressing stations, the grass and earth were soaked with blood for a space of some three acres around. Crowds of men of various arms, wounded and unwounded, with frightened faces, dragged themselves back to Mozhaisk from the one army and back to Valuyevo from the other. Other crowds, exhausted and hungry, went forward led by their officers. Others held their ground and continued to fire. Over the whole field, previously so gaily beautiful with the glitter of bayonets and cloudlets of smoke in the morning sun, there now spread a mist of damp and smoke and a strange acid smell of saltpetre and blood. Clouds gathered and drops of rain began to fall on the dead and wounded, on the frightened, exhausted and hesitating men, as if to say, enough, men, enough, cease. Bethink yourselves, what are you doing? To the men of both sides alike, worn out by want of food and rest, it began equally to appear doubtful whether they should continue to slaughter one another. All the faces expressed hesitation, and the question arose in every soul, for what, for whom, must I kill and be killed? You may go and kill whom you please, but I don't want to do so any more. By evening this thought had ripened in every soul. At any moment these men might have been seized with horror at what they were doing, and might have thrown up everything and run away anywhere. But though toward the end of the battle the men felt all the horror of what they were doing, though they would have been glad to leave off, some incomprehensible, mysterious power continued to control them, and they still brought up the charges, loaded, aimed, and applied the match, though only one artilleryman survived out of every three, and though they stumbled and panted with fatigue, perspiring and stained with blood and powder. The cannonballs flew just as swiftly and cruelly from both sides, crushing human bodies. And that terrible work which was not done by the will of a man, but at the will of him who governs men and worlds, continued. Anyone looking at the disorganized rear of the Russian army would have said that if only the French made one more slight effort, it would disappear. And anyone looking at the rear of the French army would have said that the Russians need only make one more slight effort and the French would be destroyed. But neither the French nor the Russians made that effort, and the flame of battle burned slowly out. The Russians did not make that effort because they were not attacking the French. At the beginning of the battle they stood blocking the way to Moscow, and they still did so at the end of the battle as at the beginning. But even had the aim of the Russians been to drive the French from their positions, they could not have made this last effort. For all the Russian troops had been broken up. There was no part of the Russian army that had not suffered in the battle, and though still holding their positions, they had lost one half of their army. The French, with the memory of all their former victories during fifteen years, with the assurance of Napoleon's invincibility, with the consciousness that they had captured part of the battlefield and had lost only a quarter of their men and still had their guards intact, twenty thousand strong, might easily have made that effort. The French who had attacked the Russian army in order to drive it from its position ought to have made that effort. For as long as the Russians continued to block the road to Moscow as before, the aim of the French had not been attained, and all their efforts and losses were in vain. But the French did not make that effort. Some historians say that Napoleon need only have used his old guards who were intact, and the battle would have been won. To speak of what would have happened had Napoleon sent his guards is like talking of what would happen if autumn became spring. It could not be. Napoleon did not give his guards, not because he did not want to, but because it could not be done. All the generals, officers, and soldiers of the French army knew it could not be done, because the flagging spirit of the troops would not permit it. 
It was not Napoleon alone who had experienced that nightmare feeling of the mighty arm being stricken powerless, but all the generals and soldiers of his army, whether they had taken part in the battle or not, after all their experience of previous battles, when after one-tenth of such efforts the enemy had fled, experienced a similar feeling of terror before an enemy who, after losing half his men, stood as threateningly at the end as at the beginning of the battle. The moral force of the attacking French army was exhausted. Not that sort of victory which is defined by the capture of pieces of material fastened to sticks called standards and of the ground on which the troops had stood and were standing, but a moral victory that convinces the enemy of the moral superiority of his opponent and of his own impotence was gained by the Russians at Borodino. The French invaders, like an infuriated animal that has in its onslaught received a mortal wound, felt that they were perishing, but could not stop, any more than the Russian army, weaker by one half, could help swerving. By the impetus gained, the French army was still able to roll forward to Moscow. But there, without further effort on the part of the Russians, it had to perish bleeding from the mortal wound it had received at Borodino. The direct consequence of the Battle of Borodino was Napoleon's senseless flight from Moscow, his retreat along the old Smolensk road, the destruction of the invading army of 500,000 men, and the downfall of Napoleonic France, on which, at Borodino, for the first time, the hand of an opponent of stronger spirit had been laid. Book 11. Date of Principal Historical Event, 1812, September 1st, Old Style, Kutuzov Orders Retreat Through Moscow. Chapter 1. Continuity of Motion, Achilles and the Tortoise, The Method of History, Its Explanation of Events Compared with Explanations of the Movement of a Locomotive. Absolute Continuity of Motion is not comprehensible to the human mind. Laws of motion of any kind become comprehensible to man only when he examines arbitrarily selected elements of that motion. But at the same time, a large proportion of human error comes from the arbitrary division of continuous motion into discontinuous elements. There is a well-known so-called sophism of the ancients consisting in this, that Achilles could never catch up with a tortoise he was following in spite of the fact that he traveled ten times as fast as the tortoise. By the time Achilles has covered the distance that separated him from the tortoise, the tortoise has covered one-tenth of that distance ahead of him. When Achilles has covered that tenth, the tortoise has covered another one-hundredth, and so on forever. This problem seemed to the ancients insoluble. The absurd answer that Achilles could never overtake the tortoise resulted from this, that motion was arbitrarily divided into discontinuous elements, whereas the motion both of Achilles and of the tortoise was continuous. By adopting smaller and smaller elements of motion, we only approach a solution of the problem, but never reach it. Only when we have admitted the conception of the infinitely small and the resulting geometrical progression with a common ratio of one-tenth and have found the sum of this progression to infinity do we reach a solution of the problem. A modern branch of mathematics, having achieved the art of dealing with the infinitely small, can now yield solutions in other, more complex problems of motion which used to appear insoluble. This modern branch of mathematics, unknown to the ancients, when dealing with problems of motion, admits the conception of the infinitely small, and so conforms to the cheap condition of motion, absolute continuity, and thereby corrects the inevitable error which the human mind cannot avoid when it deals with separate elements of motion instead of examining continuous motion. In seeking the laws of historical movement, just the same thing happens. The movement of humanity, arising as it does from innumerable arbitrary human wills, is continuous. To understand the laws of this continuous movement is the aim of history. But to arrive at these laws, resulting from the sum of all those human wills, 
man's mind postulates arbitrary and disconnected units. The first method of history is to take an arbitrarily selected series of continuous events and to examine it apart from others, though there is and can be no beginning to any event, for one event always flows uninterruptedly from another. The second method is to consider the actions of some one man, a king or a commander, as equivalent to the sum of many individual wills, dual wills, dual wills, dual wills, dual wills, dual wills, whereas the sum of individual wills is never expressed by the activity of a single historic personage. Historical science, in its endeavor to draw nearer to truth, continually takes smaller and smaller units for examination. But however small the units it takes, we feel that to take any unit disconnected from others, or to assume a beginning of any phenomenon, or to say that the will of many men is expressed by the actions of any one historic personage, is in itself false. It needs no critical exertion to reduce utterly to dust any deductions drawn from history. It is merely necessary to select some larger or smaller unit as the subject of observation, as criticism has every right to do, seeing that whatever unit history observes must always be arbitrarily selected. Only by taking infinitesimally small units for observation, the differential of history, that is, the individual tendencies of men, and attaining to the art of integrating them, that is, finding the sum of these infinitesimals, can we hope to arrive at the laws of history. The first fifteen years of the nineteenth century in Europe present an extraordinary movement of millions of people. Men leave their customary pursuits, hasten from one side of Europe to the other, plunder and slaughter one another, triumph and are plunged in despair, and for some years the whole course of life is altered and presents an intensive movement which first increases and then slackens. What was the cause of this movement? By what laws was it governed? asks the mind of man. The historians replying to this question lay before us the sayings and doings of a few dozen men in a building in the city of Paris calling these sayings and doings the revolution. Then they give a detailed biography of Napoleon and of certain people favorable or hostile to him, tell of the influence some of these people had on others, and say, that is why this movement took place, and those are its laws. But the mind of man not only refuses to believe this explanation, but plainly says that this method of explanation is fallacious, because in it a weaker phenomenon is taken as the cause of a stronger. The sum of human wills produced the revolution and Napoleon, and only the sum of those wills first tolerated and then destroyed them. But every time there have been conquests, there have been conquerors. Every time there has been a revolution in any state, there have been great men, says history. And indeed, human reason replies, Every time conquerors appear, there have been wars, but this does not prove that the conquerors caused the wars, and that it is possible to find the laws of a war in the personal activity of a single man. Whenever I look at my watch, and its hands point to ten, I hear the bells of the neighboring church. But because the bells begin to ring when the hands of the clock reach ten, I have no right to assume that the movement of the bells is caused by the position of the hands of the watch. Whenever I see the movement of a locomotive, I hear the whistle and see the valves opening and wheels turning. But I have no right to conclude that the whistling and the turning of wheels are the cause of the movement of the engine. The peasants say that a cold wind blows in late spring because the oaks are budding. And really, every spring cold winds do blow when the oak is budding. But though I do not know what causes the cold winds to blow when the oak buds unfold, I cannot agree with the peasants that the unfolding of the oak buds is the cause of the cold wind, for the force of the wind is beyond the influence of the buds. 
I see only a coincidence of occurrences, such as happens with all the phenomena of life. And I see that however much and however carefully I observe the hands of the watch and the valves and wheels of the engine and the oak, I shall not discover the cause of the bells ringing, the engine moving, or of the winds of spring. To do that, I must entirely change my point of view and study the laws of the movement of steam, of the bells, and of the wind. History must do the same, and attempts in this direction have already been made. To study the laws of history, we must completely change the subject of our observation, must leave aside kings, ministers, and generals, and study the common, infinitesimally small elements by which the masses are moved. No one can say in how far it is possible for man to advance in this way toward an understanding of the laws of history, but it is evident that only along that path does the possibility of discovering the laws of history lie, and that, as yet, not a millionth part as much mental effort has been applied in this direction by historians as has been devoted to describing the actions of various kings, commanders, and ministers, and propounding the historian's own reflections concerning these actions. Chapter 2. Summary of Campaign Before Borodino and Explanation of Kutuzov's Subsequent Movements. The forces of a dozen European nations burst into Russia. The Russian army and people avoided a collision till Smolensk was reached, and again from Smolensk to Borodino. The French army pushed on to Moscow its goal, its impetus ever increasing as it neared its aim, just as the velocity of a falling body increases as it approaches the earth. Behind it were 700 miles of hunger-stricken, hostile country. Ahead were a few dozen miles separating it from its goal. Every soldier in Napoleon's army felt this, and the invasion moved on by its own momentum. The more the Russian army retreated, the more fiercely a spirit of hatred of the enemy flared up, and while it retreated, the army increased and consolidated. At Borodino, a collision took place. Neither army was broken up, but the Russian army retreated immediately after the collision, as inevitably as a ball recoils after colliding with another having a greater momentum, and with equal inevitability, the ball of invasion that had advanced with such momentum rolled on for some distance, though the collision had deprived it of all its force. The Russians retreated 80 miles to beyond Moscow, and the French reached Moscow, and there came to a standstill. For five weeks after that, there was not a single battle. The French did not move. As a bleeding, mortally wounded animal licks its wounds, they remained inert in Moscow for five weeks. And then suddenly, with no fresh reason, fled back. They made a dash for the Kaluga road, and after a victory, for at Maloyaroslavitz the field of conflict again remained theirs, without undertaking a single serious battle, they fled still more rapidly back to Smolensk, beyond Smolensk, beyond the Bergesina, beyond Vilna, and farther still. On the evening of the 26th of August, Kutuzov and the whole Russian army were convinced that the Battle of Borodino was a victory. Kutuzov reported so to the Emperor. He gave orders to prepare for a fresh conflict to finish the enemy, and did this not to deceive anyone, but because he knew that the enemy was beaten, as everyone who had taken part in the battle knew it. But all that evening and next day, reports came in one after another of unheard-of losses, of the loss of half the army and a fresh battle proved physically impossible. It was impossible to give battle before information had been collected, the wounded gathered in, the supplies of ammunition replenished, the slain reckoned up, new officers appointed to replace those who had been killed, and before the men had had food and sleep. And meanwhile, the very next morning after the battle, the French army advanced of itself upon the Russians carried forward by the force of its own momentum, now seemingly increased in inverse proportion to the square of the distance from its aim. Kutuzov's wish was to attack next day, and the whole army desired to do so. But to make an attack, 
The wish to do so is not sufficient. There must also be a possibility of doing it, and that possibility did not exist. It was impossible not to retreat a day's march, and then in the same way it was impossible not to retreat another and a third day's march. And at last, on the 1st of September, when the army drew near Moscow, despite the strength of the feeling that had arisen in all ranks, the force of circumstances compelled it to retire beyond Moscow, and the troops retired one more last day's march and abandoned Moscow to the enemy. For people accustomed to think that plans of campaign and battles are made by generals, as any one of us sitting over a map in his study may imagine how he would have arranged things in this or that battle, the questions present themselves, why did Kutuzov during the retreat not do this or that? Why did he not take up a position before reaching Fili? Why did he not retire at once by the Kaluga road, abandoning Moscow, and so on? People accustomed to think in that way forget or do not know the inevitable conditions which always limit the activities of any commander-in-chief. The activity of a commander-in-chief does not at all resemble the activity we imagine to ourselves when we sit at ease in our studies examining some campaign on the map with a certain number of troops on this and that side in a certain known locality and begin our plans from some given moment. A commander-in-chief is never dealing with the beginning of any event, the position from which we always contemplate it. The commander-in-chief is always in the midst of a series of shifting events, and so he can never at any moment consider the whole import of an event that is occurring. Moment by moment, the event is imperceptibly shaping itself, and at every moment of this continuous, uninterrupted shaping of events, the commander-in-chief is in the midst of a most complex play of intrigues, worries, contingencies, authorities, projects, councils, threats, and deceptions, and is continually obliged to reply to innumerable questions addressed to him which constantly conflict with one another. Learned military authorities quite seriously tell us that Kutuzov should have moved his army to the Kaluga road long before reaching Fili, and that somebody actually submitted such a proposal to him. But a commander-in-chief, especially at a difficult moment, has always before him not one proposal, but dozens simultaneously. And all these proposals, based on strategics and tactics, contradict each other. A commander-in-chief's business, it would seem, is simply to choose one of these projects. But even that he cannot do. Events and time do not wait. For instance, on the 28th, it is suggested to him to cross to the Kaluga Road. But just then, an adjutant gallops up from Miloradovich, asking whether he is to engage the French or retire. An order must be given him at once, that instant. And the order to retreat carries us past the turn to the Kaluga road. And after the adjutant comes the commissary general, asking where the stores are to be taken. And the chief of the hospitals asks where the wounded are to go. And a courier from Petersburg brings a letter from the sovereign which does not admit of the possibility of abandoning Moscow. And the commander-in-chief's rival, the man who is undermining him, and there are always not merely one but several such, presents a new project diametrically opposed to that of turning to the Kaluga road. And the commander-in-chief himself needs sleep and refreshment to maintain his energy and a respectable general who has been overlooked in the distribution of rewards comes to complain, and the inhabitants of the district pray to be defended, and an officer sent to inspect the locality comes in and gives a report quite contrary to what was said by the officer previously sent, and a spy, a prisoner, and a general who has been on reconnaissance all describe the position of the enemy's army differently. People accustomed to misunderstand or to forget these inevitable conditions of a commander-in-chief's actions describe to us, for instance, the position of the army at Fili and assume that the commander-in-chief could, on the 1st of September, quite freely decide whether to abandon Moscow or defend it. Whereas, with the Russian army less than four miles from Moscow, no such question existed. When had that question been settled? At Drissa and at Smolensk, 
and most palpably of all on the 24th of August at Shevardino and on the 26th at Borodino, and each day and hour and minute of the retreat from Borodino to Fili. Chapter 3. Kutuzov and his generals at the Pakloni Hill, Council of War at Fili. When Yermolov, having been sent by Kutuzov to inspect the position, told the field marshal that it was impossible to fight there before Moscow and that they must retreat, Kutuzov looked at him in silence. Give me your hand, said he, and turning it over so as to feel the pulse, added, You are not well, my dear fellow. Think what you are saying. Kutuzov could not yet admit the possibility of retreating beyond Moscow without a battle. On the Pokloni Hill, four miles from the Dorogomilov Gate of Moscow, Kutuzov got out of his carriage and sat down on a bench by the roadside. A great crowd of generals gathered round him, and Count Rostopchin, who had come out from Moscow, joined them. This brilliant company separated into several groups who all discussed the advantages and disadvantages of the position, the state of the army, the plans suggested, the situation of Moscow, and military questions generally. Though they had not been summoned for the purpose, and though it was not so called, they all felt that this was really a council of war. The conversations all dealt with public questions. If anyone gave or asked for personal news, it was done in a whisper, and they immediately reverted to general matters. No jokes or laughter or smiles even were seen among all these men. They evidently all made an effort to hold themselves at the height the situation demanded. And all these groups, while talking among themselves, tried to keep near the commander-in-chief, whose bench formed the center of the gathering, and to speak so that he might overhear them. The commander-in-chief listened to what was being said and sometimes asked them to repeat their remarks, but did not himself take part in the conversations or express any opinion. After hearing what was being said by one or other of these groups, he generally turned away with an air of disappointment, as though they were not speaking of anything he wished to hear. Some discussed the position that had been chosen, criticizing not the position itself so much as the mental capacity of those who had chosen it. Others argued that a mistake had been made earlier and that a battle should have been fought two days before. Others again spoke of the Battle of Salamanca, which was described by Crozard, a newly arrived Frenchman in a Spanish uniform. This Frenchman and one of the German princes serving with the Russian army were discussing the siege of Saragossa and considering the possibility of defending Moscow in a similar manner. Count Rostopchin was telling a fourth group that he was prepared to die with the city train bands under the walls of the capital, but that he still could not help regretting having been left in ignorance of what was happening, and that had he known it sooner, things would have been different. A fifth group, displaying the profundity of their strategic perceptions, discussed the direction the troops would now have to take. A sixth group was talking absolute nonsense. Kutuzov's expression grew more and more preoccupied and gloomy. From all this talk, he saw only one thing, that to defend Moscow was a physical impossibility in the full meaning of those words. That is to say, so utterly impossible that if any senseless commander were to give orders to fight, confusion would result, but the battle would still not take place. It would not take place because the commanders not merely all recognized the position to be impossible, but in their conversations were only discussing what would happen after its inevitable abandonment. How could the commanders lead their troops to a field of battle they considered it impossible to hold? The lower grade officers and even the soldiers, who too reason, also considered the position impossible and therefore could not go to fight, fully convinced as they were of defeat. If Bennigsen insisted on the position being defended, and others still discussed it, the question was no longer important in itself, but only as a pretext for disputes and intrigue. This Kutuzov knew well. Bennigsen, who had chosen the position, warmly displayed his Russian patriotism – Kutuzov could not listen to this without wincing – by insisting that Moscow must be defended. His aim was as clear as daylight to Kutuzov. If the defense failed, to throw the blame on Kutuzov, who had brought the army as far as the Sparrow Hills without giving battle. 
if it succeeded, to claim the success as his own, or if battle were not given, to clear himself of the crime of abandoning Moscow. But this intrigue did not now occupy the old man's mind. One terrible question absorbed him, and to that question he heard no reply from anyone. The question for him now was, have I really allowed Napoleon to reach Moscow, and when did I do so? When was it decided? Can it have been yesterday, when I ordered Platov to retreat? Or was it the evening before, when I had a nap and told Benningson to issue orders? Or was it earlier still? When? When was this terrible affair decided? Moscow must be abandoned. The army must retreat, and the order to do so must be given. To give that terrible order seemed to him equivalent to resigning the command of the army. And not only did he love power to which he was accustomed, the honors awarded to Prince Prozorovsky under whom he had served in Turkey galled him, but he was convinced that he was destined to save Russia, and that that was why, against the Emperor's wish and by the will of the people, he had been chosen commander-in-chief. He was convinced that he alone could maintain command of the army in these difficult circumstances, and that in all the world he alone could encounter the invincible Napoleon without fear. And he was horrified at the thought of the order he had to issue. But something had to be decided, and these conversations around him, which were assuming too free a character, must be stopped. He called the most important generals to him. My head be it good or bad, must depend on itself, said he, rising from the bench, and he rode to Philly, where his carriages were waiting. The council of war began to assemble at two in the afternoon in the better and roomier part of Andrew Sabostianov's hut. The men, women, and children of the large peasant family crowded into the back room across the passage. Only Malasha, Andrew's six-year-old granddaughter, whom His Serene Highness had petted and to whom he had given a lump of sugar while drinking his tea, remained on the top of the brick oven in the larger room. Malasha looked down from the oven with shy delight at the faces, uniforms, and decorations of the generals, who one after another came into the room and sat down on the broad benches in the corner under the icons. Grandad himself, as Malasha in her own mind called Kutuzov, sat apart in a dark corner behind the oven. He sat sunk deep in a folding armchair and continually cleared his throat and pulled at the collar of his coat, which, though it was unbuttoned, still seemed to pinch his neck. Those who entered went up one by one to the field marshal. He pressed the hands of some and nodded to others. His adjutant, Kaisarov, was about to draw back the curtain of the window facing Kutuzov, but the latter moved his hand angrily and Kaisarov understood that His Serene Highness did not wish his face to be seen. Round the peasant's deal table, on which lay maps, plans, pencils, and papers, so many people gathered that the orderlies brought in another bench and put it beside the table. Yermolov, Kaisarov, and Tol, who had just arrived, sat down on this bench. In the foremost place, immediately under the icons, sat Barclay de Tolly his high forehead merging into his bald crown. He had a St. George's cross round his neck and looked pale and ill. He had been feverish for two days and was now shivering and in pain. Beside him sat Uvaro, who with rapid gesticulations was giving him some information, speaking in low tones as they all did. Chubby little Dokhturov was listening attentively with eyebrows raised and arms folded on his stomach. On the other side sat Count Osterman Tolstoy, seemingly absorbed in his own thoughts. His broad head, with its bold features and glittering eyes, was resting on his hand. Rayevsky, twitching forward the black hair on his temples as was his habit, glanced now at Kutuzov and now at the door with a look of impatience. Konovnitsyn's firm, handsome, and kindly face was lit up by a tender, sly smile. His glance met Malasha's, and the expression of his eyes caused the little girl to smile. They were all waiting for Benningson, who, on the pretext of inspecting the position, was finishing his savoury dinner. They waited for him from four till six o'clock, 
and did not begin their deliberations all that time, but talked in low tones of other matters. Only when Bennigsen had entered the hut did Kutuzov leave his corner and draw toward the table, but not near enough for the candles that had been placed there to light up his face. Bennigsen opened the council with the question, Are we to abandon Russia's ancient and sacred capital without a struggle, or are we to defend it? A prolonged and general silence followed. There was a frown on every face, and only Kutuzov's angry grunts and occasional cough broke the silence. All eyes were gazing at him. Malasha, too, looked at Grandad. She was nearest to him and saw how his face puckered. He seemed about to cry, but this did not last long. Russia's ancient and sacred capital, he suddenly said, repeating Bennigsen's words in an angry voice and thereby drawing attention to the false note in them. Allow me to tell you, Your Excellency, that that question has no meaning for a Russian. He lurched his heavy body forward. Such a question cannot be put. It is senseless. The question I've asked these gentlemen to meet to discuss is a military one. The question is that of saving Russia. Is it better to give up Moscow without a battle, or by accepting battle to risk losing the army as well as Moscow? That is the question on which I want your opinion. And he sank back in his chair. The discussion began. Bennigsen did not yet consider his game lost. Admitting the view of Barclay and others that a defensive battle at Philly was impossible, but imbued with Russian patriotism and the love of Moscow, he proposed to move troops from the right to the left flank during the night and attack the French right flank the following day. Opinions were divided, and arguments were advanced for and against that project. Yermolov, Dokhturov, and Raevsky agreed with Bennigsen. Whether feeling it necessary to make a sacrifice before abandoning the capital, or guided by other personal considerations, these generals seemed not to understand that this council could not alter the inevitable course of events, and that Moscow was in effect already abandoned. The other generals, however, understood it, and, leaving aside the question of Moscow, spoke of the direction the army should take in its retreat. Malasha, who kept her eyes fixed on what was going on before her, understood the meaning of the council differently. It seemed to her that it was only a personal struggle between Grandad and Longcoat, as she termed Bennigsen. She saw that they grew spiteful when they spoke to one another, and in her heart she sided with Grandad. In the midst of the conversation she noticed Grandad give Bennigsen a quick, subtle glance, and then to her joy she saw that Grandad said something to Longcoat which settled him. Bennigsen suddenly reddened and paced angrily up and down the room. What so affected him was Kutuzov's calm and quiet comment on the advantage or disadvantage of Bennigsen's proposal to move troops by night from the right to the left flank to attack the French right wing. Gentlemen, said Kutuzov, I cannot approve of the Count's plan. Moving troops in close proximity to an enemy is always dangerous, and military history supports that view. For instance, Kutuzov seemed to reflect, searching for an example, then with a clear, naive look at Bennigsen, he added, Oh, yes, uh, take the Battle of Friedland, which I think the Count well remembers, and which was not fully successful, only because our troops were rearranged too near the enemy. There followed a momentary pause, which seemed very long to them all. The discussion recommenced, but pauses frequently occurred, and they all felt that there was no more to be said. During one of these pauses, Kutuzov heaved a deep sigh as if preparing to speak. They all looked at him. Well, gentlemen, I see that it is I who will have to pay for the broken crockery, said he, and rising slowly he moved to the table. Gentlemen, I have heard your views. Some of you will not agree with me. But I... He paused. By the authority entrusted to me by my sovereign and country, order a retreat. 
After that, the generals began to disperse with the solemnity and circumspect silence of people who are leaving after a funeral. Some of the generals, in low tones and in a strain very different from the way they had spoken during the council, communicated something to their commander-in-chief. Malasha, who had long been expected for supper, climbed carefully backwards down from the oven, her bare little feet catching at its projections, and slipping between the legs of the generals, she darted out of the room. When he had dismissed the generals, Kutuzov sat a long time with his elbows on the table, thinking always of the same terrible question. When? When did the abandonment of Moscow become inevitable? When was that done which settled the matter? And who was to blame for it? I did not expect this, said he to his adjutant Schneider when the latter came in late that night. I did not expect this. I did not think this would happen. You should take some rest, your serene highness, replied Schneider. No, they shall eat horse flesh yet, like the Turks, exclaimed Kutuzov without replying, striking the table with his podgy fist. They shall too, if only... Chapter 4 The Author's Reflections on the Abandonment of Moscow Rostopchin's Conduct and That of Private Individuals At that very time, in circumstances even more important than retreating without a battle, namely the evacuation and burning of Moscow, Rostopchin, who was usually represented as being the instigator of that event, acted in an altogether different manner from Kutuzov. After the Battle of Borodino, the abandonment and burning of Moscow was as inevitable as the retreat of the army beyond Moscow without fighting. Every Russian might have predicted it, not by reasoning, but by the feeling implanted in each of us and in our fathers. The same thing that took place in Moscow had happened in all the towns and villages on Russian soil, beginning with Smolensk, without the participation of Count Rostopchin and his broadsheets. The people awaited the enemy unconcernedly, did not riot or become excited or tear anyone to pieces, but faced its fate, feeling within it the strength to find what it should do at that most difficult moment. And as soon as the enemy drew near, the wealthy classes went away abandoning their property, while the poorer remained and burned and destroyed what was left. The consciousness that this would be so and would always be so was and is present in the heart of every Russian. And a consciousness of this, and a foreboding that Moscow would be taken, was present in Russian Moscow society in 1812. Those who had quitted Moscow already in July and at the beginning of August showed that they expected this. Those who went away, taking what they could and abandoning their houses and half their belongings, did so from the latent patriotism which expresses itself not by phrases or by giving one's children to save the fatherland and similar unnatural exploits, but unobtrusively, simply, organically, and therefore in the way that always produces the most powerful results. It is disgraceful to run away from danger. Only cowards are running away from Moscow, they were told. In his broadsheets, Rostopchin impressed on them that to leave Moscow was shameful. They were ashamed to be called cowards, ashamed to leave, but still they left, knowing it had to be done. Why did they go? It is impossible to suppose that Rostopchin had scared them by his accounts of horrors Napoleon had committed in conquered countries. The first people to go away were the rich, educated people who knew quite well that Vienna and Berlin had remained intact, and that during Napoleon's occupation the inhabitants had spent their time pleasantly in the company of the charming Frenchmen, whom the Russians, and especially the Russian ladies, then liked so much. They went away because for Russians there could be no question as to whether things would go well or ill under French rule in Moscow. It was out of the question to be under French rule. It would be the worst thing that could happen. They went away even before the Battle of Borodino, and still more rapidly after it, despite Rostopchin's calls to defend Moscow or the announcement of his intention to take the wonder-working icon of the Iberian Mother of God and go to fight, or of the balloons that were to destroy the French, and despite all the nonsense Rostopchin wrote in his broadsheets. 
They knew that it was for the army to fight, and that if it could not succeed, it would not do to take young ladies and house serfs to the Three Hills quarter of Moscow to fight Napoleon, and that they must go away, sorry as they were to abandon their property to destruction. They went away without thinking of the tremendous significance of that immense and wealthy city being given over to destruction. For a great city with wooden buildings was certain, when abandoned by its inhabitants, to be burned. They went away, each on his own account, and yet it was only in consequence of their going away that the momentous event was accomplished that will always remain the greatest glory of the Russian people. The lady who, afraid of being stopped by Count Rostopchin's orders, had already in June moved with her negroes and her women jesters from Moscow to her Saratov estate, with a vague consciousness that she was not Bonaparte's servant, was really, simply, and truly carrying out the great work which saved Russia. But Count Rostopchin, who now taunted those who left Moscow and now had the government offices removed, now distributed quite useless weapons to the drunken rabble, now had processions displaying the icons, and now forbade Father Augustine to remove icons or the relics of saints, now seized all the private carts in Moscow, and on 136 of them removed the balloon that was being constructed by Lepich, now hinted that he would burn Moscow, and related how he had set fire to his own house, now wrote a proclamation to the French solemnly upbraiding them for having destroyed his orphanage, now claimed the glory of having hinted that he would burn Moscow, and now repudiated the deed, now ordered the people to catch all spies and bring them to him, and now reproached them for doing so, now expelled all the French residents from Moscow, and now allowed Madame Aubert Chalmay, the centre of the whole French colony in Moscow, to remain, but ordered the venerable old postmaster Klucharyov to be arrested and exiled for no particular offence, now assembled the people at the Three Hills to fight the French, and now, to get rid of them, handed over to them a man to be killed, and himself drove away by a back gate, now declared that he would not survive the fall of Moscow, and now wrote French verses and albums concerning his share in the affair. This man did not understand the meaning of what was happening, but merely wanted to do something himself that would astonish people, to perform some patriotically heroic feat, and like a child he made sport of the momentous and unavoidable event, the abandonment and burning of Moscow, and tried with his puny hand now to speed and now to stay the enormous popular tide that bore him along with it. Chapter 5 Hélène in Petersburg Conversion to Catholicism and Plans for Remarriage Hélène, having returned with the court from Bilna to Petersburg, found herself in a difficult position. In Petersburg she had enjoyed the special protection of a grandee who occupied one of the highest posts in the empire. In Vilna she had formed an intimacy with a young foreign prince. When she returned to Petersburg, both the magnate and the prince were there, and both claimed their rights. Hélène was faced by a new problem, how to preserve her intimacy with both without offending either. What would have seemed difficult, or even impossible to another woman, did not cause the least embarrassment to Countess Bezukhova, who evidently deserved her reputation of being a very clever woman. Had she attempted concealment, or tried to extricate herself from her awkward position by cunning, she would have spoiled her case by acknowledging herself guilty. But Hélène, like a really great man who can do whatever he pleases, at once assumed her own position to be correct, as she sincerely believed it to be, and that everyone else was to blame. The first time the young foreigner allowed himself to reproach her, she lifted her beautiful head, and half turning to him said firmly, That's just like a man, selfish and cruel. I expected nothing else. A woman sacrifices herself for you, she suffers, and this is her reward. What right have you, Monseigneur, to demand an account of my attachments and friendships? He is a man who has been more than a father to me, the prince was about to say something, but Hélène interrupted him. Well, yes, said she, it may be that he has other sentiments for me than those of a father, but that is not a reason for me to shut my door on him. 
I'm not a man that I should repay kindness with ingratitude. No, Monseigneur, that in all that relates to my intimate feelings, I render account only to God and to my conscience, she concluded, laying her hand on her beautiful, fully expanded bosom and looking up to heaven. Now, but for heaven's sake, listen to me. Marry me and I will be your slave. But that's impossible. You won't deign to demean yourself by marrying me. You, said Hélène, beginning to cry. The prince tried to comfort her, but Hélène, as if quite distraught, said through her tears that there was nothing to prevent her marrying, that there were precedents. They were up to that time very few, but she mentioned Napoleon and some other exalted personages, that she had never been her husband's wife and that she had been sacrificed. But the law, religion, said the prince, already yielding. The law, religion, what have they been invented for if they can't arrange that, said Hélène. The prince was surprised that so simple an idea had not occurred to him, and he applied for advice to the holy brethren of the Society of Jesus, with whom he was on intimate terms. A few days later, at one of those enchanting fates which Hélène gave at her country house on the Stone Island, the charming Monsieur de Jobert, a man no longer young, with snow-white hair and brilliant black eyes, a Jesuit à robe courte, a lay member of the Society of Jesus, was presented to her, and in the garden, by the light of the illuminations and to the sound of music, talked to her for a long time of the love of God, of Christ, of the Sacred Heart, and of the consolations the one true Catholic religion affords in this world and the next. Hélène was touched, and more than once tears rose to her eyes and to those of Monsieur de Jobert, and their voices trembled. A dance for which a partner came to seek her put an end to her discourse with her future directeur de conscience, but the next evening Monsieur de Jobert came to see Hélène when she was alone, and after that often came again. One day he took the countess to a Roman Catholic church, where she knelt down before the altar to which she was led. The enchanting middle-aged Frenchman laid his hands on her head, and, as she herself afterward described it, she felt something like a fresh breeze wafted into her soul. It was explained to her that this was la grâce. After that, a long-frocked abbé was brought to her. She confessed to him, and he absolved her from her sins. Next day, she received a box containing the sacred host, which was left at her house for her to partake of. A few days later, Hélène learned with pleasure that she had now been admitted to the true Catholic Church, and that in a few days the Pope himself would hear of her and would send her a certain document. All that was done around her and to her at this time, all the attention devoted to her by so many clever men and expressed in such pleasant, refined ways, and the state of dove-like purity she was now in, she wore only white dresses and white ribbons all that time, gave her pleasure, but her pleasure did not cause her for a moment to forget her aim. And as it always happens in contests of cunning that a stupid person gets the better of cleverer ones, Hélène, having realized that the main object of all these words and all this trouble was, after converting her to Catholicism, to obtain money from her for Jesuit institutions, as to which she received indications, before parting with her money, insisted that the various operations necessary to free her from her husband should be performed. In her view, the aim of every religion was merely to preserve certain proprieties while affording satisfaction to human desires. And with this aim, in one of her talks with her father confessor, she insisted on an answer to the question, in how far was she bound by her marriage? They were sitting in the twilight by a window in the drawing room. The scent of flowers came in at the window. Hélène was wearing a white dress, transparent over her shoulders and bosom. The abbé, a well-fed man with a plump, clean-shaven chin, a pleasant, firm mouth, and white hands meekly folded on his knees, sat close to Hélène, and with a subtle smile on his lips and a peaceful look of delight at her beauty, occasionally glanced at her face as he explained his opinion on the subject. Hélène, with an uneasy smile, looked at his curly hair and his plump, clean-shaven, blackish cheeks, and every moment expected the conversation to take a fresh turn. But the abbé, 
though he evidently enjoyed the beauty of his companion, was absorbed in his mastery of the matter. The course of the Father Confessor's arguments ran as follows. Ignorant of the import of what you were undertaking, you made a vow of conjugal fidelity to a man who on his part, by entering the married state without faith in the religious significance of marriage, committed an act of sacrilege. That marriage lacked the dual significance it should have had. Yet, in spite of this, your vow was binding. You swerved from it. What did you commit by so acting? A venial or a mortal sin? A venial sin, for you acted without evil intention. If now you married again with the object of bearing children, your sin might be forgiven. But the question is again a twofold one. Firstly, but suddenly Hélène, who was getting bored, said with one of her bewitching smiles, But I think that having espoused the true religion, I cannot be bound by what a false religion laid upon me. The director of her conscience was astounded at having the case presented to him thus with the simplicity of Columbus's egg. He was delighted at the unexpected rapidity of his pupil's progress, but could not abandon the edifice of argument he had laboriously constructed. "'Let us understand one another, Countess,' said he with a smile, and began refuting his spiritual daughter's arguments. Hélène understood that the question was very simple and easy from the ecclesiastical point of view, and that her directors were making difficulties only because they were apprehensive as to how the matter would be regarded by the secular authorities. So she decided that it was necessary to prepare the opinion of society. She provoked the jealousy of the elderly magnate and told him what she had told her other suitor. That is, she put the matter so that the only way for him to obtain a right over her was to marry her. The elderly magnate was at first as much taken aback by this suggestion of marriage with a woman whose husband was alive as the younger man had been. But Hélène's imperturbable conviction that it was as simple and natural as marrying a maiden had its effect on him too. Had Hélène herself shown the least sign of hesitation, shame, or secrecy, her cause would certainly have been lost. But not only did she show no signs of secrecy or shame, on the contrary, with good-natured naivete she told her intimate friends, and these were all Petersburg, that both the prince and the magnate had proposed to her, and that she loved both and was afraid of grieving either. A rumor immediately spread in Petersburg, not that Hélène wanted to be divorced from her husband, had such a report spread many would have opposed so illegal an intention, but simply that the unfortunate and interesting Hélène was in doubt which of the two men she should marry. The question was no longer whether this was possible, but only which was the better match, and how the matter would be regarded at court. There were, it is true, some rigid individuals unable to rise to the height of such a question, who saw in the project a desecration of the sacrament of marriage. But there were not many such, and they remained silent, while the majority were interested in Hélène's good fortune and in the question which match would be the more advantageous. Whether it was right or wrong to remarry while one had a husband living, they did not discuss, for that question had evidently been settled by people wiser than you or me, as they said, and to doubt the correctness of that decision would be to risk exposing one's stupidity and incapacity to live in society. Only Maria Dmitrievna Akhrosimova, who had come to Petersburg that summer to see one of her sons, allowed herself plainly to express an opinion contrary to the general one. Meeting Hélène at a ball, she stopped her in the middle of the room, and amid general silence said in her gruff voice, so wives of living men have started marrying again. Perhaps you think you've invented a novelty? You've been forestalled, my dear. It was thought of long ago. It is done in all the brothels. And with these words, Maria Dmitrievna, turning up her wide sleeves with her usual threatening gesture and glancing sternly round, moved across the room. Though people were afraid of Maria Dmitrievna, she was regarded in Petersburg as a buffoon, and so of what she had said they only noticed and repeated in a whisper the one coarse word she had used, supposing the whole sting of her remark to lie in that word. Prince Vasily, 
who of late very often forgot what he had said and repeated one and the same thing a hundred times, remarked to his daughter whenever he chanced to see her, Then I have a word to say with you. And he would lead her aside, drawing her hand downward. I've heard of certain projects concerning, you know. Well, my dear child, you know how your father's heart rejoices to know that you... You've suffered so much. But, my dear child, consult only your own heart. That is all I have to say. And concealing his unvarying emotion, he would press his cheek against his daughter's and move away. Bilibin, who had not lost his reputation of an exceedingly clever man, and who was one of the disinterested friends so brilliant a woman as Hélène always has, men friends who can never change into lovers, once gave her his view of the matter at a small and intimate gathering. "'Listen, Bilibin,' said Hélène. She always called friends of that sort by their surnames, and she touched his coat-sleeve with her white, beringed fingers. "'Tell me, as you would a sister, what I ought to do. Which of the two? Bilibin wrinkled up the skin over his eyebrows and pondered with a smile on his lips. "'You're not taking me unawares, you know,' said he. "'As a true friend, I have thought and thought again about your affair. You see, if you marry the prince,' he meant the younger man, and he crooked one finger, "'you forever lose the chance of marrying the other, and you will displease the court besides. You know, there, there is some kind of connection. But if you marry the old count,' He will make his last days happy, and as widow of the grand... The prince would no longer be making a mesalliance by marrying you. And Bilibin smoothed out his forehead. That's a true friend, said Hélène, beaming, and again touching Bilibin's sleeve. But I love them, you know, and don't want to distress either of them. I would give my life for the happiness of them both. Bilibin shrugged his shoulders, as much as to say that not even he could help in that difficulty. Une maîtresse femme, a clever woman. That's what is called putting things squarely. She would like to be married to all three at the same time, thought he. But tell me, how will your husband look at the matter? Bilibin asked, his reputation being so well established that he did not fear to ask so naive a question. Will he agree? Oh, he loves me so, said Hélène, who for some reason imagined that Pierre too loved her. He will do anything for me. Bilibin puckered his skin in preparation for something witty. "'Even divorce you?' said he. Hélène laughed. Among those who ventured to doubt the justifiability of the proposed marriage was Hélène's mother, Princess Kuragina. She was continually tormented by jealousy of her daughter, and now that jealousy concerned a subject near to her own heart. She could not reconcile herself to the idea." She consulted a Russian priest as to the possibility of divorce and remarriage during a husband's lifetime, and the priest told her that it was impossible, and to her delight showed her a text in the gospel which, as it seemed to him, plainly forbids remarriage while the husband is alive. Armed with these arguments, which appeared to her unanswerable, she drove to her daughter's early one morning so as to find her alone. Having listened to her mother's objections, Hélène smiled blandly and ironically. But it says plainly, whosoever shall marry her that is divorced, said the old princess. Ah, maman, ne dites pas de bêtises. Vous ne comprenez rien. Dans ma position, j'ai des devoirs. Oh, maman, don't talk nonsense. You don't understand anything. In my position, I have obligations, said Hélène, changing from Russian, in which language she always felt that her case did not sound quite clear, into French, which suited it better. But, my dear... Oh, Mamma, how is it you don't understand that the Holy Father, who has the right to grant dispensations... Just then, the lady companion who lived with Hélène came in to announce that His Highness was in the ballroom and wished to see her. Non, dites-lui que je ne veux pas le voir, que je suis furieuse contre lui, parce qu'il m'a manqué parole. No, tell him I don't wish to see him, I am furious with him for not keeping his word to me. Comtesse, a tout péché miséricorde. Countess, there is mercy for every sin, said a fair-haired young man with a long face and nose as he entered the room. The old princess rose respectfully and curtsied. The young man who had entered took no notice of her. The princess nodded to her daughter and sidled out of the room. Yes, she is right, thought the old princess, all her convictions dissipated by the appearance of his highness. 
she is right. But how is it that we, in our irrecoverable youth, did not know it? Yet it is so simple, she thought, as she got into her carriage. By the beginning of August, Hélène's affairs were clearly defined, and she wrote a letter to her husband, who, as she imagined, loved her very much, informing him of her intention to marry N.N., N., and of her having embraced the one true faith, and asking him to carry out all the formalities necessary for a divorce, which would be explained to him by the bearer of the letter. And so I pray God to have you, my friend, in his holy and powerful keeping, your friend Hélène. This letter was brought to Pierre's house when he was on the field of Borodino. Chapter 6 Pierre walks to Mojaisk, his night lodging there, his dream and his return to Moscow. Toward the end of the Battle of Borodino, Pierre, having run down from Raevsky's battery a second time, made his way through a gully to Knyazkovo with a crowd of soldiers, reached the dressing station, and seeing blood and hearing cries and groans, hurried on, still entangled in the crowds of soldiers. The one thing he now desired with his whole soul was to get away quickly from the terrible sensations amid which he had lived that day, and return to ordinary conditions of life and sleep quietly in a room in his own bed. He felt that only in the ordinary conditions of life would he be able to understand himself and all he had seen and felt. But such ordinary conditions of life were nowhere to be found. Though shells and bullets did not whistle over the road along which he was going, still on all sides there was what there had been on the field of battle. There was still the same suffering, exhausted, and sometimes strangely indifferent faces, the same blood, the same soldiers' overcoats, the same sounds of firing, which, though distant now, still aroused terror. And besides this, there were the foul air and the dust. Having gone a couple of miles along the Mojaisk road, Pierre sat down by the roadside. Dusk had fallen, and the roar of guns died away. Pierre lay leaning on his elbow for a long time, gazing at the shadows that moved past him in the darkness. He was continually imagining that a cannonball was flying toward him with a terrific whiz, and then he shuddered and sat up. He had no idea how long he had been there. In the middle of the night, three soldiers, having brought some firewood, settled down near him and began lighting a fire. The soldiers, who threw sidelong glances at Pierre, got the fire to burn and placed an iron pot on it into which they broke some dried bread and put a little dripping. The pleasant odor of greasy viands mingled with the smell of smoke. Pierre sat up and sighed. The three soldiers were eating and talking among themselves, taking no notice of him. "'And who may you be?' one of them suddenly asked Pierre evidently meaning what Pierre himself had in mind, namely, if you want to eat, we'll give you some food, only let us know whether you're an honest man. I, uh, I, uh, said Pierre, feeling it necessary to minimize his social position as much as possible so as to be nearer to the soldiers and better understood by them. By rights, uh, I'm a militia officer, but my men are not here. I came to the battle and have lost them. Oh, there now, said one of the soldiers. Another shook his head. "'Would you like a little mash?' the first soldier asked, and handed Pierre a wooden spoon after licking it clean. Pierre sat down by the fire and began eating the mash, as they called the food in the cauldron, and he thought it more delicious than any food he had ever tasted. As he sat bending greedily over it, helping himself to large spoonfuls and chewing one after another, his face was lit up by the fire, and the soldiers looked at him in silence. "'Where have you to go to? Tell us,' said one of them. "'To Mojaisk. "'You're a gentleman, aren't you?' "'Yes.' "'What's your name?' "'Peter Kirillich.' "'Well, then, Peter Kirillich, come along with us. We'll take you there.' In the total darkness, the soldiers walked with Pierre to Mojaisk. By the time they got near Mojaisk and began ascending the steep hill into the town, the cocks were already crowing. Pierre went on with the soldiers, quite forgetting that his inn was at the bottom of the hill and that he had already passed it. He would not soon have remembered this, such was his state of forgetfulness, had he not halfway up the hill stumbled upon his groom, who had been to look for him in the town, and was returning to the inn. The groom recognized Pierre in the darkness by his white hat. "'Your Excellency,' he said, "'why, we were beginning to despair. 
How is it you're on foot? And where are you going, please? Oh, y yes, said Pierre. The soldiers stopped. So you found your folk, said one of them. Well, goodbye, uh, Peter Kirillich, isn't it? Goodbye, Peter Kirillich, Pierre heard the other voices repeat. Goodbye, he said, and turned with his groom toward the inn. I ought to give them something, he thought, and felt in his pocket. No, better not, said another inner voice. There was not a room to be had at the inn. They were all occupied. Pierre went out into the yard, and, covering himself up, head and all, lay down in his carriage. Scarcely had Pierre laid his head on the pillow before he felt himself falling asleep, but suddenly, almost with the distinctness of reality, he heard the boom, boom, boom of firing, the thud of projectiles, groans and cries, and smelled blood and powder, and a feeling of horror and dread of death seized him. Filled with fright, he opened his eyes and lifted his head from under his cloak. All was tranquil in the yard. Only someone's orderly passed through the gateway, splashing through the mud, and talked to the innkeeper. Above Pierre's head, some pigeons, disturbed by the movement he had made in sitting up, fluttered under the dark roof of the penthouse. The whole courtyard was permeated by a strong, peaceful smell of stable yards, delightful to Pierre at that moment. He could see the clear starry sky between the dark roofs of two penthouses. Thank God there is no more of that, he thought, covering up his head again. Oh, what a terrible thing is fear, and how shamefully I yielded to it. But they, they were steady and calm all the time. To the end, thought he. They, in Pierre's mind, were the soldiers those who had been at the battery, those who had given him food, and those who had prayed before the icon. They, those strange men he had not previously known, stood out clearly and sharply from everyone else. To be a soldier, just a soldier, thought Pierre as he fell asleep, to enter communal life completely, to be imbued by what makes them what they are, but how cast off all the superfluous, devilish burden of my outer man? There was a time when I could have done it. I could have run away from my father as I wanted to. Or I might have been sent to serve as a soldier after the duel with Dolokhov. And the memory of the dinner at the English club when he had challenged Dolokhov flashed through Pierre's mind. And then he remembered his benefactor at Torjok. And now a picture of a solemn meeting of the lodge presented itself to his mind. It was taking place at the English club, and someone near and dear to him sat at the end of the table. Yes, that is he. It is my benefactor. But he died, thought Pierre. Yes, he died, and I did not know he was alive. How sorry I am that he died, and how glad I am that he is alive again. On one side of the table sat Anatole, Dolokhov, Nezvitsky, Denisov, and others like them. In his dream, the category to which these men belonged was as clearly defined in his mind as the category of those he termed they. And he heard those people, Anatole and Dolokhov, shouting and singing loudly. Yet through their shouting, the voice of his benefactor was heard speaking all the time, and the sound of his words was as weighty and uninterrupted as the booming on the battlefield, but pleasant and comforting. Pierre did not understand what his benefactor was saying, but he knew, the categories of thoughts were also quite distinct in his dream, that he was talking of goodness and the possibility of being what they were. And they, with their simple, kind, firm faces, surrounded his benefactor on all sides. But though they were kindly, they did not look at Pierre and did not know him. Wishing to speak and to attract their attention, he got up, but at that moment his legs grew cold and bare. He felt ashamed, and with one arm covered his legs, from which his cloak had in fact slipped. For a moment, as he was rearranging his cloak, Pierre opened his eyes and saw the same penthouse roofs, posts, and yard, but now they were all bluish, lit up and glittering with frost or dew. It is dawn, thought Pierre, but that's not what I want. 
I want to hear and understand my benefactor's words. Again he covered himself up with his cloak, but now neither the lodge nor his benefactor was there. There were only thoughts clearly expressed in words, thoughts that someone was uttering or that he himself was formulating. Afterwards, when he recalled those thoughts, Pierre was convinced that someone outside himself had spoken them, though the impressions of that day had evoked them. He had never, it seemed to him, been able to think and express his thoughts like that when awake. To endure war is the most difficult subordination of man's freedom to the law of God, the voice had said. Simplicity is submission to the will of God. You cannot escape from him. And they are simple. They do not talk, but act. The spoken word is silver, but the unspoken is golden. Man can be master of nothing while he fears death, but he who does not fear possesses all. If there were no suffering, man would not know his limitations, would not know himself. The hardest thing, Pierre went on thinking or hearing in his dream, is to be able in your soul to unite the meaning of all, to unite all, he asked himself. No, not to unite. Thoughts cannot be united. But to harness all these thoughts together is what we need. Yes, one must harness them, must harness them, he repeated to himself with inward rapture, feeling that these words and they alone expressed what he wanted to say and solved the question that tormented him. Yes, one must harness. It is time to harness. Time to harness? Time to harness, Your Excellency. Your Excellency, some voice was repeating. We must harness. It is time to harness. It was the voice of the groom trying to wake him. The sun shone straight into Pierre's face. He glanced at the dirty inn-yard in the middle of which soldiers were watering their lean horses at the pump while carts were passing out of the gate. Pierre turned away with repugnance and, closing his eyes, quickly fell back on the carriage seat. No, I don't want that. I don't want to see and understand that. I want to understand what was revealing itself to me in my dream. One second more and I should have understood it all. But what am I to do? Harness. But how can I harness everything? And Pierre felt with horror that the meaning of all he had seen and thought in the dream had been destroyed. The groom, the coachman, and the innkeeper told Pierre that an officer had come with news that the French were already near Mojaisk and that our men were leaving it. Pierre got up and, having told them to harness and overtake him, went on foot through the town. The troops were moving on, leaving about ten thousand wounded behind them. There were wounded in the yards, at the windows of the houses, and the streets were crowded with them. In the streets, around carts that were to take some of the wounded away, shouts, curses, and blows could be heard. Pierre offered the use of his carriage, which had overtaken him, to a wounded general he knew, and drove with him to Moscow. On the way, Pierre was told of the death of his brother-in-law, Anatole, and of that of Prince Andrew. Chapter 7 Pierre at Rostopchins the affair of Klucharyov and Vereshchagin. Pierre leaves home secretly. On the 30th of August, Pierre reached Moscow. Close to the gates of the city, he was met by Count Rostopchin's adjutant. We've been looking for you everywhere, said the adjutant. The Count wants to see you particularly. He asks you to come to him at once on a very important matter. Without going home, Pierre took a cab and drove to see the Moscow commander-in-chief. Count Rostopchin had only that morning returned to town from his summer villa at Sokolniki. The ante-room and reception room of his house were full of officials who had been summoned or had come for orders. Vasilchikov and Platov had already seen the Count and explained to him that it was impossible to defend Moscow and that it would have to be surrendered. Though this news was being concealed from the inhabitants, the officials, the heads of the various government departments, knew that Moscow would soon be in the enemy's hands just as Count Rostopchin himself knew it, and to escape personal responsibility they had all come to the governor to ask how they were to deal with their various departments. As Pierre was entering the reception room, a courier from the army came out of Rostopchin's private room. In answer to questions with which he was greeted, the courier made a despairing gesture with his hand and passed through the room. While waiting in the reception room, 
Pierre, with weary eyes, watched the various officials, old and young, military and civilian, who were there. They all seemed dissatisfied and uneasy. Pierre went up to a group of men, one of whom he knew. After greeting Pierre, they continued their conversation. If they're sent out and brought back again later on, it will do no harm, but as things are now, one can't answer for anything. But you see what he writes, said another, pointing to a printed sheet he held in his hand. Well, that's another matter. That's necessary for the people, said the first. What is it? asked Pierre. Oh, it's a fresh broadsheet. Pierre took it and began reading. His Serene Highness, Kutuzov, has passed through Mozhaisk in order to join up with the troops moving toward him, and has taken up a strong position where the enemy will not soon attack him. Forty-eight guns with ammunition have been sent him from here, and His Serene Highness says he will defend Moscow to the last drop of blood, and is even ready to fight in the streets. Do not be upset, brothers, that the law courts are closed. Things have to be put in order, and we will deal with villains in our own way. When the time comes, I shall want both town and peasant lads, and will raise a cry a day or two beforehand. But they are not wanted yet, so I hold my peace. An axe will be useful, a hunting spear not bad, but a three-pronged fork will be best of all. A Frenchman is no heavier than a sheaf of rye. Tomorrow after dinner I shall take the Iberian icon of the Mother of God to the wounded in the Catherine Hospital, where we will have some water blessed. That will help them to get well quicker. I too am well now. One of my eyes was sore, but now I am on the lookout with both. But military men have told me that it is impossible to fight in the town, said Pierre, and that the position... Well, of course, that's what we were saying, replied the first speaker. And what does he mean by... One of my eyes was sore, but now I'm on the lookout with both, asked Pierre. The Count had a sty, replied the adjutant, smiling, and was very much upset when I told him people had come to ask what was the matter with him. By the by, Count, he added, suddenly addressing Pierre with a smile, we heard that you have family troubles, and that the Countess, your wife... I've heard nothing, Pierre replied unconcernedly. But uh, what have you heard? Oh, uh, well, you know, people often invent things... I only say what I heard. But what did you hear? Well, they say, continued the adjutant with the same smile, that the countess, your wife, is preparing to go abroad. I expect it's nonsense. Possibly, remarked Pierre, looking about him absent-mindedly. And who is that? he asked, indicating a short old man in a clean blue peasant overcoat with a big snow-white beard and eyebrows and a ruddy face. Ruddy face. Ruddy face, ruddy face, ruddy face, ruddy face. He, that, that's a tradesman. That is to say, he's the restaurant keeper, but it's Chagin. Perhaps you've heard of that affair with the proclamation. Oh, so that is Verischagin, said Pierre, looking at the firm, calm face of the old man and seeking any indication of his being a traitor. Oh, that's not he himself. That's the father of the fellow who wrote the proclamation, said the adjutant. The young man is in prison, and I expect it will go hard with him. An old gentleman wearing a star and another official, a German wearing a cross round his neck, approached the speaker. It's a complicated story, you know, said the adjutant. That proclamation appeared about two months ago. The Count was informed of it. He gave orders to investigate the matter. Gabriel Ivanovich here made the inquiries. The proclamation had passed through exactly sixty-three hands. He asked one, from whom did you get it? From so-and-so. He went to the next one, from whom did you get it? And so on, till he reached Verischagin, a half-educated tradesman, you know. A pet of a trader, said the adjutant, smiling. They asked him, who gave it you? And the point is that we knew whom he had it from. He could only have had it from the postmaster. But evidently... They had come to some understanding. He replied, from no one. I made it up myself. They threatened and questioned him, but he stuck to that. I made it up myself. And so it was reported to the Count who sent for the man. From whom did you get the proclamation? I wrote it myself. Well, you know, the Count, said the adjutant cheerfully with a smile of pride. He flared up dreadfully. And just think of the fellow's audacity, his lying and obstinacy. And the Count wanted him to say it was from Klucharyov? I understand, said Pierre. Not at all, 
rejoined the adjutant in dismay. Klucharyov had his own sins to answer for without that, and that is why he's been banished. But the point is that the Count was much annoyed. How could you have written it yourself, said he? And he took up the Hamburg Gazette that was lying on the table. Here it is. You did not write it yourself, but translated it, and translated it abominably, because you don't even know French, you fool. And what do you think? No, said he, I have not read any papers. I made it up myself. If that's so, you're a traitor, and I'll have you tried, and you'll be hanged. Say from whom you had it. I've seen no papers. I made it up myself. And that was the end of it. The Count had the father fetched, but the fellow stuck to it. He was sent for trial and condemned to hard labor, I believe. Now the father has come to intercede for him. But he's a good-for-nothing lad. You know that sort of tradesman, son, a dandy and lady killer. He attended some lectures somewhere and imagines that the devil is no match for him. That's the sort of fellow he is. His father keeps a cook shop here by the stone bridge, and you know there was a large icon of God Almighty painted with a scepter in one hand and an orb in the other. <laughs> well, he took that icon home with him for a few days, and what did he do? He found some scoundrel of a painter. <laughs> in the middle of this fresh tale, Pierre was summoned to the commander-in-chief. When he entered the private room, Count Rostopchin, puckering his face, was rubbing his forehead and eyes with his hand. A short man was saying something, but when Pierre entered, he stopped speaking and went out. "'Ah, how do you do, great warrior?' said Rostopchin as soon as the short man had left the room. "'We have heard of your prowess, but that's not the point. Between ourselves, mon cher, do you belong to the Masons?' He went on severely, as though there was something wrong about it which he nevertheless intended to pardon. Pierre remained silent. I'm well informed, my friend, but I'm aware that there are masons and masons, and I hope that you are not one of those who, on pretense of saving mankind, wish to ruin Russia. Yes, I'm a mason, Pierre replied. There, you see, mon cher. I expect you know that uh, Messieurs Speransky and Magnitsky have been deported to their proper place. Mr. Klucharyov has been treated in the same way and so have others who, on the plea of building up the Temple of Solomon, have tried to destroy the Temple of their fatherland. You can understand that there are reasons for this, and that I could not have exiled the postmaster had he not been a harmful person. It has now come to my knowledge that you lent him your carriage for his removal from town, and that you have even accepted papers from him for safe custody. I like you and don't wish you any harm, and, uh, as you're only half my age, I advise you, as a father would, to cease all communication with men of that stamp and to leave here as soon as possible. But what did Klucharyov do wrong, Count? asked Pierre. That is for me to know, but not for you to ask, shouted Rostopchin. If he's accused of circulating Napoleon's proclamation, it is not proved that he did so, said Pierre without looking at Rostopchin. And Verishchagin... There we are! Rostopchin shouted at Pierre louder than before, frowning suddenly. Verischagin is a renegade and a traitor who will be punished as he deserves, said he with the vindictive heat with which people speak when recalling an insult. But I did not summon you to discuss my actions, but to give you advice, or an order, if you prefer it. I beg you to leave the town and break off all communication with such men as Klucharyov. And I will knock the sense out of anybody but probably realizing that he was shouting at Bezukhov, who so far was not guilty of anything, he added, taking Pierre's hand in a friendly manner, "'We're on the eve of a public disaster, and I haven't time to be polite to everybody who has business with me. My head is sometimes in a whirl. "'Well, mon cher, what are you doing personally?' "'Why, nothing,' answered Pierre, without raising his eyes or changing the thoughtful expression of his face. The Count frowned. "'A word of friendly advice, mon cher.' Be off as soon as you can. That's all I have to tell you. Happy he who has ears to hear. Goodbye, my dear fellow. Oh, by the by, he shouted through the doorway after Pierre, is it true that the Countess has fallen into the clutches of the Holy Fathers of the Society of Jesus? Pierre did not answer, and left Rostopchin's room more sullen and angry than he had ever before shown himself. When he reached home, it was already getting dark. Some eight people had come to see him that evening, the secretary of a committee, the colonel of his battalion, his steward, his major-domo, and various petitioners. 
They all had business with Pierre and wanted decisions from him. Pierre did not understand and was not interested in any of these questions and only answered them in order to get rid of these people. When left alone at last, he opened and read his wife's letter. They, the soldiers at the battery, Prince Andrew killed, that old man, simplicity is submission to God, suffering is necessary, the meaning of all, one must harness, my wife is getting married, one must forget and understand, and going to his bed, he threw himself on it without undressing, and immediately fell asleep. When he awoke next morning, the major domo came to inform him that a special messenger, a police officer, had come from Count Rostopchin to know whether Count Bezukhov had left or was leaving the town. A dozen persons who had business with Pierre were awaiting him in the drawing room. Pierre dressed hurriedly, and instead of going to see them, went to the back porch and out through the gate. From that time till the end of the destruction of Moscow, no one of Bezukhov's household, despite all the search they made, saw Pierre again or knew where he was. Chapter 8 The Rostovs, packing up and leaving Moscow. They allow wounded officers to stay in their house and avail themselves of their carts to leave Moscow. Berg's wish to borrow a cart. Natasha, when leaving Moscow, sees and speaks to Pierre. Prince Andrew travels in their train of vehicles. The Rostovs remained in Moscow till the 1st of September, that is, till the eve of the enemy's entry into the city. After Petya had joined Obolensky's regiment of Cossacks and left for Bielaya Tserkov, where that regiment was forming, the countess was seized with terror. The thought that both her sons were at the war, had both gone from under her wing, that today or tomorrow either or both of them might be killed like the three sons of one of her acquaintances, struck her that summer for the first time with cruel clearness. She tried to get Nicholas back and wished to go herself to join Petya or to get him an appointment somewhere in Petersburg, but neither of these proved possible. Petya could not return unless his regiment did so or unless he was transferred to another regiment on active service. Nicholas was somewhere with the army and had not sent a word since his last letter, in which he had given a detailed account of his meeting with Princess Mary. The countess did not sleep at night, or when she did fall asleep, dreamed that she saw her sons lying dead. After many consultations and conversations, the count at last devised means to tranquilize her. He got Petya transferred from Obolensky's regiment to Bezukhov's, which was in training near Moscow. Though Petya would remain in the service, this transfer would give the countess the consolation of seeing at least one of her sons under her wing, and she hoped to arrange matters for her Petya so as not to let him go again, but always get him appointed to places where he could not possibly take part in a battle. As long as Nicholas alone was in danger, the countess imagined that she loved her firstborn more than all her other children, and even reproached herself for it. But when her youngest... The scapegrace who had been bad at lessons was always breaking things in the house and making himself a nuisance to everybody. That snub-nosed Petya with his merry black eyes and fresh rosy cheeks where soft down was just beginning to show. When he was thrown amid those big, dreadful, cruel men who were fighting somewhere about something and apparently finding pleasure in it, then his mother thought she loved him more, much more than all her other children. The nearer the time came for Petya to return, the more uneasy grew the countess. She began to think she would never live to see such happiness. The presence of Sonia, of her beloved Natasha, or even of her husband, irritated her. What do I want with them? I want no one but Petya, she thought. At the end of August, the Rostovs received another letter from Nicholas. He wrote from the province of Voronezh, where he had been sent to procure remounts. But that letter did not set the countess at ease. Knowing that one son was out of danger, she became the more anxious about Petya. Though by the 20th of August nearly all the Rostov's acquaintances had left Moscow, and though everybody tried to persuade the countess to get away as quickly as possible, she would not hear of leaving before her treasure, her adored Petya, returned. On the 28th of August he arrived. The passionate tenderness with which his mother received him did not please the sixteen-year-old officer. Though she concealed from him her intention of keeping him under her wing, 
Petya guessed her designs, and instinctively fearing that he might give way to emotion when with her, might become womanish, as he termed it to himself, he treated her coldly, avoided her, and during his stay in Moscow attached himself exclusively to Natasha, for whom he had always had a particularly brotherly tenderness, almost lover-like. Owing to the Count's customary carelessness, nothing was ready for their departure by the 28th of August, and the carts that were to come from their Ryazan and Moscow estates to remove their household belongings did not arrive till the 30th. From the 28th till the 31st, all Moscow was in a bustle and commotion. Every day thousands of men wounded at Borodino were brought in by the Dorogomilov Gate and taken to various parts of Moscow and thousands of carts conveyed the inhabitants and their possessions out by the other gates. In spite of Rostopchin's broadsheets, or because of them, or independently of them, the strangest and most contradictory rumours were current in the town. Some said that no one was to be allowed to leave the city. Others, on the contrary, said that all the icons had been taken out of the churches, and everybody was to be ordered to leave. Some said there had been another battle after Borodino, at which the French had been routed, while others, on the contrary, reported that the Russian army had been destroyed. Some talked about the Moscow militia, which, preceded by the clergy, would go to the Three Hills. Others whispered that Augustin, the Archbishop of Moscow, had been forbidden to leave, that traitors had been seized, that the peasants were rioting and robbing people on their way from Moscow, and so on. But all this was only talk. In reality, though the Council of Fili, at which it was decided to abandon Moscow, had not yet been held. Both those who went away and those who remained behind felt, though they did not show it, that Moscow would certainly be abandoned, and that they ought to get away as quickly as possible and save their belongings. It was felt that everything would suddenly break up and change. But up to the 1st of September, nothing had done so. As a criminal who is being led to execution knows that he must die immediately, but yet looks about him and straightens the cap that is awry on his head, so Moscow involuntarily continued its wanted life, though it knew that the time of its destruction was near when the conditions of life to which its people were accustomed to submit would be completely upset. During the three days preceding the occupation of Moscow, the whole Rostov family was absorbed in various activities. The head of the family, Count Ilyarostov, continually drove about the city collecting the current rumours from all sides and gave superficial and hasty orders at home about the preparations for their departure. The countess watched the things being packed, was dissatisfied with everything, was constantly in pursuit of Petya, who was always running away from her, and was jealous of Natasha, with whom he spent all his time. Sonya alone directed the practical side of matters by getting things packed. But of late, Sonia had been particularly sad and silent. Nicholas's letter in which he mentioned Princess Mary had elicited in her presence joyous comments from the Countess, who saw an intervention of Providence in this meeting of the Princess and Nicholas. "'I was never pleased at Polkonsky's engagement to Natasha,' said the Countess, "'but I always wanted Nicholas to marry the Princess, and had a presentiment that it would happen. What a good thing it would be!' Sonia felt that this was true that the only possibility of retrieving the Rostovs' affairs was by Nicholas marrying a rich woman, and that the princess was a good match. It was very bitter for her, but despite her grief, or perhaps just because of it, she took on herself all the difficult work of directing the storing and packing of their things, and was busy for whole days. The Count and Countess turned to her when they had any orders to give. Petya and Natasha, on the contrary, far from helping their parents, were generally a nuisance and a hindrance to everyone. Almost all day long the house resounded with their running feet, their cries, and their spontaneous laughter. They laughed and were gay, not because there was any reason to laugh, but because gaiety and mirth were in their hearts, and so everything that happened was a cause for gaiety and laughter to them. Petya was in high spirits because, having left home a boy, he had returned, as everybody told him, a fine young man because he was at home, because he had left Bielaya Tsyerkov, where there was no hope of soon taking part in a battle, and had come to Moscow, where there was to be fighting in a few days, and chiefly because Natasha, whose lead he always followed, was in high spirits. Natasha was gay, because she had been sad too long, and now nothing reminded her of the cause of her sadness, and because she was feeling well. 
She was also happy because she had someone to adore her. The adoration of others was a lubricant the wheels of her machine needed to make them run freely, and Petya adored her. Above all, they were gay because there was a war near Moscow. They would be fighting at the town gates, arms were being given out, everybody was escaping, going away somewhere, and in general, something extraordinary was happening, and that is always exciting, especially to the young. On Saturday, the 31st of August, everything in the Rostovs' house seemed topsy-turvy. All the doors were open, all the furniture was being carried out or moved about, and the mirrors and pictures had been taken down. There were trunks in the rooms, and hay, wrapping paper, and ropes were scattered about. The peasants and house serfs carrying out the things were treading heavily on the parquet floors. The yard was crowded with peasant carts, some loaded high and already corded up, others still empty. The voices and footsteps of the many servants and of the peasants who had come with the carts resounded as they shouted to one another in the yard and in the house. The Count had been out since morning. The Countess had a headache brought on by all the noise and turmoil, and was lying down in the new sitting-room with a vinegar compress on her head. Petya was not at home. He had gone to visit a friend with whom he meant to obtain a transfer from the militia to the active army. Sonia was in the ballroom looking after the packing of the glass and china. Natasha was sitting on the floor of her dismantled room, with dresses, ribbons, and scarves strewn all about her, gazing fixedly at the floor, and holding in her hands the old ball dress, already out of fashion, which she had worn at her first Petersburg ball. Natasha was ashamed of doing nothing when everyone else was so busy, and several times that morning had tried to set to work. But her heart was not in it, and she could not and did not know how to do anything except with all her heart and all her might. For a while she had stood beside Sonia while the china was being packed and tried to help, but soon gave it up and went to her room to pack her own things. At first she found it amusing to give away dresses and ribbons to the maids, but when that was done and what was left had still to be packed, she found it dull. Dunyasha, you pack. You will, won't you, dear? And when Dunyasha willingly promised to do it all for her, Natasha sat down on the floor, took her old ball dress, and fell into a reverie quite unrelated to what ought to have occupied her thoughts now. She was roused from her reverie by the talk of the maids in the next room which was theirs, and by the sound of their hurried footsteps going to the back porch. Natasha got up and looked out of the window. An enormously long row of carts full of wounded men had stopped in the street. The housekeeper, the old nurse, the cooks, coachmen, maids, footmen, postillions and scullions stood at the gate, staring at the wounded. Natasha, throwing a clean pocket handkerchief over her hair and holding an end of it in each hand, went out into the street. The former housekeeper, old Mavra Kuzminichna, had stepped out of the crowd by the gate, gone up to a cart with a hood constructed of bast mats, and was speaking to a pale young officer who lay inside. Natasha moved a few steps forward and stopped shyly, still holding her handkerchief, and listened to what the housekeeper was saying. "'Then you have nobody in Moscow?' she was saying. "'You would be more comfortable somewhere in a house. In ours, for instance. The family are leaving.' "'I don't know if it would be allowed,' replied the officer in a weak voice. "'Here is our commanding officer. Ask him.' And he pointed to a stout major who was walking back along the street past the row of carts. Natasha glanced with frightened eyes at the face of the wounded officer, and at once went to meet the major. "'May the wounded men stay in our house?' she asked. The major raised his hand to his cap with a smile. "'Which one do you want, mademoiselle?' said he, screwing up his eyes and smiling. Natasha quietly repeated her question, and her face and whole manner were so serious, though she was still holding the ends of her handkerchief, that the Major ceased smiling, and after some reflection, as if considering in how far the thing was possible, replied in the affirmative. "'Oh, yes, why not? They may,' he said. With a slight inclination of her head, Natasha stepped back quickly to Mavra Kuzminichna, who stood talking compassionately to the officer. "'They may. He says they may,' whispered Natasha. The court in which the officer lay was turned into the Rostov's yard, and dozens of courts with wounded men began at the invitation of the townsfolk to turn into the yards and to draw up at the entrances of the houses in Povarskaya Street. Natasha was evidently pleased to be dealing with new people outside the ordinary routine of her life. 
She and Mavra Kuzminichna tried to get as many of the wounded as possible into their yard. Your papa must be told, though, said Mavra Kuzminichna. Never mind, never mind, what does it matter? For one day we can move into the drawing room. They can have all our half of the house. There, now, young lady, you do take things into your head. Even if we put them into the wing, the men's room or the nurse's room, we must ask permission. Well, I'll ask. Natasha ran into the house and went on tiptoe through the half-open door into the sitting room, where there was a smell of vinegar and Hoffman's drops. Are you asleep, Mamma? Oh, what sleep, said the Countess, waking up just as she was dropping into a doze. Mamma, darling said Natasha, kneeling by her and bringing her face close to her mother's. I'm sorry, forgive me, I'll never do it again. I woke you up. Mavra Kuzminichna has sent me. They've brought some wounded here. Officers, will you let them come? They've nowhere to go. I, I knew you'd let them come, she said quickly, all in one breath. What officers? Whom have they brought? I don't understand anything about it, said the Countess. Natasha laughed, and the Countess, too, smiled slightly. I knew you'd give your permission, so I'll tell them. And having kissed her mother, Natasha got up and went to the door. In the hall she met her father, who had returned with bad news. We've stayed too long, said the Count with involuntary vexation. The club is closed and the police are leaving. Papa, is it all right? I've invited some of the wounded into the house, said Natasha. Of course it is, he answered absently. "'That's not the point. I, I, I beg you not to indulge in trifles now, but to help to pack, and tomorrow we must go, go, go.' And the Count gave a similar order to the major-domo and the servants. At dinner, Petya, having returned home, told them the news he had heard. He said the people had been getting arms in the Kremlin, and that, though Rostopchin's broadsheet had said that he would sound a call two or three days in advance, the order had certainly already been given for everyone to go armed to the three hills tomorrow, and that there would be a big battle there. The Countess looked with timid horror at her son's eager, excited face as he said this. She realized that if she said a word about his not going to the battle, she knew he enjoyed the thought of the impending engagement, he would say something about men, honor, and the fatherland, something senseless, masculine, and obstinate, which there would be no contradicting, and her plans would be spoiled. And so, hoping to arrange to leave before then and take Petya with her as their protector and defender, she did not answer him, but after dinner called the Count aside and implored him with tears to take her away quickly, that very night if possible. With a woman's involuntary loving cunning, she, who till then had not shown any alarm, said that she would die of fright if they did not leave that very night. Without any pretense, she was now afraid of everything. Madame Chausse, who had been out to visit her daughter, increased the Countess's fears still more by telling what she had seen at a spirit dealer's in Jasnitsky Street. When returning by that street, she had been unable to pass because of a drunken crowd rioting in front of the shop. She had taken a cab and driven home by a side street, and the cabman had told her that the people were breaking open the barrels at the drink store, having received orders to do so. After dinner, the whole Rostov household set to work with enthusiastic haste, packing their belongings and preparing for their departure. The old count, suddenly setting to work, kept passing from the yard to the house and back again, shouting confused instructions to the hurrying people and flurrying them still more. Petya directed things in the yard. Sonia, owing to the Count's contradictory orders, lost her head and did not know what to do. The servants ran noisily about the house and yard, shouting and disputing. At first, her intervention in the business of packing was received sceptically. Everybody expected some prank from her and did not wish to obey her. But she resolutely and passionately demanded obedience, grew angry and nearly cried because they did not heed her, and at last succeeded in making them believe her. Her first exploit, which cost her immense effort and established her authority, was the packing of the carpets. The Count had valuable Gobelin tapestries and Persian carpets in the house. When Natasha set to work, two cases were standing open in the ballroom, one almost full up with crockery, the other with carpets. There was also much china standing on the tables, and still more was being brought in from the storeroom. A third case was needed, and servants had gone to fetch it. "'Sonia, wait a bit. We'll pack everything into these,' said Natasha. Well, "'You can't, miss. We've tried to.' 
said the butler's assistant. No, wait a minute, please. And Natasha began rapidly taking out of the case dishes and plates wrapped in paper. The dishes must go in here among the carpets, said she. Why, it, it's a mercy if we can get the carpets alone into three cases, said the butler's assistant. Oh, wait, please. And Natasha began rapidly and deftly sorting out the things. These aren't needed, said she, putting aside some plates of Kiev ware. These, yes, these must go among the carpets, she said, referring to the Saxony china dishes. Don't, Natasha, leave it alone. We'll get it all packed, urged Sonia reproachfully. What a young lady she is, remarked the major domo. But Natasha would not give in. She turned everything out and began quickly repacking, deciding that the inferior Russian carpets and unnecessary crockery should not be taken at all. When everything had been taken out of the cases, they recommenced packing, and it turned out that when the cheaper things not worth taking had nearly all been rejected, the valuable ones really did all go into the two cases. Only the lid of the case containing the carpets would not shut down. A few more things might have been taken out, but Natasha insisted on having her own way. She packed, repacked, pressed, made the butler's assistant and Petya, whom she had drawn into the business of packing, press on the lid, and made desperate efforts herself. That's enough, Natasha, said Sonia. I see you were right, but just take out the top one. I won't, cried Natasha, with one hand holding back the hair that hung over her perspiring face, while with the other she pressed down the carpets. Now press, Petya, press, Vasilich, press hard, she cried. The carpets yielded, and the lid closed. Natasha, clapping her hands, screamed with delight, and tears fell from her eyes. But this only lasted a moment. She at once set to work afresh and they now trusted her completely. The Count was not angry even when they told him that Natasha had countermanded an order of his, and the servants now came to her to ask whether a cart was sufficiently loaded and whether it might be corded up. Thanks to Natasha's directions, the work now went on expeditiously. Unnecessary things were left, and the most valuable packed as compactly as possible. But hard as they all worked till quite late that night, they could not get everything packed. The countess had fallen asleep, and the count, having put off their departure till next morning, went to bed. Sonia and Natasha slept in the sitting-room without undressing. That night another wounded man was driven down the Povarskaya, and Mavra Kuzminichna, who was standing at the gate, had him brought into the Rostov's yard. Mavra Kuzminichna concluded that he was a very important man. He was being conveyed in a kalesh with a raised hood, and was quite covered by an apron. On the box beside the driver sat a venerable old attendant. A doctor and two soldiers followed the carriage in a cart. Please come in here. The masters are going away, and the whole house will be empty, said the old woman to the old attendant. Well, perhaps, said he with a sigh. We don't expect to get him home alive. We have a house of our own in Moscow, but it's a long way from here. And there's nobody living in it. "'Do us the honour to come in. "'There's plenty of everything in the master's house. "'Come in,' said Mavra Kuzminichna. "'Is he very ill?' she asked. "'The attendant made a hopeless gesture. "'We don't expect to get him home. "'We must ask the doctor.' "'And the old servant got down from the box "'and went up to the cart. "'All right,' said the doctor. "'The old servant returned to the calèche, "'looked into it, shook his head disconsolately, "'told the driver to turn into the yard, and stopped beside Mavra Kuzminichna. "'Oh, Lord Jesus Christ!' she murmured. She invited them to take the wounded man into the house. "'The masters won't object,' she said. But they had to avoid carrying the man upstairs, and so they took him into the wing and put him in the room that had been Madame Chosse's. This wounded man was Prince Andrew Bolkonsky. Moscow's last day had come. It was a clear, bright autumn day, a Sunday. The church bells everywhere were ringing for service, just as usual on Sundays. Nobody seemed yet to realize what awaited the city. Only two things indicated the social condition of Moscow. The rabble, that is, the poor people, and the price of commodities. An enormous crowd of factory hands, house serfs and peasants, with whom some officials, seminarists and gentry were mingled, had gone early that morning to the Three Hills. Having waited there for Rostopchin, who did not turn up, 
they became convinced that Moscow would be surrendered and then dispersed all about the town to the public houses and cook shops. Prices, too, that day indicated the state of affairs. The price of weapons, of gold, of carts and horses kept rising, but the value of paper money and city articles kept falling, so that by midday there were instances of carters removing valuable goods such as cloth and receiving in payment a half of what they carted, while peasant horses were fetching five hundred roubles each and furniture, mirrors, and bronzes were being given away for nothing. In the Rostov's staid old-fashioned house, the dissolution of former conditions of life was but little noticeable. As to the serfs, the only indication was that three out of their huge retinue disappeared during the night, but nothing was stolen. And as to the value of their possessions, the thirty peasant carts that had come in from their estates, and which many people envied, proved to be extremely valuable, and they were offered enormous sums of money for them. Not only were huge sums offered for the horses and carts, but on the previous evening and early in the morning of the 1st of September, orderlies and servants sent by wounded officers came to the Rostov's yard, and wounded men dragged themselves there from the Rostov's and from neighboring houses where they were accommodated, entreating the servants to try to get them a lift out of Moscow. The major domo to whom these entreaties were addressed though he was sorry for the wounded, resolutely refused, saying that he dare not even mention the matter to the Count. Pity these wounded men as one might, it was evident that if they were given one cart there would be no reason to refuse another, or all the carts in one's own carriages as well. Thirty carts could not save all the wounded, and in the general catastrophe one could not disregard oneself and one's own family. So thought the Major Domo on his master's behalf. On waking up that morning, Count Ilya Rostov left his bedroom softly so as not to wake the countess, who had fallen asleep only toward morning, and came out to the porch in his lilac silk dressing gown. In the yard stood the carts, ready corded. The carriages were at the front porch. The major domo stood at the porch talking to an elderly orderly and to a pale young officer with a bandaged arm. On seeing the count, the major domo made a significant and stern gesture to them both to go away. "'Well, Vasilich, is everything ready?' asked the Count, and stroking his bald head he looked good-naturedly at the officer and the orderly and nodded to them. He liked to see new faces. "'We can harness at once, Your Excellency.' "'Well, that's right. As soon as the Countess wakes, we'll be off, God willing.' "'What is it, gentlemen?' he added, turning to the officer. "'Are you staying in my house?' The officer came nearer, and suddenly his face flushed crimson. "'Count, be so good as to allow me—' for God's sake, to get into some corner of one of your carts. I, I have nothing here with me. I, I, I should be all right on a loaded cart. Before the officer had finished speaking, the orderly made the same request on behalf of his master. Oh, yes, 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 said the Count hastily. I should be very pleased, very pleased. Uh, uh, Vasily, you'll see to it. Just uh, unload one or two carts. Well, well, well whatever, do what's necessary, said the Count, muttering some indefinite order. But at the same moment, an expression of warm gratitude on the officer's face had already sealed the order. The Count looked around him. In the yard, at the gates, at the window of the wings, wounded officers and their orderlies were to be seen. They were all looking at the Count and moving toward the porch. "'Please step into the gallery, Your Excellency,' said the Major Domo. "'What are your orders about the pictures?' The Count went into the house with him, repeating his order not to refuse the wounded who asked for a lift. Well, never mind. Some of the things can be unloaded, he added in a soft, confidential voice, as though afraid of being overheard. At nine o'clock, the countess woke up, and Matryona Timofeyevna, who had been her lady's maid before her marriage and now performed a sort of chief gendarme's duty for her, came to say that Madame Chosse was much offended and the young lady's summer dresses could not be left behind. On inquiry, the Countess learned that Madame Chosse was offended because her trunk had been taken down from its cart, and all the loads were being uncorded, and the luggage taken out of the carts to make room for wounded men, whom the Count, in the simplicity of his heart, had ordered that they should take with them. The Countess sent for her husband. "'What is this, my dear? I hear that the luggage is being unloaded. You know, my love, I wanted to tell you, Countess, dear—' 
An officer came to me to ask for a few carts for the wounded. After all, ours are things that can be bought, but uh, think what being left behind means to them. Uh, really, now in our own yard, we ask them in ourselves, and there are officers among them. You know, I think, my dear, let them be taken. Well, where's the hurry? The Count spoke timidly, as he always did when talking of money matters. The Countess was accustomed to this tone as a precursor of news of something detrimental to the children's interests, such as the building of a new gallery or conservatory, the inauguration of a private theatre or an orchestra. She was accustomed always to oppose anything announced in that timid tone, and considered it her duty to do so. She assumed her dolefully submissive manner and said to her husband, "'Listen to me, Count. You've managed matters so that we're getting nothing for the house.' and now you wish to throw away all our all the children's property you said yourself that we have a hundred thousand roubles worth of things in the house i don't consent my dear i don't do as you please it's the government's business to look after the wounded they know that look at the lopuchins opposite they cleared out everything two days ago that's what other people do it's, it's only we who are such fools if you have no pity on me have some for the children Flourishing his arms in despair, the Count left the room without replying. "'Papa, what are you doing that for?' asked Natasha, who had followed him into her mother's room. "'Nothing. Well, what business is it of yours?' muttered the Count angrily. "'But I heard,' said Natasha. "'Why does Mamma object?' "'What business is it of yours?' cried the Count. Natasha stepped up to the window and pondered. "'Papa, here's Berg coming to see us,' said she, looking out of the window." Berg, the Rostov son-in-law, was already a colonel wearing the orders of Vladimir and Anna, and he still filled the quiet and agreeable post of assistant to the head of the staff of the assistant commander of the 1st Division of the 2nd Army. On the 1st of September he had come to Moscow from the army. He had nothing to do in Moscow, but he had noticed that everyone in the army was asking for leave to visit Moscow and had something to do there, so he considered it necessary to ask for leave of absence for family and domestic reasons. Berg drove up to his father-in-law's house in his spruce little trap with a pair of sleek roans, exactly like those of a certain prince. He looked attentively at the carts in the yard, and while going up to the porch took out a clean pocket handkerchief and tied a knot in it. From the anteroom, Berg ran with smooth though impatient steps into the drawing-room, where he embraced the Count, kissed the hands of Natasha and Sonia, and hastened to inquire after Mamma's health. "'Health at a time like this?' said the Count. "'Come, tell us the news. Is the army retreating, or will there be another battle?' "'God Almighty alone can decide the fate of our fatherland, Papa,' said Berg. "'The army is burning with a spirit of heroism, and the leaders, so to say, have now assembled in council. No one knows what is coming. But in general I can tell you, Papa, that such a heroic spirit, the truly antique valour of the Russian army, which they... which it he corrected himself, has shown or displayed in the battle of the 26th, there are no words worthy to do it justice. I tell you, Papa, he smote himself on the breast, as a general he had heard speaking had done, but Berg did it a trifle late, for he should have struck his breast at the words Russian army. I tell you, frankly, that we, the commanders, far from having to urge the men on or anything of that kind, could hardly restrain those those yes th those exploits of antique valor he went on rapidly general barclay de tolly risked his life everywhere at the head of the troops i can assure you our corps was stationed on the hillside you can imagine and berg related all that he remembered of the various tales he had heard those days natasha watched him with an intent gaze that confused him as if she were trying to find in his face the answer to some question Altogether, such heroism as was displayed by the Russian warriors cannot be imagined or adequately praised, said Bear, glancing round at Natasha, and, as if anxious to conciliate her, replying to her intent look with a smile. Russia is not in Moscow. She lives in the hearts of her sons. Isn't it so, Papa? said he. Just then the countess came in from the sitting-room with a weary and dissatisfied expression. Berg hurriedly jumped up, kissed her hand, asked about her health, and, swaying his head from side to side to express sympathy, remained standing beside her. "'Yes, Mamma, I tell you sincerely that these are hard and sad times for every Russian. But why are you so anxious? You have still time to get away.' 
I can't think what the servants are about, said the countess, turning to her husband. I've just been told that nothing is ready yet. Somebody, after all, must see to things. Oh, one misses Michenka at such times. There won't be any end to it. The count was about to say something, but evidently restrained himself. He got up from his chair and went to the door. At that moment, Berg drew out his handkerchief as if to blow his nose, and, seeing the knot in it, pondered, shaking his head sadly and significantly. "'And I have a great favour to ask of you, papa,' said he. Hmm, said the Count, and stopped. "'I was uh, driving past Yusupov's house just now,' said Berg with a laugh, "'when the steward, a man I know, ran out and asked me whether I wouldn't buy something. I, I went in out of curiosity, you know, and there's a small chiffonier and a dressing-table. You know how dear Viera wanted a chiffonier like that, and how we had a dispute about it.' At the mention of the chiffonier and dressing-table, Berg involuntarily changed his tone to one of pleasure at his admirable domestic arrangements. "'And it's such a beauty! It pulls out and has a secret English drawer, you know, and dear Viera has long wanted one. I wish to give her a surprise, you see. I, I saw so many of those peasant carts in your yard. Uh, please let me have one. I will pay the man well, and—' The Count frowned and coughed. Uh, <coughs> "'Ask the Countess. I, I don't give orders.' "'If it's inconvenient, please don't,' said Berg. "'Only I so wanted it for dear Viera's sake.' "'Oh, go to the devil, all of you, to the devil, the devil, the devil!' cried the old Count. "'My head's in a whirl!' And he left the room. The Countess began to cry. "'Yes, Mamma. yes, these are very hard times,' said Berg. Natasha left the room with her father, and, as if finding it difficult to reach some decision, first followed him— and then ran downstairs. Petya was in the porch, engaged in giving out weapons to the servants who were to leave Moscow. The loaded carts were still standing in the yard. Two of them had been uncorded, and a wounded officer was climbing into one of them, helped by an orderly. "'Do you know what it's about?' Petya asked Natasha. She understood that he meant what were their parents quarrelling about. She did not answer. "'It's because Papa wanted to give up all the carts to the wounded,' said Petya. "'Vasilich told me. I consider—I consider,' Natasha suddenly almost shouted, turning her angry face to Petya, "'I consider it so horrid, so abominable, so—I don't know what. Are we despicable Germans?' Her throat quivered with convulsive sobs, and afraid of weakening and letting the force of her anger run to waste, she turned and rushed headlong up the stairs. Berg was sitting beside the countess, consoling her with the respectful attention of a relative. The count, pipe in hand, was pacing up and down the room, when Natasha, her face distorted by anger, burst in like a tempest and approached her mother with rapid steps. "'It's horrid! It's abominable!' she screamed. "'You, you can't possibly have ordered it!' Berg and the countess looked at her, perplexed and frightened. The count stood still at the window and listened. "'Mama, it's impossible! See what is going on in the yard!' she cried. "'They will be left!' "'What's the matter with you? Who are they? What do you want? "'Why, the wounded! It's impossible, Mamma. It's monstrous! "'No, Mamma, darling, it's not the thing. Please forgive me, darling. "'Mamma, what does it matter what we take away? "'Only look what is going on in the yard. Mamma, it's impossible!' "'The Count stood by the window and listened without turning round. "'Suddenly he sniffed and put his face closer to the window. "'The Countess glanced at her daughter saw her face full of shame for her mother, saw her agitation, and understood why her husband did not turn to look at her now, and she glanced round, quite disconcerted. "'Oh, do as you like. Am I hindering anyone?' she said, not surrendering at once. "'Mamma, darling, forgive me.' But the countess pushed her daughter away and went up to her husband. "'My dear, you order what is right. "'You know I don't understand about it,' said she, dropping her eyes shamefacedly. "'The eggs. The eggs are teaching the hen,' muttered the Count through tears of joy, and he embraced his wife, who was glad to hide her look of shame on his breast. "'Papa, Mamma, may I see to it? May I?' asked Natasha. "'We will still take all the most necessary things.' The Count nodded affirmatively, and Natasha, at the rapid pace at which she used to run when playing at tag, ran through the ballroom to the anteroom and downstairs into the yard. 
The servants gathered round Natasha, but could not believe the strange order she brought them until the Count himself, in his wife's name, confirmed the order to give up all the carts to the wounded and take the trunks to the storerooms. When they understood that order, the servants set to work at this new task with pleasure and zeal. It no longer seemed strange to them, but on the contrary, it seemed the only thing that could be done. Just as a quarter of an hour before, it had not seemed strange to anyone that the wounded should be left behind and the goods carted away, but that had seemed the only thing to do. The whole household, as if to atone for not having done it sooner, set eagerly to work at the new task of placing the wounded in the carts. The wounded dragged themselves out of their rooms and stood with pale but happy faces round the carts. The news that carts were to be had spread to the neighbouring houses from which wounded men began to come into the Rostov's yard. Many of the wounded asked them not to unload the carts but only to let them sit on the top of the things. But the work of unloading, once started, could not be arrested. It seemed not to matter whether all or only half the things were left behind. Cases full of china, bronzes, pictures and mirrors that had been so carefully packed the night before now lay about the yard and still they went on searching for and finding possibilities of unloading this or that and letting the wounded have another and yet another cart. "'We can take four more men,' said the steward. "'They can have my trap, or else uh, what is to become of them?' "'Let them have my wardrobe cart,' said the countess. "'Dunyasha can go with me in the carriage.' They unloaded the wardrobe cart and sent it to take wounded men from a house two doors off. The whole household, servants included, was bright and animated. Natasha was in a state of rapturous excitement such as she had not known for a long time. "'What could we fasten this on to?' asked the servants, trying to fix a trunk on the narrow footboard behind a carriage. "'We must keep at least one cart.' "'What's in it?' asked Natasha. "'The Count's books.' "'Leave it. Vasilich will put it away. It's not wanted.' The phaeton was full of people, and there was a doubt as to where Count Peter could sit. "'On the box! You'll sit on the box, won't you, Petya?' cried Natasha. Sonia, too, was busy all this time, but the aim of her efforts was quite different from Natasha's. She was putting away the things that had to be left behind, and making a list of them as the Countess wished, and she tried to get as much taken away with them as possible. Before two o'clock in the afternoon, the Rostov's four carriages, packed full and with the horses harnessed, stood at the front door. One by one the carts, with the wounded, had moved out of the yard. The calèche in which Prince Andrew was being taken attracted Sonia's attention as it passed the front porch. With the help of a maid, she was arranging a seat for the countess in the huge high coach that stood at the entrance. "'Whose calèche is that?' she inquired, leaning out of the carriage window. "'Why didn't you know, miss?' replied the maid. "'The wounded prince.' He spent the night in our house and is going with us. But who is it? What's his name? It's our intended that was, Prince Bolkonsky himself. They say he's dying, replied the maid with a sigh. Sonia jumped out of the coach and ran to the countess. The countess, tired out and already dressed in shawl and bonnet for her journey, was pacing up and down the drawing room, waiting for the household to assemble for the usual silent prayer with closed doors before starting. Natasha was not in the room. Mamma, said Sonia, Prince Andrew is here, mortally wounded. He's going with us. The countess opened her eyes in dismay and, seizing Sonia's arm, glanced around. Natasha, she murmured. At that moment, this news had only one significance for both of them. They knew their Natasha, and alarm as to what would happen if she heard this news stifled all sympathy for the man they both liked. Natasha does not know yet, but he's going with us, said Sonia. You say he's dying? Sonia nodded. The countess put her arms around Sonia and began to cry. The ways of God are past finding out, she thought, feeling that the almighty hand hitherto unseen was becoming manifest in all that was now taking place. Well, Mamma, everything is ready. What's the matter? asked Natasha, as with animated face she ran into the room. Nothing, answered the countess. If everything is ready, let us start. And the countess bent over her reticule to hide her agitated face. Sonia embraced Natasha and kissed her. Natasha looked at her inquiringly. What is it? What has happened? Nothing, no. Is it something very bad for me? What is it? 
persisted Natasha with her quick intuition. Sonia sighed and made no reply. The Count, Petya, Madame Schoss, Mavra Kuzminichna, and Vasilich came into the drawing room, and having closed the doors, they all sat down and remained for some moments silently seated without looking at one another. The Count was the first to rise, and with a loud sigh crossed himself before the icon. All the others did the same. Then the Count embraced Mavra Kuzminichna and Vasilich, who were to remain in Moscow, and while they caught at his hand and kissed his shoulder, he patted their backs lightly with some vaguely affectionate and comforting words. The Countess went into the oratory, and there Sonia found her on her knees before the icons that had been left here and there hanging on the wall. The most precious ones, with which some family tradition was connected, were being taken with them. In the porch and in the yard, the men whom Petya had armed with swords and daggers, with trousers tucked inside their high boots and with belts and girdles tightened, were taking leave of those remaining behind. As is always the case at a departure, much had been forgotten or put in the wrong place, and for a long time two men-servants stood one on each side of the open door and the carriage steps, waiting to help the countess in, while maids rushed with cushions and bundles from the house to the carriages, the calèche, the phaeton, and back again. "'They always will forget everything,' said the countess. "'Don't you know I can't sit like that?' And Dunyasha, with clenched teeth, without replying, but with an aggrieved look on her face, hastily got into the coach to rearrange the seat. "'Oh, those servants!' said the Count, swaying his head. Yefim, the old coachman, who was the only one the Countess trusted to drive her, sat perched up high on the box, and did not so much as glance round at what was going on behind him. From thirty years' experience, he knew it would be some time yet before the order, Be off in God's name, would be given him and he knew that, even when it was said, he would be stopped once or twice more while they sent back to fetch something that had been forgotten, and even after that he would again be stopped, and the countess herself would lean out of the window and beg him for the love of heaven to drive carefully down the hill. He knew all this, and therefore waited calmly for what would happen, with more patience than the horses, especially the near one, the chestnut falcon, who was pawing the ground and champing his bit. At last all were seated. The carriage steps were folded and pulled up, the door was shut, somebody was sent for a travelling case, and the countess leaned out and said what she had to say. Then Yefim deliberately doffed his hat and began crossing himself. The postillion and all the other servants did the same. "'Off, in God's name,' said Yefim, putting on his hat. "'Start!' The postillion started the horses, the off-pole horse tugged at his collar, the high springs creaked, and the body of the coach swayed. The footman sprang onto the box of the moving coach, which jolted as it passed out of the yard onto the uneven roadway. The other vehicles jolted in their turn, and the procession of carriages moved up the street. In the carriages, the calèche and the phaeton all crossed themselves as they passed the church opposite the house. Those who were to remain in Moscow walked on either side of the vehicles, seeing the travellers off. Rarely had Natasha experienced so joyful a feeling as now, sitting in the carriage beside the Countess and gazing at the slowly receding walls of forsaken, agitated Moscow. Occasionally she leaned out of the carriage window and looked back, and then forward at the long train of wounded in front of them. Almost at the head of the line she could see the raised hood of Prince Andrew's calèche. She did not know who was in it, but each time she looked at the procession her eyes sought that calèche. She knew it was right in front. In Kudrino, from the Nikitsky, Presnya, and Podnovinsk streets, came several other trains of vehicles similar to the Rostovs, and as they passed along the Sadovaya street, the carriages and carts formed two rows abreast. As they were going round the Sukharyov water tower, Natasha, who was inquisitively and alertly scrutinizing the people driving or walking past, suddenly cried out in joyful surprise, Dear me, Mamma, Sonia, look, it's he. Oh, who, who? Look, yes, on my word, it's Bezukhov, said Natasha, putting her head out of the carriage and staring at a tall, stout man in a coachman's long coat, who from his manner of walking and moving was evidently a gentleman in disguise, and who was passing under the arch of the Sukharyev Tower, accompanied by a small, sallow-faced, beardless old man in a frieze coat. "'Yes, it really is Bezukhov in a coachman's coat with a queer-looking old boy. Really,' said Natasha, "'look, look!' 
"'No, it's not he. How can you talk such nonsense?' Mamma! screamed Natasha. "'I'll stake my head. It's he, I assure you. Stop! Stop!' she cried to the coachman. But the coachman could not stop, for from the Mischansky street came more carts and carriages, and the Rostovs were being shouted at to move on and not block the way. In fact, however, though now much farther off than before, the Rostovs all saw Pierre, or someone extraordinarily like him, in a coachman's coat, going down the street with head bent and a serious face, beside a small, beardless old man who looked like a footman. That old man noticed a face thrust out of the carriage window gazing at them, and respectfully touching Pierre's elbow, said something to him, and pointed to the carriage. Pierre, evidently engrossed in thought, could not at first understand him. At length, when he had understood and looked in the direction the old man indicated, he recognized Natasha, and following his first impulse, stepped instantly and rapidly toward the coach. But having taken a dozen steps, he seemed to remember something and stopped. Natasha's face, leaning out of the window, beamed with quizzical kindliness. "'Peter Kirillovich, come here! We've recognized you! This is wonderful!' she cried, holding out her hand to him. "'What are you doing? Why are you like this?' Pierre took her outstretched hand and kissed it awkwardly as he walked along beside her while the coach still moved on. "'What is the matter, Count?' asked the Countess in a surprised and commiserating tone. "'What? Uh, what uh, why? Uh, don't ask me, said Pierre, and looked round at Natasha, whose radiant, happy expression, of which he was conscious without looking at her, filled him with enchantment. Are you remaining in Moscow, then? Pierre hesitated. In Moscow? he said in a questioning tone. Yes, in Moscow. Goodbye. Uh, if only I were a man, I'd certainly stay with you. How splendid, said Natasha. Mamma, if you'll let me, I'll stay. Pierre glanced absently at Natasha and was about to say something, but the countess interrupted him. "'You were at the battle, we heard.' "'Yes, I was,' Pierre answered. "'There will be another battle tomorrow,' he began, but Natasha interrupted him. "'But what is the matter with you, Count? You're not like yourself.' Oh, "'Don't ask me, don't ask me. I, I don't know myself. Tomorrow... No, uh, goodbye, goodbye,' he muttered. It, "'It's an awful time.' and dropping behind the carriage, he stepped onto the pavement. Natasha continued to lean out of the window for a long time, beaming at him with her kindly, slightly quizzical, happy smile. Chapter 9 Pierre at Bazdeyev's house He wears a coachman's coat. For the last two days, ever since leaving home, Pierre had been living in the empty house of his deceased benefactor, Bazdeyev. This is how it happened. When he woke up on the morning after his return to Moscow and his interview with Count Rostopchin, he could not for some time make out where he was and what was expected of him. When he was informed that among others awaiting him in his reception room there was a Frenchman who had brought a letter from his wife, the Countess Hélène, he felt suddenly overcome by that sense of confusion and hopelessness to which he was apt to succumb. He felt that everything was now at an end, all was in confusion and crumbling to pieces that nobody was right or wrong. The future held nothing, and there was no escape from this position. Smiling unnaturally and muttering to himself, he first sat down on the sofa in an attitude of despair, then rose, went to the door of the reception room and peeped through the crack, returned flourishing his arms, and took up a book. His major domo came in a second time to say that the Frenchman who had brought the letter from the countess was very anxious to see him, if only for a minute, and that someone from Bazdeyev's widow had called to ask Pierre to take charge of her husband's books, as she herself was leaving for the country. Uh, oh, yes, in, in a minute. Uh, uh, wait. Uh, oh, no, 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 of course. Uh, go and say I'll come directly, Pierre replied to the major domo. But as soon as the man had left the room, Pierre took up his hat, which was lying on the table, and went out of his study by the other door. There was no one in the passage. He went along the whole length of this passage to the stairs, and, frowning and rubbing his forehead with both hands, went down as far as the first landing. The hall porter was standing at the front door. From the landing where Pierre stood, there was a second staircase leading to the back entrance. He went down that staircase and out into the yard. No one had seen him. 
but there were some carriages waiting, and as soon as Pierre stepped out of the gate, the coachman and the yard porter noticed him and raised their caps to him. When he felt he was being looked at, he behaved like an ostrich, which hides its head in a bush in order not to be seen. He hung his head, and quickening his pace, went down the street. Of all the affairs awaiting Pierre that day, the sorting of Joseph Bazdeyev's books and papers appeared to him the most necessary. He hired the first cab he met, and told the driver to go to the Patriarch's Ponds, where the Wisdo Bazdeyev's house was. Continually turning round to look at the rows of loaded carts that were making their way from all sides out of Moscow, and balancing his bulky body so as not to slip out of the ramshackle old vehicle, Pierre, experiencing the joyful feeling of a boy escaping from school, began to talk to his driver. The man told him that arms were being distributed today at the Kremlin, and that tomorrow everyone would be sent out beyond the Three Hills Gates, and a great battle would be fought there. Having reached the Patriarch's Ponds, Pierre found the Bazdeyev's house, where he had not been for a long time past. He went up to the gate. Gerasim, that sallow, beardless old man Pierre had seen at Torzhok five years before with Joseph Bazdeyev, came out in answer to his knock. At home? asked Pierre. Owing to the present state of things, Sofia Danilovna has gone to the Torzhok estate with the children, Your Excellency. I will come in all the same. I have to look through the books, said Pierre. Be so good as to step in. Makar Alexeyevich, the brother of my late master, may the kingdom of heaven be his, has remained here, but he is in a weak state, as you know, said the old servant. Pierre knew that Makar Alexeyevich was Joseph Bazdeyev's half-insane brother and a hard drinker. Yes, yes, I know. Uh, let us go in, said Pierre, and entered the house. A tall, bald-headed old man with a red nose, wearing a dressing gown and with galoshes on his bare feet, stood in the anteroom. On seeing Pierre, he muttered something angrily and went away along the passage. He was a very clever man, but has now grown quite feeble, as your honour sees, said Gerasim. Will you step into the study? Pierre nodded. As it was sealed up, so it has remained, but... Sofia Danilovna gave orders that if anyone should come from you, they were to have the books. Pierre went into that gloomy study which he had entered with such trepidation in his benefactor's lifetime. The room, dusty and untouched since the death of Joseph Bazdeyev, was now even gloomier. Gerasim opened one of the shutters and left the room on tiptoe. Pierre went round the study, approached the cupboard in which the manuscripts were kept, and took out what had once been one of the most important, the Holy of Holies of the Order. This was the authentic Scotch Acts, with Bazdeyev's notes and explanations. He sat down at the dusty writing-table, and having laid the manuscripts before him, opened them out, closed them, finally pushed them away, and resting his head on his hand, sank into meditation. Gerasim looked cautiously into the study several times, and saw Pierre always sitting in the same attitude. More than two hours passed, and Gerasim took the liberty of making a slight noise at the door to attract his attention, but Pierre did not hear him. Is the cabman to be discharged, Your Honor? Uh, oh, yes, said Pierre, rousing himself and rising hurriedly. Look here, he added, taking Gerasim by a button of his coat and looking down at the old man with moist, shining, and ecstatic eyes. I say... Do you know that there's going to be a battle tomorrow? We heard so, replied the man. I beg you not to tell anyone who I am, and to do what I ask you. Yes, Your Excellency, replied Gerasim. Will you have something to eat? No, but I want something else. I want peasant clothes and a pistol, said Pierre, unexpectedly blushing. Yes, Your Excellency, said Gerasim, after thinking for a moment. All the rest of that day, Pierre spent alone in his benefactor's study, and Gerasim heard him pacing restlessly from one corner to another and talking to himself, and he spent the night on a bed made up for him there. Gerasim, being a servant who in his time had seen many strange things, accepted Pierre's taking up his residence in the house without surprise and seemed pleased to have someone to wait on. That same evening, without even asking himself what they were wanted for, he procured a coachman's coat and cap for Pierre, and promised to get him the pistol next day. 
Makar Alexeyevich came twice that evening, shuffling along in his galoshes as far as the door, and stopped and looked ingratiatingly at Pierre. But as soon as Pierre turned toward him, he wrapped his dressing gown around him with a shamefaced and angry look and hurried away. It was when Pierre, wearing the coachman's coat which Gerasim had procured for him and had disinfected by steam, was on his way with the old man to buy the pistol at the Sukharyev market that he met the Rostovs. Chapter 10 Napoleon surveys Moscow from the Pokloni Hill. He awaits a deputation of Les Boyards. Kutuzov's order to retreat through Moscow to the Ryazan Road was issued at night on the 1st of September. The first troops started at once, and during the night they marched slowly and steadily without hurry. At daybreak, however, those nearing the town at the Dorogomilov Bridge saw ahead of them masses of soldiers crowding and hurrying across the bridge, ascending on the opposite side and blocking the streets and alleys, while endless masses of troops were bearing down on them from behind and an unreasoning hurry and alarm overcame them. They all rushed forward to the bridge, onto it, and to the fords and the boats. Kutuzov himself had driven round by side streets to the other side of Moscow. By ten o'clock in the morning of the 2nd of September, only the rear guard remained in the Dorogomilov suburb, where they had ample room. The main army was on the other side of Moscow, or beyond it. At that very time, at ten in the morning of the 2nd of September, Napoleon was standing among his troops on the Pokloni Hill, looking at the panorama spread out before him. From the 26th of August to the 2nd of September, that is, from the Battle of Borodino to the entry of the French into Moscow, during the whole of that agitating, memorable week, there had been the extraordinary autumn weather that always comes as a surprise, when the sun hangs low and gives more heat than in spring, when everything shines so brightly in the rare, clear atmosphere that the eyes smart, when the lungs are strengthened and refreshed by inhaling the aromatic autumn air, when even the nights are warm, and when in those dark, warm nights golden stars startle and delight us continually by falling from the sky. At ten in the morning of the 2nd of September, this weather still held. The brightness of the morning was magical. Moscow, seen from the Pokloni Hill, lay spaciously spread out with her river, her gardens, and her churches, and she seemed to be living her usual life, her cupolas glittering like stars in the sunlight. The view of the strange city with its peculiar architecture, such as he had never seen before, filled Napoleon with the rather envious and uneasy curiosity men feel when they see an alien form of life that has no knowledge of them. This city was evidently living with the full force of its own life. By the indefinite signs which even at a distance distinguish a living body from a dead one, Napoleon from the Pokloni Hill perceived the throb of life in the town and felt, as it were, the breathing of that great and beautiful body. Every Russian looking at Moscow feels her to be a mother. Every foreigner who sees her, even if ignorant of her significance as the mother city, must feel her feminine character, and Napoleon felt it. Cette ville asiatique aux innombrables églises, en school la sainte. La voilà donc enfin cette fameuse ville. Il était temps. That Asiatic city of the innumerable churches, holy Moscow, here it is then at last, that famous city. It was high time, said he, and dismounting, he ordered a plan of Moscow to be spread out before him, and summoned Le Lorne d'Idville, the interpreter. A town captured by the enemy is like a maid who has lost her honor, thought he. He had said so to Tuchkov at Smolensk. From that point of view, he gazed at the oriental beauty he had not seen before. It seemed strange to him that his long-felt wish, which had seemed unattainable, had at last been realized. In the clear morning light he gazed now at the city and now at the plan, considering its details, and the assurance of possessing it agitated and awed him. But could it be otherwise, he thought? Here is this capital at my feet. Where is Alexander now, and of what is he thinking? A strange, beautiful, and majestic city, and a strange and majestic moment. In what light must I appear to them?
thought he, thinking of his troops. Here she is, the reward for all those faint-hearted men, he reflected, glancing at those near him and at the troops who were approaching and forming up. One word from me, one movement of my hand, and that ancient capital of the Tsars would perish. But my clemency is always ready to descend upon the vanquished. I must be magnanimous and truly great. But no, it can't be true that I am in Moscow, he suddenly thought. Yet here she is, lying at my feet, with her golden domes and crosses scintillating and twinkling in the sunshine. 